Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. Take your seats. Hello. I do now. Okay, members. Members have received notice from the Minister for the Economy that he wishes to make a statement. Before I call the Minister, I do remind members here in the Chamber that in light of social distancing being observed by the parties, the Speaker's rulings that members must be in the Chamber to hear a statement if they wish to ask a question has been relaxed. Members participating remotely should make sure that their name is on the speaking list if they wish to be called. Members present in the Chamber must also do this, but, but may do so by rising in their place as well as notifying the business office or speaker's table directly. I do remain members to be concise in asking their questions. We're not in a debate, and long introductions should not be entertained. I also remain members in accordance with long established procedure. Points of order are not normally taken during a statement or the question period afterwards. And I call the Minister for the Economy. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I wish to update members on my decision to commission an independent review of Invest Northern Ireland. I know that there has been a lot of interest in the Chamber and indeed across Northern Ireland in the launch of this review. And I will begin by putting this announcement into context. As members will be aware, Invest NI helps new and existing businesses compete internationally, as well as attracting new investment to Northern Ireland. Over the past decade, Invest has had a fantastic track record in making Northern Ireland the most attractive location in the UK, outside of London, in respect of FDI. We have seen the province become a global leader in cyber, fintech and advanced manufacturing. We have seen Invest support established companies win new contracts in overseas markets, as I saw firsthand on a recent visit to the Middle East. And they have supported new businesses find buyers and partners in new markets with one of the best examples of this being the Going Dutch program, which I had the opportunity to experience when I was visiting and speaking with participants of the most recent cohort in Amsterdam last year. So whilst there is no doubt that Invest NI has had a good track record, there is also no doubt that the Northern Ireland economy has been dramatically impacted over the past two years. The impact of COVID has accelerated change and given us an opportunity to reset as we go about building a healthy economy that delivers for all. Thanks to the various interventions from national and local government, there are now clear signs that our economy is rebounding from the impact of COVID-19. And whilst the pandemic has had a profound impact on the local labour market, many indicators continue to hint at improvements. Economic activity is at a 13-year high, and business confidence is up, with many firms positive on the outlook for 2022. I recognise, however, that there are some indicators that are yet to return to pre-pandemic levels, and there are still some negative effects uh, felt uh, disparately across various sectors and groups in society. As we seek to consolidate and boost recovery for everyone in Northern Ireland, it is imperative that we examine our position holistically. Throughout the course of the pandemic, industries and consumers have had to pivot to address the new trading environment since leaving the European Union and deal with the frictions caused by the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. Public sector budgetary constraints remain a key challenge, and my department is currently seeking to identify the most suitable financial model to fit local economic priorities and allow us to continue to deliver quality services with reduced resources. I am, however, confident about the future. Our 10x economic vision published in May 2021, sets out our ambitions for the next decade and aims to create a step change in how we improve our economy. It has received the backing of people working in business, skills and from members right across this chamber. The realisation of this bold vision, which places innovation at its core, will ultimately see Northern Ireland situated among the elite small advanced economies in the world. As I mentioned previously, Northern Ireland already has world-class strength in a number of areas, including fintech, cybersecurity, and advanced manufacturing. But we must build on those strengths. We cannot stand still while the world moves forward. In support of this overarching vision, the Department has launched a number of publications that focus on some of our key policy levers, including skills for a 10x economy and trade and investment for a 10x economy. 10x is also the spine of my department, with each division working towards a common goal, whether in further education, higher education, skills, energy or economic development. The excellent work of other departments too can feed into that 10x vision. But achieving our vision cannot be done in isolation. As our regional economic development agency, Invest NI's role in translating 10x strategic objectives into a new, refreshed and inclusive economic reality is critical. This exciting opportunity to make a generational change, alongside the Executive's new decade, new approach commitment to review arm's length bodies, has underpinned my decision to commission an independent review of Invest NI. Now is the right time to take stock and ensure the organisation is primed to respond to a changing economic landscape in preparation for an economy that has the aspiration of being 10 times better. The review, which I launched on the 26th of January, will be led by Sir Michael Lyons, former chairman of the BBC, 
and current chairman of the English Cities Fund. For the avoidance of doubt, he is no relation, although he is clearly from good stock. Sir Michael recently chaired the Belfast Innovation and Inclusive Growth Commission. His distinguished track record and depth of relevant experience will be crucial in steering this public debate around the future of economic development in Northern Ireland. I am also delighted to confirm that Dame Rotha Johnson and Maureen O'Reilly have been appointed to support Sir Michael in the delivery of the review. Between them, they bring a wealth of business and economic experience in Northern Ireland to complement Sir Michael's own skills and experience. I can assure members that the review will be completely independent of my department, and I have asked the panel to engage widely across this House and Northern Ireland to ensure that they capture all relevant opinions. Sir Michael will update me on progress in April, and I expect a final report to be delivered in September this year. I am sure that the whole of this House will wish to join me in wishing Sir Michael every success in his new role and encouraging stakeholders across sectors and regions of Northern Ireland to ensure that their voices are heard. I commend the statement to the House. I thank the Minister for that statement. And I call Keith Archibald, the Chairperson of the Committee for the Economy. Um, Graham, I can call you and I thank the Minister for his statement. And I welcome the review of Invest NI that I've called for for some time and I want to wish the panel well. In the terms of reference, the second part is how Invest delivers the economic policies of the Department. The DUP has led the Department responsible for the economy for the past 15 years, and under DUP policies, we have stubbornly low economic growth, low productivity, and the highest economic inactivity of any region across these islands. As a result of the Brexit championed by the DUP, we are losing vital EU funding, including for Invest, to deliver business support and development. And last week, it was reported that due to the uncertainty caused by the DUP walking out the executive, we are losing investor interest. Did the member get so question, does the please? Minister Ask accept sorry, member. the party? I need you to move to a question, please. Thank you. So, does the Minister accept that part of the problem is his party has failed to deliver a strategic policy directive to effectively develop our economy and to direct the agencies under his department? I would agree with the member, but then we would both be wrong, uh, Mr Speaker, because I think you only have to look over um, the last 15 years to see how the economy in Northern Ireland has improved, to see how we have progressed. You only need to look at the uh, skyline across Belfast to see the economic development and the jobs that uh, have been created. We are in a much different place uh, than we were in in um, 2007 uh, and the years uh, before. Look at the 1,100 uh, new companies that have uh, international companies that are investing uh, in Northern Ireland. Look at how we are the second most attractive region in the UK, outside only London, at bringing foreign direct uh, investment uh, to uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, Look, even last week at the report, the FDI Intelligence uh, magazine um, that says in terms of FDI strategy, uh, it ranks uh, Northern Ireland as the best uh, region, uh, joint best region in Europe um, of its size. Um, so I think um, we have done a very good job, that Invest and I have done a very good job. But the reason why I am bringing this review forward isn't because I am critical of the work that they have done in the past but that I recognise that we're moving into a new era. We've had a major economic shock, and I want to make sure that we are once more um, best placed uh, to respond to that and to continue to have the success uh, that we have enjoyed. Okay, before I call the next member, I just want to repeat. I, mean, I made the point earlier on that this is not an occasion for speeches. I want people to go to questions, and I don't want to intervene, but I will. Uh, we have a very long schedule ahead of us today and the rest of the week. And people need to appreciate that. So I call Peter Weir. I thank the Minister for his statement. And given the need to use every tool at our disposal in terms of international investment, can the Minister indicate whether the uh, links between Invest NI and the Department for Investment, um, sorry, International Trade, and the, uh, the linkage of UK embassies across the world, will the links between Invest NI and those uh, opportunities? be an issue for the review? Well, uh, Mr Speaker, this is certainly an issue that I have raised with both uh, ministers in the Northern Ireland office and indeed with the uh, Secretary of State for International uh, Trade, Anne-Marie Trevelyan. Um, at a recent meeting we had had in Belfast, uh, I had highlighted the need and the importance for the 
um, Northern Ireland economy to take benefit from the incredible network of um, offices and embassies that the UK government have across the world. Um, the Secretary of State was very keen that that would take place. Of course, it is a um, new decade, new approach uh, commitment as well, that there would be that greater integration. So I'm pleased that that um, uh, is happening and is continuing to happen. I saw a very good example of it as I've worked with the Invest NI team um, at the Expo in Dubai. Uh, and it's very clear that there's been a good working relationship there between uh, Invest NI and between um, uh, DIT. I want to see that uh, continue. We need to take advantage of those offices so that we can get our message out there uh, about why people should come uh, to uh, live, work and invest in Northern Ireland. I call Matthew O'Toole. Speaker, Minister, uh, the review of Invest in I is welcome, but this statement would Im imply that it's simply in need of a quick check-up. In actual fact, there does appear to be mounting evidence of a real deep organisational crisis at Invest, because the political uncertainty caused by your party's walk out of the executive, we know new support is being offered. We also know that Invest NI has been hampered from selling our dual market access under the protocol, presumably, but you can correct me if this is wrong, because your party doesn't want it sold. Can you confirm whether you are content for Invest NI to be unambiguous in selling our dual market access, and whether this review will look at how best that can be achieved? Well, um, first of all, to uh, address the first point that the, the members made, the reason why um, there are difficulties going ahead uh, is not because of the lack of an executive, but the lack of a budget. Uh, and that was always going to be a difficulty because the finance minister had presented a budget that was not, in my view, um, going to be able to um, cater for the demands that um, the department as a whole has, but in particular, uh, that invest uh, the, the issues that Invest NI would be facing, and what it is that we want to see uh, happen. So, I have no doubt that yes, we are in a position right now of political instability, um, but it's much more preferable for me to be in a short-term uh, position of political instability rather than in a position of a long-term inability to do our job, which is what the finance minister's draft budget uh, would have have done. Um, in terms of the issue that he raised in relation to so-called uh, dual market access, because of course, remember, um, we are having difficulties um, bringing and facing additional frictions bringing goods from Great Britain into Northern Ireland. So it is not as rosy as the uh, member would uh, like to paint whenever we have those uh, difficulties. I want to see that issue sorted out. I want to see that uh, resolved. That's where my focus is uh, right now. Um, but I don't tell Invest NI how to do um, uh, their job, and in terms of this review, uh, this review will be independent. However, I believe um, that the most important issues right now for those that are seeking to invest in Northern Ireland are the issues that we see coming up time and time again. It's around skills and around connectivity. Those are going to be the big, big issues going forward, and that's why the draft budget concerns me so much, uh, because um, it doesn't give us the funding that we need to address the skills issue, and skills is going to be the critical issue for economies right across the world in the coming years. I call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his statement and, and welcome to Michael's uh, attentions. Can the Minister inform the House of the number of organisations seeking financial support from Invest Northern Ireland in the next financial year and confirm that, as things stand, Invest is not in a position to offer a single penny? Mr. Speaker, I don't have the uh, figures here for the exact number of businesses that have requested uh, financial support because, of course, um, in the, in, the, in the financial year that's coming, there will be those um, that have perhaps applied uh, for help in previous years and are currently uh, receiving help and, and will receive help in the, in the, uh, in the coming um, year as well. Um, so I don't have that uh, exact uh, number. Um, it certainly is the case that we are going to continue to support businesses in 2022. Um, that has always been uh, the case. However, due to the uncertainty around uh, our budget, um, there will have to be uh, decisions taken on, on new um, business that haven't already been, been agreed. But I do want to knock on the head uh, this idea that there's no uh, financial support for businesses in Northern Ireland in 2022, because that's simply not the case. Well, sure, Dixon. Mr. Speaker, thank you, Minister, for your statement. Uh, and indeed, I, I welcome this review uh, of Invest Northern Ireland. Minister, you undoubtedly will agree with me that Northern Ireland uh, is at its best in delivering its economic give right across the world.
particularly because we have and should have a social partnership model of delivering jobs and business in Northern Ireland. It is therefore disappointing, Minister, that you fail to appoint a trade union representative as a representative of social partnership to this, to this review. While I welcome Dame Rotha Johnson and Maureen O'Reilly, there is one person and one sector missing. Um, Mr Speaker, it's very much the case that I want this review to be as wide-ranging as possible, and as part of that, I want to ensure that as many voices uh, are heard. Um, the panel um, will not be the only ones that are involved in the discussions and the debate around the, the future of this, and as I said in my statement, I want to make sure that as many voices are heard uh, as possible, and uh, I would encourage everyone around this House to um, uh, play their role in that review in terms of, of, of submitting evidence and, and meeting uh, with uh, the panel. And of course, there will be um, a, an opportunity for, for people in all sectors to do that, and I would certainly encourage them to, uh, to do so. I call John O'Dowd. And thank you, Minister, for your statement. Uh, I, I think this statement will be welcomed by uh, businesses across my constituency who believe Invest A&I are not designed to support small and medium enterprise, uh, and, I, and I hope that will be one of the outworkings of it. Minister, north-south trade has increased by 65 per cent over this last year, uh, £3.6 million a day in trade. That is creating sustainable businesses, sustainable jobs and new jobs. Will the Minister ensure that the Invest ANI and his department do not stand in the way of that trend because of his political opposition to the protocol? Uh, well, just on the first point that he raised in relation to uh, small businesses, I think it is the case um, that we have been supporting uh, small business. I think that if you look at the Going Dutch programme uh, in particular, is a, is a fantastic example that I was able to be uh, involved in. It actually demonstrated how Invest was helping, in some cases, new businesses, in some cases, businesses that were being set up um, uh, very, very recently, uh, and those that had been um, established for a longer period of time. Uh, it's helping them get into new uh, markets and it's helping them to export their, their products. So um, uh, it's not the case that Invest and I has not been ha helping small businesses, and I think it's important to put that uh, on the record. Um, the figures do show, of course, that there has been an increase in trade between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Of course, why is that? It's because we've put such trade frictions um, in the Irish Sea that other businesses have had to uh, change the way in which uh, uh, they work. And um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's more competitive, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, it's better, but it's an alternative that they have had to take because of the frictions that exist in the Irish Sea. Those are frictions that I uh, would like to see uh, gone. I think that's something that everybody in this House should be working towards. Well, Keith Buchanan. Mr. You indicated in your, in your um, statement in reference to COVID and obviously the damage that has done to the economy. How will Invest need to recalibrate its work in order to continue to attract? Uh, people from across the world and other investors here? Well, absolutely, um, uh, Mr. Speaker, and that's uh, one of the reasons why we are carrying out uh, this uh, review is to ensure that we are aware of the issues that have taken place as a result of COVID uh, and the, the new economic reality that we find ourselves in. And I want to, to make sure that we're getting this expert advice, that we're listening to all of the key stakeholders, that we're listening to businesses as well, to make sure that the um, model that we have in place, the support that we have, the structures that are there, are uh, designed the best way um, that they can be in order to provide that support uh, going forward. So that in this post-COVID um, environment, we are um, able to respond well to the challenges that uh, we will now face. Well, Padre Thank the Minister for his statement. Minister, it's become increasingly aware that workers want to either continue working from home or to work closer to home. And I note that Invest NIE has 540 acres of land, which is currently um, there's no specific strategy with that land to, to develop and enable remote working. Is there a plan for Invest NIE to develop remote working hubs over the next coming months and years? So I think this is uh, the members give me that. A, an example of why we need to have this review, because we are in a different situation post-COVID. There are different ways of working, and in terms of um, invest NI sites and the land that we hold and the space that we have, all of those will come under uh, the review and will be part of um, Sir Michael's report. Again, I call Stephen Dunn. And thank the Minister for his statement. How can we ensure through this important review that the work of Invest NI is aligned to the 10X strategy and projects are selected that ultimately help to deliver the aims of that 10X strategy? 
I think the member is absolutely right to uh, to make this point. It's it's an, one of the other reasons why I have um, put this review in place, um, because we now have a very clear plan, uh, a very clear vision of where it is that we uh, want to be over the next uh, decade. That is um, uh, a focus on innovation. Uh, focus on those key technologies, those key um, uh, clusters as well uh, that we can have success in, those areas where we are already uh, global leaders or have the potential to be uh, global leaders. Um, so it's making sure that we can support uh, those areas. Um, and then we will also see uh, the diffusion of that into the rest of uh, the economy. Uh, and so because we have this new, vis new vision in place, it's important that not just Invest NI, but um, all of the ALBs and um, all of the different divisions within my department are working towards that. As I have said, 10X is the spine of um, DFE uh, now, and that's why it's so important um, that the work that is carried out there makes sh sure um, uh, that we are well aligned to the 10X vision so we can deliver on all those things that we say we want to deliver on. Mr. Speaker, Minister, I welcome uh, your statement and the review. Um, you're no stranger to my reservations about the remit of Invest NI and particularly their track record within the FOIL constituency. Do you believe um, that this review will begin the process of levelling up, adhering to the demand that we've been making for many, many years for sub-regional targets uh, and addressing the inadequacies and the imbalances of investment here in Northern Ireland? Well, Mr. Um, Speaker, the member will be aware of the terms of reference, and I have listened to what the uh, member has said, what others have said in relation uh, to the performance of Invest NI in different parts of Northern Ireland and the successes that they have had in, in other parts of Northern Ireland. So, sub regional performance is something that will be looked at as part of this review, and I'm sure that she will be seeking a meeting with Sir Michael to put, put her views across. What I don't want to do, though, is to in any way suggest that Invest NI hasn't. Uh, been uh, active right across at Northern Ireland, for example, in her own uh, FOIL constituency. And yes, these are figures over the last uh, five years, um, but there have been 756 um, letters of uh, uh, offer, um, total assistance of £35 million, uh, which contributed to a combined investment of over £200 million and created almost 2,000 uh, new jobs. Now, those are very specific offers of support. That doesn't include, uh, for example, the, the Going Dutch programme, and through that I met businesses from her constituency that have benefited from that. Um, she'll be aware of the Ebrington Hotel development as well, which also secured funding of £1.75 million from uh, Invest uh, NI. So I think it would be wrong to say that Invest haven't been active or haven't been doing um, the job of bringing investment and jobs to various parts of Northern Ireland, um, but I'm more than happy for that to be part of the review to make sure that Invest NI is doing everything that it can uh, to uh, support um, uh, economic growth right across Northern Ireland. As I said when I came into this job, it was my ambition that we would create a strong and healthy economy that delivered opportunity for everybody, no matter where you are, uh, where you are, where you're from, and uh, I hope that this review will help contribute towards that goal as well. Call Steve Egan. Indeed, and thank you very much indeed for the Minister's statement so far. Uh, Minister, how radical are we expecting this review to be? Because I notice on numerous occasions you talk, and quite rightly talk, about fintech and media and the creative industries. But one of the common features of these indeed for Northern Ireland industry has been is the fact that civil servants didn't know very much about it, so we're able to develop much more rapidly without the inter interference where we are. Is Invest NI actually going to be radical in what it's proposing? Well, uh, first of all, of course, how radical this review will be um, will, will be up to, to people like himself as well. Um, there's an opportunity here for you and uh, other colleagues around this assembly to um, interact with uh, the review team and with uh, Sir Michael. There will be an opportunity uh, for various stakeholders to do that. So it, I, I think there is a level of responsibility on those in this House and outside to, to present that information uh, to uh, Sir Michael. Um, certainly from my own point of view, um, in drawing together the terms of reference, I've tried to keep this as, as broad uh, as possible. And I've tried to ensure that all views can be heard and that there's nothing that is uh, off the table, uh, so to speak. Um, that being said, um, I, I would again uh, make the point that I don't think it's been the case uh, that Invest or um, other sections of my department have, have not played their role in the creative industries, for example. Um, you only have to look at the success that we have had over the last uh, number of years 
um, is in the creative industries in, in particular, and um, you get to see the jobs that were created, the new opportunities that are there for young people that, uh, that weren't there uh, before. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I was at the um, virtual production studios at um, uh, Ulster University, and I see the investment and the talent uh, that is there, and that had been driven forward by um, uh, my department through the funding that was made uh, available. So um, we certainly have had successes in terms of creative industries, in terms of cyber security, in terms of, 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 of fintech. But um, it's because we want to build on those clusters and those areas in which we have done well um, that I am trying to make sure that this review uh, covers those areas to make sure that we're well positioned to take advantage of the fact that we do so well in them. I'd like to thank the Minister for making his statement this morning. Minister, from 2017 to 2021, Invest in I only hosted four investor visits within my constituency, and the level of jobs and investment in Fermanagh is considerably lower than any other constituency. Does the Minister agree that we need a plan? to tackle region, regional inequalities and invest in a needs to play a central role in delivering that? Uh, well, Mr uh, Speaker, I have already said that as part of the terms of reference, sub-regional performance will be um, uh, looked at. Uh, it certainly um, is the case that it is an issue that many members have raised with me and be very keen um, for that to be, to be thrashed out. In terms of um, the member's own constituency. Uh, there have been over a thousand offers made, £23 million uh, worth of assistance from Invest NI, which led to a total investment of £119 million and, and, and created uh, 1,175 jobs. And, and looking at the constituency uh, list, that certainly is um, uh, well above uh, average and um, uh, more than my own constituency uh, as well. So uh, I don't think it's right to say that there hasn't been a focus on areas, that there hasn't been support, that there hasn't been uh, help. Um, and it's given not just in terms of um, financial uh, assistance directly to new companies, um, but also um, the various different business support that has been put in place uh, as well, which many businesses find uh, invaluable. We only have to look at the Assured Skills Programme uh, as well, which has supported businesses right across Northern Ireland through all of our regional colleges. And actually, investors have told me it's one of the reasons why they were coming uh, back again. So I think Invest have uh, been doing uh, the work that they needed to do. This review is to make sure that we continue to be well positioned uh, to continue the success that we have already had. I call Jonathan Buckley. I begin by saying I, I think and feel that Invest and I have had a very positive impact on Northern Ireland globally uh, throughout the last decade, though I do feel that as times have changed that the review is extremely timely and I do welcome them. And I welcome the Minister's desire to ensure that Invest and I align with the ambitions of 10 Act. So, with that spirit, does the, min does the Minister agree with me that small businesses are the backbone of our economy and therefore it is absolutely imperative that Invest and I financially support those small businesses seeking to achieve that am ambition? And I particularly think of the many small businesses within my own constituency in Upper Ban. Yes, the, the, the member is absolutely right to highlight the point that um, whenever we're thinking about our, our 10x economic vision, we're not just thinking uh, about um, uh, large businesses because I think if you look at some of the priority uh, sectors that we're looking at in terms of um, uh, fintech and agritech and life and health sciences and advanced manufacturing, some of these are small businesses uh, as well, and they play an important role in contributing um, to the economic development that we want to see. So. Um, as I've said already to other members in the House, Invest NI certainly have been giving that support to the small businesses through, through support um, and advice and guidance, but also through direct financial assistance as well. Um, that shouldn't be limited uh, to larger companies. It should also be there for small businesses as well, because they do contribute to what we're trying to do. Uh, and in fact, the, the, the member had invited me, and I was, I was pleased to be able to go down to his own constituency to see a local business, an established local business, um, that had actually been using innovation and investing in their business to make sure um, that they received better outcomes. And uh, that's exactly what 10X is, is all about. So he's absolutely right to raise the issue. Called Carol Nicholson. Can Kolyagos go on with his lessonara sockton a sockton righteous? Thank you, Minister, for your statement this morning. You have quoted to several members significant amounts of money from invest in and their constituencies. Uh, I can tell by the body language many disagree 
because they can't see the outcome in their own constituency. So given significant public funds going to invest in I to support companies, can the Minister confirm that that investment needs to, needs to ensure that jobs are, are contract based, that the companies employ a living wage, and indeed, you know, in response to what Stuart Dixon said, that there are trade unions representatives involved in this because it is vast sums of public money getting into this uh, arms length body. Um, well, first of all, Mr. Speaker, is it course the case, and I hope that the member will respond to the review that she will engage with um, Sir Michael uh, and his team. But I do, and, and on all of the issues that she raised as well, it's absolutely right that she uh, raises those. But um, I have to say, um, the figures are the figures, and the figures are accurate, and it is the case that we have seen this number of jobs created throughout the constituency. In the last five years, um, we have had 562 million pounds of support um, and that's been a fantastic investment because altogether that has brought um, over three billion pounds worth of investment and 25,000 jobs. That's jobs in her constituency and my constituency in the constituencies of everybody else represented here. That doesn't take into account the further economic benefit that that will have throughout the uh, economy. So yes, they are significant sums of public money, but we're getting huge investment coming in on the back of that. We are going into a new uh, environment. I understand the budgetary uh, pressures and constraints that we will face. That's why we need to make sure that it is going to where it can be most effective and where there can be a greatest return, um, uh, in particular uh, in terms of, of jobs. But Invest in I absolutely, this has been a, a success story, uh, and it's something that I want to see uh, continue. Can we please bring the member Colin McGrath on screen, please? I can invite the member to ask his question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your um, presentation and, and statement. Um, I have had some connection issues and haven't heard all of the questions and answers, so I apologise if this has already been um, mentioned. But I'm a bit concerned about um, the Invest NI office that's based in London. Um, I've been made aware that um, seven of the nine staff uh, in a very short period of time last year resigned. And I wanted to know if the uh, review will include uh, the sort of problems that there are within that office, at office in London, which are fairly obvious given the amount of people that have resigned, and if the minister had any comment on that. Um, well, I suppose I was a little bit distracted there by the fact that the member was uh, was in his car. I think we're all wondering where he, where he's off to, and maybe he can he can enlighten us at uh, at some at some stage. Um, I don't know the specific details of the issue that he is referring to. I'm certainly happy to to find that out. Um, but as I have said uh, throughout um, uh, my uh, statement and, and answers to questions today, there um, isn't anything that I'm saying can't be can't be looked at, can't be examined. And um, I have said repeatedly that this review will be completely independent, and therefore I would encourage him as well to contact Sir Michael uh, and his team uh, and to uh, raise the issue of um, our network of invest uh, NI offices and uh, how he thinks that we can better uh, use them to get the um, uh, objectives that we want to see. Uh, can we please have uh, Mark Durgan on screen as well, please? Can you invite the member to ask his question? Thank you. Good morning. I'll go to Kion Kolya and I thank the Minister uh, for his statement. In an earlier answer, the Minister cited the spectacular Belfast skyline as a measure of the success, not just of Invest NI, but of his own department over the past 15 years. I look around the respective skylines of other areas and other constituencies, including my own, therefore, will give an indication of their uh, collective failure. Minister, prospective investors look at the skills base in the region uh, be, be, when making investment decisions. Will your department begin the process of building the skill base in the FOIL constituency through higher education? Otherwise, this review is kind of pointless. Well, I would say that the member is right insofar as he recognises the importance of, of skills, which, is, as I have said before, is absolutely critical um, to the future of um, our economy. And um, that includes not just higher education, but further education uh, as well. Um, 
and in addition to that, a, a culture of lifelong learning, um, which I think we need to have a, a better grasp of and will be a key part of my uh, skills uh, strategy um, that will be published, uh, I hope, very, very soon. Uh, in terms of his, his own city, um, he might be interested to uh, know um, that the FDI intelligence uh, magazine uh, looked at European cities and regions uh, right across um, uh, Europe and um, he will be pleased to hear that Londonderry is in the top 10 uh, in the category of small European cities of the future 2022-23 in relation to FDI strategy and uh, not only is in the top 10 um, but it's number two across Europe um, so the experts look at his region uh, at, um, at Londonderry and uh, see it as a city uh, of uh, the future thanks to the FDI strategy that has been uh, put in place. So I uh, hope he and other members from the constituency uh, will be pleased uh, with that result. I call Jim Allister. Would the Minister agree that existing and incoming business want certainty that there will be a free flow of goods and supplies to Northern Ireland from Great Britain? And they also want certainty that the laws that govern their operation and their trading will be made in the country in which they invest, rather than by a foreign power over which they have no control. Well, um, Mr. Speaker, we hear a lot about dual market access. Of course, one of the difficulties for our businesses, and I, I, I get this mostly from manufacturing businesses who see a critical problem that uh, exists is the difficulties in bringing goods and component parts from Great Britain into Northern Ireland. That is where the difficulties uh, lie. I was speaking to um, Freddie a week ago um, to one business owner in uh, Northern Ireland who told me that they had to employ nine people to deal with the paperwork um, as a result of the Northern Ireland Protocol. That's with, by the way, the Trader Support Service in place at a cost of five hundred million pounds uh, so far. So uh, I don't believe that we need to have the paperwork and the checks and the frictions that we have in place. We shouldn't have to have that. We're part of the United Kingdom, and uh, bringing goods from Newcastle to Belfast should be no different than bringing them from London to Edinburgh or wherever else uh, it might be. And if we want to put Northern Ireland on the firmest uh, economic footing uh, that we can have, uh, we need to have uh, that frictionless trade between not just our, our, our biggest trading partner, but our internal uh, UK uh, market. Uh, in terms of the um, other issue that he raised in relation to um, the control of our own laws, um, I think that other countries will um, and investors would, would look on that with, uh, at best, amusement uh, at the fact um, that in um, Northern Ireland we will be under the influence of laws that are not created here and that we have no influence over. That's why I have so many uh, issues with um, uh, the protocol. And uh, it should be something that all of us want to see resolved. And that concludes questions on the statement. Can members please take a raise till we move on to the next item on the order paper?
All right, members. Members have received notice from the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs that he wishes to make a statement. And they call the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Evan Pooch. Thank you, Mr Speaker, for this opportunity to make a statement to the Assembly about the Environment Fund for 2022-23. I am delighted to announce the award of £2.9 million in funding for the delivery of strategic environmental projects across Northern Ireland. This comes on top of almost £19 million already offered to projects under the Dear Environment Fund, which commenced in 2019. The Environment Fund is one of my department's mechanisms, which enables not-for-profit organisations and councils to deliver key priorities to the terrestrial and aquatic environment. It will enable 22 organisations to continue to deliver important projects that focus on habitat restoration, species monitoring, enhancement of understanding and appreciation of the environment, and outdoor recreation improvement with its associated health and well-being benefits. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we have all realised the value of getting out into the environment, and this money will help us all to enjoy and access sites so that we can continue to benefit from our beautiful natural environment in Northern Ireland. These organisations continue to tirelessly provide opportunities for everyone to get out and enjoy the natural environment at a time when demand is particularly high. I have visited many of these projects, such as the work carried out by the Moran Heritage Trust and the National Trust in the Moran Mountains, restoring and maintaining many path networks, supporting visitors to both public and private land to leave no trace, and enabling recovery of the heathland habitat after the devastating fire last year. The impact of COVID-19 on the finances of environmental organisations means this is a great opportunity to support and maintain the work of local organisations and the people in them who are passionate about improving the environment. Many of the organisations receiving grant aid coordinate an astounding level of citizen science activities. Hundreds of enthusiastic and committed volunteers who record priority species of animals and plants so we can monitor the health of our environment and make decisions about its sustainable management. And many more volunteers and contractors who undertake habitat restoration projects. Environment Fund Grant Aid will continue to ensure that every school across Northern Ireland can continue to work to be an eco-school so that future generations learn early how to understand and care for their environment. I am also delighted to announce that a new Environmental Challenge competition for 2022-23 will be launched within the coming weeks. The Environmental Challenge competition will provide the opportunity for not-for-profit organisations to apply for funding to deliver, street, to deliver strategic environmental projects that will help to deliver priorities identified in the draft environment and peatland strategies, Nature Positive 2030, Outdoor Recreation Action Plan and for Green Growth. The key themes to be addressed through this competition are nature recovery, building ecological and climate resilience and connecting people with nature. Under the nature recovery theme, we are primarily interested in projects that will significantly contribute towards commitments to protect 30 per cent of land and sea for nature by 2030, especially initiatives and actions which will increase the area of wildlife habitat, protect and improve management of habitats, or create nature networks which will enhance habitat connectivity. Under the Connecting People with Nature theme, we are primarily interested in projects that will help connect significant numbers of people with nature through increasing the quality, quantity or accessibility of nature to people or increasing their understanding and involvement in the protection of nature, natural landscapes and earth science. The Environmental Challenge competition will, for the first time, be completed by a new online application process. This will make use of technology which is at an advanced stage of development, which will enable a more modern, user-friendly and efficient process for customers and officials alike. Mr Speaker, members, the purpose of this statement is to provide you with an update on the commitments being made under the Environment Fund and future opportunities, which rightly recognises, prioritises and supports the efforts being made to tackle the biodiversity and climate priorities facing Northern Ireland. We must look to a post-COVID-19 future and embrace the opportunities that green growth, peatland restoration, carbon reduction and technological innovation present. Given the challenges presented by climate change, a focus on the environment and sustainability will be key in the delivery of future programmes. I commend all of those delivering these projects 
staff, volunteers and contractors alike, which I hope will inspire all of us to play our part to create a cleaner, greener, accessible and more sustainable environment, as well as encourage us to improve the health of our communities through environmental action and behavioural change. As we know in Ireland seek to address these challenges through our green growth strategy, we must lay the foundations for a more sustainable society. If we get it right, the benefits to rural and urban people, the environment and the economy will be substantial and will no doubt make Northern Ireland a place where people want to live, work and be active. Thank you. I call the Chairperson of the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, Dagla Magalier. I thank the Minister for his statement this morning. Minister, turning uh, to paragraph 11 of your statement in relation to the Environment, uh, Environmental Challenge Fund and the opportunities for not-for-profit organisations to apply for funding for strategic environmental projects, um, I would welcome this as, as great news. Um, and I'm thinking of projects in my own constituency, like in Saskin Award, on Moy, Altmore, and many other examples where you have community-based projects in partnership with councils and, indeed, DERA. I wonder, could the Minister give us a little bit more information about this specific Environmental Challenge Fund? For example, how much specifically is set aside for it? When it will open for application? Um, and what, what is eligible? Is it capital? Is it resource? Or is it a blend? Just a little more, bit more information on this particular fund, because I know that it will be very, very much welcomed by uh, local uh, voluntary community-based organisations. Well, we're in the final um, preparations um, for its launch, and uh, we're just identifying the, the, the final fund uh, that we intend to um, secure uh, to deliver on this. Uh, so that isn't completely finalised at this point, and therefore I can't give uh, a figure uh, for what we intend to, to offer. Uh, but we will be looking at <clears throat> that connection with nature and how we can ensure that people connect better with nature. And, you know, looking at the, the, the strategy, such as the Peatland Strategy, um, Nature Positive 2030 and the Outdoor Recreation Plan, and Nature Recovery, um, e Ecological and Climate Resilience and building upon that and, and connecting people with nature will be the theme. So, uh, those organisations who believe that they um, have projects uh, need to be looking at how they can tie into those particular themes. Um, so I would encourage uh, the member to relate that um, to the programmes that he, he uh, talked about and referred to uh, in terms of the potential uh, for financial support. I call William Irwin. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his statement. The Minister outlined here has been successful in the programme and a flavour of the type of activities which could be supported uh, in the scheme? Um, the, the most successful is Moran Heritage Trust, who are receiving £229,270, and that's for the provision, continued provision of a full range of conservation, environmental and visitor management functions for Moran Area for Natural Beauty, including the SSIs, SACs and SPAs. So, you know, there was quite a lot of conversation about the Mourns, you know, particularly after the fire, and quite a lot of um, public representatives who indicated that um, it needed to be something done. Um, but it's been this department who has stepped up to the plate, uh, both in terms of the money that was awarded um, a few weeks back, in terms of uh, the, the, the support for <coughs> organisations um, who, who are providing rescue services, um, including the Mourns, and also for the support of the conservation groups that are on the Mourns. And uh, we have went out of our way to ensure that not just the Mourns, but many other areas um, will, will benefit from this. So the likes of Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful um, will receive £257,000. And that's to continue to, to ensure that there's less litter dropped, <coughs> that we have a cleaner environment. And remarkably, Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful told me just recently that around 30% of people um, regularly litter. Now, that is an amazing figure. It's an unacceptable figure. I was shocked by it, because I couldn't believe that, that that was such a high proportion. I thought it would have been in the single figures, percentage-wise. Uh, but that's where we are. And there needs to be a powerful education programme going out there about the unacceptability of littering um, our countryside. But there's uh, 22 amazing projects um, that, that, that have been allocated funding here, and we're delighted to do it. 
Pasi McLoone. Uh, Gurna Magad, Ken Corley, and thank the Minister for his statement. Uh, the Minister did mention there uh, during the course of the statement schools. Uh, c could the Minister advise, please, just what sort of strategic alignment, if you want to call it that, there is between his department or this particular fund and the Department of Education? In terms of schools, <coughs> excuse me, we have been doing quite a bit of work um, with the Minister for Education in terms of the potential uh, for linkages to support um, particularly rural schools through funding, but also environmental projects. Um, so obviously the school eco programme has been going for um, quite a long period of time, and that has been a, a particularly successful um, programme. And in that, um, again, keep Northern Ireland beautiful, um, our, our, our delivery body for it. And it oversees and directly manages a number of programmes um, which operate across Northern Ireland, targeted safeguarding our environment, educating students, young people, raising overall environmental awareness. Eco Schools Northern Ireland is part of a global schools education network, which promotes and encourages children and young adults to get actively involved in finding solutions to the environmental and sustainable uh, development challenges at a local level. And in Northern Ireland, we are a leader in the Eco Schools programme and the first region in the world to have all our primary and secondary schools registered with Eco Schools. Um, keep Northern Ireland beautiful Eco Schools and the Carrier Bag Levy team will shortly work in partnership to launch and run a school based poster campaign which aims, which aims to promote the reuse of carrier bags and the concept of don't pay to throw away. And uh, dairy commitments permitting, um, the Minister you know, will be asked to present the prizes in, in late March uh, to the winning schools with winning posters to be displayed in retail outlets across Northern Ireland. Uh, so, I, as well as that, there um, we're involved in the pollinator scale, pollinator scheme, um, which schools are going to be uh, accessing to the tune of just short of two million pounds, which is going to be a tremendous programme um, to encourage young people to engage with nature and to develop our pollinator population further at a time when it's under threat. Nicole Rosemary Barden. Minister, uh, thank you for your statement and also for your answers so far. I want to just follow on from Mr McGlone in relation to, to schools. Schools, you know, are very, very busy places and the teachers have to act. Teachers are busy people and they are very good at raising the awareness and appreciation of the environment, as you have already stated. Would the funding stretch to the appointment, perhaps, of specialist environmentalists within certain areas who would be available to support school staff, for example, taking children out on eco trips outside the school environment, etc.? Well, again, all of these, I know the, the member was a school teacher and has a real heart for education, but. Um, we, we know the importance of the environment um, to our younger population and their interest in it. And therefore, the development of anything that will um, have them better informed, um, get to know nature better, um, look at the challenges, particularly around biodiversity, I think it, 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 it's tremendous. And we need to look at all of those opportunities. So going forward, you know, I'm very happy and we've had conversations with the Minister for Education around um, cooperation between my department and her department. And I would hope that um, the spirit that currently exists on that will be something that will be carried through to a future assembly. And in a future assembly term, we will see um, even greater levels of cooperation between uh, the two departments on ensuring that um, good environmental knowledge and practice is something which is high on the school curriculum, and that it is also something which we can assist um, the education uh, authorities and schools in delivering. Well, John Blair. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for the statement and the news of this investment in habitat uh, protection and restoration? However, of the 242,000 hectares of peatlands in Northern Ireland, approximately 86% of those is not intact, and as little as 1% of those have been restored in some way in the last 30 years. So, in respect of the environmental challenge competition, what, prior what priority can the Minister ensure can be given to peatland restoration so as to reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases and also contribute to carbon sequestration? Um, in terms of this particular fund, um, obviously bug life is, is, is an important one that, that will be helping out and it will deliver on a number of themes. 
um, supporting DERA and meeting its priorities and building the capacity of bug life and others uh, to deliver on invertebrate cons conservation in Northern Ireland, which of course is um, popular in our peatlands. Um, that aside, uh, we are doing um, obviously a course of work within our green growth strategy and um, a substantial element of that is actually going to be about how we can further wet our peatlands. And uh, we're also working to reduce the amount of ammonia uh, that um, our peatlands were receiving. So the work that we've done in promoting um, low emission slurry spreading equipment, for example, um, and the funding that we provided for that has reduced the amount of ammonia um, in getting to our peatlands by around 25%. We're looking extensively at how we can reduce that further, and we believe that we can. Uh, but the wetting of peatlands is going to be important going forward, and therefore um, how we can um, utilise both the future agricultural framework policies and indeed uh, the green growth strategy uh, to deliver that uh, in a meaningful way uh, is, is very important. What I would say on it, it's important that we get the best bang for our buck. Um, because some of the peatland restoration can be hugely expensive, um, but some of it can be very moderate um, expense. So I want to get as much of the, the moderate expense out there and maximise um, at an early point um, what we can do to, to restore peatlands uh, and do that quickly. Uh, and that, I think, was where the focus of the department should be um, going forward. Philip McGuigan. Uh, Minister, I absolutely support the, the need for our children to be taught about the environment and educated on the ecology uh, and interactions around them. Uh, and just following on from previous speakers, uh, if I could maybe ask the Minister if he uh, can sort of detail the number or percentage of schools uh, across the North that are currently eco schools and uh, if how many more, given this funding, will be able to work towards achieving eco school status. Um, all of our, our primary and secondary schools are registered with the, with the Eco School programme. Uh, so all of them are engaged and all of them are involved. And I think it's a credit to um, all, all, all of our head teachers and uh, boards of governors uh, that they are so keen and committed uh, to ensuring that um, the young people in their um, care and the young people who are there seeking to educate um, are educated on these environmental issues. Call Harry Harvey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I also welcome the statement brought here by the Minister today? Would the Minister agree with me that farmers are key to delivering for the environment, and without farmers, we would not have managed landscape, which creates the backdrop for our wildlife, habitats, and biodiversity? Thank you. Uh, I absolutely agree, and I think that going forward, um, the greatest return we will get um, for the, the, the least um, expenditure is through our farmers. Um, so, for example, better management of our head, hedgerows um, can deliver a significant biodiversity bounce, um, and the costs can be very, very limited uh, on something like that. Um, obviously, one of the first things that I done was launch the Forest for Our Future campaign where we're looking at planting um, 1.8 million trees every year. And the, the forestry planting has actually went up um, by 100% in the last year. Um, it's not as far as I wanted to, to go at this point, uh, but nonetheless, the trajectory is very good, and we need to keep pressing ahead with that. And certainly the planting, particularly of indigenous species of trees, will continue to contribute to biodiversity. and. Farmers are embracing that and particularly looking at margins, uh, riparian boundaries, um, steep areas where, where, where they can plant, plant trees, uh, which will be to the benefit of, of both the farm and the environment going forward. <coughs> so we're very encouraged by all of that, and I believe that the farming community are keen to ensure uh, that the biodiversity uh, improves all of the time, and we want to see more of that wildlife in the form of birds. Um, want to see more of that wildlife uh, in terms of hares and, and you know, all, all, all other mammals on our ground. Um, so that's important uh, that they're able to do that. And 
I just will say this about peatlands. Good management of peatlands are important in that. So undergrazing is a problem, overgrazing is a problem, and a very small amount of, of, of the correct burning uh, to ensure that um, huge swathes of peatlands don't end up getting burnt um, is, is important steps that we need to take uh, to ensure that, that, that those peatlands um, can keep the hen harriers, the red grouse and, and, and those forms of life. And also invertebrates that underneath um, are not hit by forest fire or by peatland fires, uh, which is very important. Well, I'm sure. Maya Kinkoliet, Minister, thanks for your answers thus far. You'll be aware that water quality has been a concern over the past year with none of the North's rivers, uh, lakes or coastal waters achieving a good overall status. Can I ask if any of this funding has been specifically ring-fenced to address water quality? Uh, not this particular funding, um, but I have secured uh, funding um, through the Green Growth Strategy uh, for improvement of water quality and, and management of, of slurries in particular. And I think that it's really important um, going forward that we look at um, how we can optimise our usage um, of what is now currently termed as, as a waste, which is animal, animal uh, nutrients. And we need to turn that into something which is beneficial for the farmers, uh, but not harmful to the environment. And therefore, the appropriate usage of that. And that's why we're doing um, the, the soil sampling. It's going to take place right across Northern Ireland to identify uh, the needs uh, in terms of nutrients that the, that the soil requires. That's why we're doing lighter sampling, our, our, our lighter survey rather, which will identify those areas where there's going to be a particular runoff of water and so forth, um, so that that isn't suitable for the story spreading, for example, uh, and identifying what's going on um, underneath the ground. Because giving us knowledge on what's going on underneath the ground will give us um, the, the ability to decide um, what nutrients um, farmland needs and consequently applying the appropriate amount of nutrients instead of an excess, we will see an improvement in our waterways. So there's a course of work there to be done. Uh, there's a significant investment set aside to do it. And uh, we're very clear that um, in terms of the, the issues around the environment, you know, it's, there's issues about greenhouse gases and carbon. There's issues about biodiversity, but there's also issues uh, about our cleaner water and, and cleaner air, and we intend to tackle all of those problems, not just the one. Tom Buchanan. <coughs> thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for her statement today. This is yet another example of the strides that are being made to make a practical difference to our environment, to our wildlife uh, population, our biodiversity, etc. But, Minister, what concerns do you have at the risk posed by the current net zero target voted by this House uh, against the science which has real potential uh, of driving land abandonment and creating an environmental crisis? Um, I was in Ross Lay uh, last week and we came home through the mountains. Um, to Five Mile Town and, and, and then onto on the motorways. And as I travelled through all of that land in that area, I looked at it and said, none of this, none of this will be usable for agricultural purposes going forward on the basis of what's been proposed. And there's land which is considerably less marginal than that, which will be excluded um, from land use going forward for agricultural purposes. That's the reality of what we are facing. We have conversed with the CCC about this, their expectations, and whilst I would like to see um, wetting of some of that land, whilst I would like to see tree planting on some of that land, I don't think that um, a total abandonment of land like that there for farming purposes is the way forward. And therefore, I will be bringing um, amendments and further consideration stage to try to rectify uh, the harmful proposals and see if we can get to a, a more balanced position uh, for both the environment and the people who look after it uh, in the countryside, which is mainly uh, from the farming background. And if we can't bring the farmers with us, I think it will be damaging for the environment, not, not, not for the betterment of it.
Mr. Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if I might, um, this is my first time rising in this House since the untimely death of our member Christopher Stalford, and I would like to put on record my condolences to his family and to the DUP members um, who who spoke, I have to say, so eloquently yesterday. And there were very many moving tributes in this House, and I hope in time Christopher's family will take great comfort from those. Minister, I want to welcome your statement, and as a member for South Down, I also particularly want to welcome the announcement uh, to support the Mourns. But I, my question actually centres around that 30% figure you talked about on regular lettering. And I, like probably every other member of this House, absolutely detest when I see our countryside being lettered frequently. And I would ask the Minister if he would elaborate on anything in this particular fund that will directly talk to that staggering 30% and see it reduced. Um, first of all, thank the member for her comments about our dear friend Christopher. And I have to say, um, from our party, we really appreciated everything that all of the other parties said yesterday and the genuine outpouring um, of affection that there was for Christopher was plain to be seen. And uh, it's hugely, hugely appreciated because whilst we're in this harsh combat of um, political world, and I can be as combative as the next one, uh, nonetheless, we're all human beings at the end of it. And ultimately, it's just heartbreaking that um, four children are left without a father. In terms of um, the issues at hand, um, Thank you for uh, the questions. And keep Northern Ireland Beautiful um, will be receiving 257,000 um, to promote that um, environmental action and behavioural change uh, to make us a cleaner, greener, and more sustainable um, community. And we have been working closely with Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful um, over the course um, of the period. And you know they are doing a lot of good work there. The member will be pleased as well to note that Newry Morning Down District Council. Um, are receiving £143,000, and that is to implement um, key environmental outcomes identified and detailed in the various designated site management action plans uh, developed um, during the previous Northern Ireland uh, Environment Agency EF delivery phase. Uh, so, um, your constituency is doing well from this fund. Nicole Acting, Riley. Um, one of the complaints from smaller organisations is that the application process for funding can be difficult and a bit of a barrier. Uh, so it's great news that the process for the environmental challenge competition has been made more user friendly. Could you maybe just outline, outline a little bit more the changes that have been made to make it more accessible? Well, the application pro pro program will be all online, and we believe that it's been established to make it easier and indeed more accessible. And we're conscious of our need to ensure that the smaller organisations can apply too, and organisations that maybe don't have the, the level of capacity um, but can do really good work um, can also uh, achieve uh, funding support from our department on this important issue. We call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Speaker. Um, and of course, any funding announcement for environmental improvement has to be welcomed, given the absolute dire state that we are in. And when I look at this, we're hearing 2.9 million for community groups and councils. And that obviously then goes along with the 8 million per year from green growth for environmental restoration. And that has to cover both forestry and peatlands. And really it's tinkering around the edges of environmentalism and climate action um, that we do need to be seeing. But I think it's interesting in this statement that the environmental challenge competition is expecting not-for-profit organisations to deliver strategic environmental projects when you as minister have not yet produced many strategic plans. For example, our peatlands are the carbon sinks of the future and we know that ammonia is killing the carbon sinks, so where minister is the ammonia strategy. We have been hearing since July 2020 that it is coming soon and we are 18 months on and weeks away from the end of the mandate. Where is it, Minister? Where is the water strategy, the air pollution strategy, the waste strategy? When are we going to see those? Well, I think uh, what we're dealing with today is the support for this project, um, the announcement on the Environmental Challenge Fund, 
And yes, we do use community organisations and not-for-profit organisations uh, because we find a, a, a greater level of efficiency than, than delivering it um, through the traditional departmental methods. Uh, because many of these groups have volunteers and many hundreds of volunteers, and the money that we will distribute will lever um, a considerably greater impact uh, than if we were to employ those people ourselves. So I'm grateful to the environmental NGOs for the work that they do, and I want to ensure that we can continue to support them in doing um, high-quality work, which is beneficial for the environment. And I do think that there is an awful lot of good things going on. There's a lot of good things that this department is doing, and there's a lot of good plans going forward to ensure that we have a better environment, and we're working towards that all of the time. And I know the member you know, is always pushing for more, and, and that's fair enough. Uh, you know, I'm pushing for more as well, um, and we will seek to achieve as much as possible um, through this mandate, and hopefully in the next mandate, much more will be achieved um, for a better quality environment here in Northern Ireland. Members, that concludes questions on the statement. And can members please take a raise for a moment or two to be moved on to the next item on the order paper. Thank you. Okay, members, we'll resume the sitting. Members, the next item of business is the final stage of the protection from stalking bill, and I call the Minister of Justice to move final stage. So moved. Final stage of the protection from stalking bill has been moved. The business committee has agreed that there should be no time limit on this debate, and I call the Minister of Justice to open the debate. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I'm very pleased to be here today to present the final stage of the protection from stalking bill to the Assembly. Incredibly, it was six years ago that a motion was debated in this House that recognised the need for stalking legislation to support and safeguard victims of this insidious and terrifying crime. That followed a bill which had passed in Westminster, for which I was a co-sponsor. Um, and This is something that I have been concerned about for some time and have taken a personal interest in. However, other events intervened, and so when I became Minister early in 2020, one of my priorities was to strengthen this law, covering unacceptable and damaging behaviour, which is what stalking is. Introducing this legislation has been a key objective not only for me as Justice Minister, but for the Committee for Justice and for members right across this House. I am immensely grateful to everyone who has worked hard to get us to this point. I want to thank the Committee in particular for its support and commitment in completing the scrutiny of the provisions in the Bill and for its administrative amendments that were tabled at the consideration stage. I very much appreciate that the challenging legislative programme that I have brought forward with the record five substantive bills progressing in this two-year period has resulted in an intense period of activity and placed considerable demands on the Committee's time. 
I would like to thank the current and the previous chairs and deputy chairs and the members for their commitment to their legislative scrutiny responsibilities throughout this mandate, in addition to all of the other burdens that they have had to shoulder, and for the careful and meticulous manner in which they discharge those heavy responsibilities. I also want to give a special word of thanks to the expertise of the staff in the Office of Legislative Council and the Departmental Solicitor's Office, who have worked so closely with me and my officials to bring the Bill to this point. At this stage, I also want to, play, to pay particular tribute to David Sewell, one of OLC's senior drafts persons who contributed so much to the drafting of this Bill and who sadly passed away as it reached committee stage. I want to place on record my appreciation of the enormous contribution that David made to the legislative work of my department and this Assembly, and to express my sincere sympathies to his family and his colleagues in the Office of Legislative Council for their loss. I hope that in some small way, this legislation can be seen as a fitting tribute to him. My own officials in DOJ described my, um, my uh, legislative programme as ambitious and challenging, which I believe is diplomatic in civil service for you've got to be kidding. But as always with the Department of Justice, they were willing to go the extra mile to deliver. And I want to thank them genuinely um, for their flexibility, um, for their determination um, and for their commitment to see these bills through to conclusion. Mr Speaker, from the outset of my tenure as Minister of Justice, I have set out a clear and an ambiguous message that stalking in all its forms is wrong and will no longer be tolerated. Final stage today gives added weight to that message, sending out a clear signal that stalking behaviour is unlawful and can never be tolerated. Stalking can be psychologically and physically damaging to victims, with delusional and obsessive offenders often going to extreme lengths to contact, follow, monitor and harass their victims. I know how persistent and manipulative stalkers can be, and I'm most grateful to the victims who very bravely shared their personal accounts with me, which were terrifying and harrowing in equal measure. These unsung heroes are the true driving force behind this bill. The bill will create a new specific offence of stalking in Northern Ireland, capturing conduct and acts associated with stalking behaviour. Importantly, it focuses on recognising stalking behaviours which are fixated, obsessive, unwanted and repeated, and the risks associated with stalking, something the current harassment law does not adequately capture. It will apply to two or more occasions that cause a person to suffer fear, alarm or substantial distress. A new offence of threatening or abusive behaviour is also being created, which can be triggered by a single incident. This bill will ensure that it is the impact of the particular type of behaviour on the victim that will be paramount in determining if these offences have been committed. Crucially, the bill provides that all victims of stalking will have automatic eligibility for special measures assistance, such as the use of live links or screens at court when giving evidence in proceedings. This also applies in family proceedings, where special measures can be considered by the court on a case-by-case -case basis. The Bill also introduces greater and more appropriate penalties and protections than are available under current harassment legislation, reflecting the serious impact that stalking has on its victims. The stalking offence will carry a maximum penalty on conviction on indictment of 10 years imprisonment or a fine or both. The aim of the Bill is not just to address and punish serious stalking behaviour. It also provides the means to disrupt such behaviour before it becomes established. The introduction of stalking protection orders will be a key tool for police, enabling them to intervene at an early stage and prior to any conviction. From elsewhere, we know that while legislation is hugely important, its effectiveness is dependent on effective training in and awareness of the new legislation and how it can be applied. I am very grateful to our justice partners who are planning the introduction of this legislation and developing appropriate training for their staff to ensure that the Bill delivers meaningful change for victims. I am hopeful that we can assure, secure royal assent by May, 
and, along with our criminal justice partners, bring the stalking offence into operation by the end of this summer, subject to the completion of training and awareness raising. Planning is also underway for the introduction of stalking protection orders, which I would expect to become operational towards the end of the year. A public advertising campaign, a crucial tool in raising awareness of what constitutes stalking behaviours and signalling our intention to stop this pernicious behaviour will also be rolled out once the Bill is enacted. Members will already be aware of a similar campaign which is currently being rolled out for the domestic abuse offence which went operational yesterday. I am certain that this Bill and all that it represents will help victims recognise the acts and behaviours associated with stalking for what they are and give them renewed confidence in reporting such behaviours to the police. Since becoming Justice Minister, my goal has been to promote legislation in this mandate, which taken together represents a coherent approach to protecting the vulnerable in our community. The provisions in this bill, together with those in the Domestic Violence and Civil Proceedings Act and the Justice Sexual Offences and Trafficking Victims Bill, will introduce valuable additional protections for some of the most vulnerable people in our community. Importantly, they also contribute to the executive's wider approach of protecting women and girls and recognising that, unfortunately, most victims tend to be female. Mr Speaker, today is a good day for the Assembly. On days like this, I am proud to be both an MLA and the Minister of Justice. These are the days where we can work together in harmony for the welfare and well-being of all of our constituents. I am heartened on occasions such as this where we can set aside political differences and work together for the greater good. Going forward, I want to build on that collaborative approach to protect the most vulnerable in our society, to deliver for the community we represent, and for the remainder of this mandate and hopefully into the next. That is my desire. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And I call the Chairperson of the Justice Committee, Mervyn Storey. Uh, thank you, <coughs> Mr. Speaker, and uh, apologies to the Minister that I wasn't in the House for the commencement of what she had to say. The business is moving quicker than we anticipated. On behalf of the Committee for Justice, I welcome the final stage of the Protection from Stoking Bill, and I am very pleased to speak in the debate as the Chair of the Justice Committee. This legislation has long been in the making, as the Minister has uh, alluded to. And I want to pay tribute to the previous Justice Committee and its chairperson, my colleague Mr Paul Frew, MLA, and the committee members, and also to the previous Justice Minister, Claire Sugden, MLA, who worked in collaboration to start the process back in 2016, which has resulted in the bill before us today. I am sure they never thought that it would take this length of time for the work to come to fruition. They recognised the need for stalking legislation at that time, and it was also an issue which came very much to the fore of the deliberations during the committee stage of the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Bill last year, when many organisations indicated that there was a clear legislative gap that needed to be addressed. The previous chairman of the Justice Committee, Mr Paul Given, MLA, outlined during the first debate on the bill at second stage the need for robust legislation to provide the necessary tools for the criminal justice agencies to tackle stalking behaviour, take into account patterns of such behaviour over time, and bring the perpetrators to justice. And that was abundantly clear from all the evidence that had been presented to the committee. Stalking is fixated, obsessive, unwanted and unrepeated behaviour which often escalates quickly. It is insidious and terrifying for victims and there is no place for it in our society. The new offence of stalking recognises and criminalises such behaviour and rightly so. Mr Speaker, stalking protection orders will also enable the police to proactively intervene disrupt stalking behaviours before they escalate and protect victims when there is immediate risk to them. The standalone offence of breaching the order, which can attract significant penalties, is very welcome and provides the tools for the courts to act seriously when orders are not adhered to. This legislation will provide hope for many victims of stalking. 
that the Criminal Justice Agency will now have a suite of tools to properly deal with the behaviour and for protection to be in place. While there was widespread support for this bill, one of the constant themes running through the evidence received by the committee was the importance of how the legislation will be implemented, with many organisations and individuals indicating the need for a comprehensive, consistent and informed approach by the criminal justice agencies. The committee agreed with this position, believing it for the legislation, in particular the new offence, to be effective and achieve the desired result of better protection and criminal justice outcomes for victims of stalking, getting the implementation right in terms of training to ensure those involved in gathering evidence, prosecuting and uh, enforcing the new law have a clear understanding of the difference between harassment and stalking as well as recognising the behaviours and dynamics of stalking and how it impacts on victims and monitoring and reporting on the implementation of the legislation is crucial. The four amendments brought forward by the Minister uh, at the request of the Committee covering guidance, training, data monitoring and reporting both for the new offence and the new stalking protection orders and interim orders which were agreed by the Assembly will, we believe, provide the basis for the effectiveness of the legislation to be monitored, assessed and reported on in a transparent manner. And I want to thank the Minister for uh, the way in which she engaged with us in the Committee in regards to that particular issue. Stalking has a profound and lasting impact on victims, who very often have, have to change the way they live on a daily basis, through no fault of their own, and cannot be minimised in any way. The full and effective implementation of the legislation is vital, and the amendments initiated by the Committee are welcome and necessary enhancements to the Bill. Mr. Speaker, the work undertaken by the Committee enabled all aspects of the Bill and the range of amendments to be scrutinised in depth and has provided the opportunity for the statutory and voluntary organisations and, most importantly, those who have suffered stalking to have a voice in shaping this legislation. I want to thank again the members of the Committee for their diligence, for their time and effort that they gave to this scrutiny process. I also again want to place on record the appreciation of the committee to all the organisations and stakeholders who contributed to our scrutiny by taking the time to provide written and oral evidence, particularly the victims of stalking, who shared their personal experiences despite the difficulties in reliving them once again. Their contributions were, an invalu were invaluable to the committee in understanding just how devastating an impact stalking can have on a person, their life and reinforced the need to have effective legislation in place to deal with the issue. I also want to thank the Minister, and I'm sure she'll not be surprised that we want to do that, on, and she rightly said that this is a good news day for this Assembly, but not, not for us as individuals, in a sense, but for those that we are here to serve, and in particular for those victims who have been subject to this particular heinous crime. So I want to thank the Minister and her departmental officials for bringing this legislation through the Assembly and for the work and commitment that has been brought uh, to see this particular stage of the Bill. The message to the Committee during the process was clear. Legislation to provide the Criminal Justice Agency with robust tools to tackle stalking behaviour that takes into account the patterns of behaviour over time and the insidious nature of it it's, uh, is comprehensive, uh, comprehensive and workable and fully addresses any gaps that currently exist in an absolute necessity. I will end with the words of one victim to the committee. The protection from stalking bill would have made a world of difference in my situation. I think, Mr Speaker, in concluding, I think that says it all about how victims see not us just coming here and merely engaging in politics, but actually bringing forward legislation that could have, but now will make a difference to our citizens and to those who have been subject and sadly will be subject 
to this type of behaviour. On behalf of the Committee for Justice, I am very pleased to support the final stage of the Protection from Stalking Bill and commend it to the House. Thank the member. I call Sinead Ennis. Um, and I too am delighted that we're at this stage today where we'll finally see the, the, uh, the, the protection from stalking bill pass its, its final stage in the House today. Um, and it is not before time that we see protection given in law to the victims of stalking and of, and of stalking behaviour. And as the Chair of the Committee and as the Minister has said as well, um, credit must be given to the victims uh, of this crime who bravely shared their experiences with us as a committee and helped us shape the necessary protections that are included in this new bill. As has been said before, stalking is <clears throat> a deeply insidious, invasive form of criminal abuse with shocking side effects and consequences for victims. And this bill is a major step forward for victims of this crime. And whilst victims of stalking are not always women and girls, and anyone can be a victim or a perpetrator regardless of their gender, stalking is overwhelmingly gender-based and is often carried out by men against women. Violence against women and girls begins as everyday sexism, misogyny, catcalling, on-street harassment, and over time embeds a deep, dangerous and toxic culture which so often manifests itself in serious physical and psychological violence. And stalking is one of these manifestations which makes this bill so important, not just on its own, but in the context of the wider work of the Assembly and the Executive. Violence against women and girls is epidemic in our society, and many women and girls are fearful, angry, and are demanding an end to this scourge. This Assembly has put a huge focus on tackling domestic and sexual violence over the last number of years. But legislation is only as effective as its implementation, and if we want this new stalking legislation to be effective, it will require training to ensure the right attitudes towards stalking prevail and to improve investigations and secure prosecutions. Although, although there is more that can be done to give women and girls the agency and protection we deserve, this Assembly has passed good legislation and taken big and sometimes groundbreaking steps forward to tackle the scourge of violence against women and girls. And building and enhancing on that good work will be a, be a priority for Sinn Féin in a new mandate. Gormagat. Gormagat, thank you. And I call Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for being here and moving this significant piece of legislation. So on behalf of the SDLP, I stand to warmly welcome the protection from stalking um, to its final stage. In doing so, Mr Speaker, I would like to also go on record to thank all those organisations and stakeholders, and in particular individuals who did work with our committee. And although those meetings were at times quite difficult to listen to, it was important that we did. And I, and I believe we do have a bill that represents those views. And as the uh, committee chair did refer to, that, that there should be an absolute change in, in stalking and how it is dealt with going forward. I also would like to thank the department officials who worked very well um, alongside the minister and with the committee in forming this bill. And I think it's important that that is put on record because the, it was that open communication that allowed us to really not just scrutinise but add value to the bill where it was needed. Um, and the bill's office, as always, were very accommodating towards the committee, and they too um, were able to support us. I'd like to also take a moment to thank all those committee members, um, not just the current but former committee members who, who did work with us, and I include Gordon Dunn. I know he was there at many of those deliberations and sadly is no longer with us to say it at this stage. But also um, the minister did quite rightly, um, and I'm glad she did, um, mentioned David Sewell, who, who we learned sadly passed away during this, and his hand and his work is enshrined in this piece of legislation, and I thought it was a fitting tribute that the Minister did um, make reference to that today, and I, and I think she, it is absolutely right um, that whilst we very sweepingly sometimes do refer to places like the Office of Legislative um, Council, there are individuals behind there, and they work very hard and diligently. And today is a, another day where we see their work um, going through at a final stage, and it, it, and it is genuinely appreciated. In terms of the bill itself, um, 
I, I do welcome that the offence of stalking is now at its final stage, but I also really am reassured by the fact that we also have the offence of threatening or abusive behaviour, um, which is the lesser offence, but it, it does have that safety net. And it is about ultimately what this bill and other bills like it and the suite of legislation that's coming forward, um, they do speak directly to that problem we have in terms of violence against women and girls. Now, none of these pieces of legislation or these crimes are exclusively um, directed to women and girls, but unfortunately we do see the vast number that it is women and girls who are the victim. And of course we have heard um, harrowing stories of cases where it's not necessarily a woman, but I think this suite that we have developed during this mandate um, cannot be ignored in terms of the conversational pace and developing a strategy uh, to protect women and girls because the foundation stones are very quietly being laid here today and there, there are very adequate pieces of legislation that the um, harassment laws didn't, were not able to encapsulate the full extent of the crime being committed. So I do welcome those. Um, I would also like to say that whilst we have worked very hard to understand this insidious crime and the psychological and physical effect at times that it can have and the long, the long term effect in terms of um, the trauma for victims, I believe we have collectively made a very good effort of putting the words on the page and that is the legislation in front of us. But like any piece of legislation, it will only show its merit if it is operational in a way that absolutely helps those victims. And that will require a significant amount of not just training, but resourcing. And I think we are moving to a new place in terms of this suite of legislation that is being presented. But I want to know with confidence, and I would love to hear the minister perhaps elaborate on this. I want to have a confidence that not only have we done the right thing in bringing forward the bill, but that we're absolutely confident that we will resource it and make sure it is operationally delivered in the way it should be. Um, only then can we really say we've done the right thing. So I commend the bill to the House and I want to thank and place on record everyone who had a hand in bringing it here. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I uh, thank the member for that, Nicole. Doug Beatty. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I shall, I shall be brief, uh, if I may. I mean, this is... This is good legislation. Uh, it really does show teamwork and collaborative working from stakeholders to victims, uh, to the committee itself, to the Department of Justice and, and indeed the Minister um, for bringing it forward. Uh, and, and it is a long journey because it did start way back in 2016 and I was a member of the Justice Committee back in 2016 and there was those people who championed it back then who, who have to be recognised and, and, and I thank the Chair for making sure uh, that that was done. Uh, and I do thank the Chair and the Vice Chair for, for the guidance of the Committee and all the Committee members uh, for what they have done in, in scrutinising um, uh, this bill. Uh, but I also do um, have to mention Paul, Paul Given for the work he did and, and also Linda Dillon for, for the excellent work that she did in the Justice Committee as well because it wouldn't have got here w w without that. But clearly those in the Department for Justice and the Minister with the vision to drive this forward uh, has to have uh, special mention also. It creates the offence of stalking, the offence of threatening or abusive behaviour, uh, and it embeds stalking protection orders in our criminal justice system. Um, of all the words that have been said, and regardless of, of how we articulate what we want to say, uh, this good legislation will protect the people of Northern Ireland overwhelmingly, not always, but overwhelmingly young girls uh, and women. Uh, and therefore, it has to be welcomed. Uh, and uh, as the Ulster Unionist Party spokesperson uh, on justice, I absolutely welcome uh, where we have got to in regards to this uh, legislation. Uh, and I look forward it, to it getting royal assent, um, to it being enacted, uh, and quite rightly that the resources are all put in place to make sure that what we intend it to do, that it actually does. Thank you. Thank you, Member, for that. And I call Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, final stage of this bill comes on the day after the laws on coercive control came into force. This serves to re-emphasise just how important this bill is, 
as a part of a package of legislation brought forward by the Justice Minister, particularly in the context where reported crimes of harassment are rising so rapidly. As the Justice Minister reminded us earlier, stalking can be both psychologically and physically damaging to victims, given the extreme lengths to which often del uh, delusional offenders go. That is why it is so vital to create a specific offence where um, repeated or even fixated behaviour or a single incident of threatening or abusive behaviour comes into law. A further important aspect of the bill is that victims will have automatic el eligibility for special measures assistance, again as part of a package of legislation which will rebalance the justice system so that it recognises the sensitivities involved in such cases and adequately protects victims. The bill also creates stalking protection orders which are an essential tool to prevent um, to prevention in the first place. I would like at this stage to thank the Susie Lamplew Trust alongside organisations such as Women's Aid and Victim Support for keeping this issue in the public eye. They have been clear that the fundamental objective here is not to put lots of people in prison for stalking, but rather to stop stalking happening in the first place. Mr Speaker, I welcome this further extremely important piece of legislation from the Justice Minister. This will make a significant difference to people's lives and it will make people safer. Um, that is what we are all here for. Thank you. I thank the member and I call Gemma Dolan. The introduction of a new stock and fence marks another milestone in our journey towards building a society that protects women and girls and challenges and tackles the behaviour of stalkers and abusers. Today is a really positive day and the passing of the Protection from Stalking Bill will bring reassurance and protection to victims of stalking across the North. It will send a very public message that stalking cannot and will not be tolerated in our society. For too long, the North has been an outlier on these islands as the only jurisdiction without a stalking offence, but that ends now. Protection from stalking legislation will help make our legal system more human rights compliant and the inclusion of stalking protection orders will be vital to protecting victims. As we heard from support groups, victims organisations and most importantly of all, victims themselves, I listened in earnest to the harrowing impact stalking has on victims' mental and physical health. I am grateful and humble to those who were courageous enough to share their experiences and it really helped us ensure we focused on getting this bill right and I think we've done that. I recently watched a programme on BBC Three entitled Stalkers which showed the devastating impact of stalking. Many were afraid to cross their front door while others had to leave their homes to build a life elsewhere. This is the reality for many people. We cannot and will not tolerate stalking. This legislation, if implemented correctly, will bring with it protections which are long overdue, and it is my pleasure to support the final stage of this bill today. Gormagat. thank you. And I call Linda Dillon. Gormagat, Can Corlia, and I would like to associate myself with all of the remarks that have been made so far. I welcome this legislation today in its final stage, particularly given, obviously, that we had yesterday coming into law the, the domestic abuse bill and the laws around coercive control. Stalking, as has already been said, is a very insidious crime. And I think really what, what I want to say today, and it has been said by others already, that the implementation of this law is what matters, of this legislation. The training, the review, and the constant looking back at, is it working, what is working, what is not working. And I think that that's very much, I certainly will be focused very much on my role in the policing board in relation to the protection orders. And I think that as an assembly, Today is not the last day of our responsibility around this legislation. It is only the beginning. We have a responsibility to ensure, and I promised people that I met during the, the domestic abuse bill and those that I met in my time on the Justice Committee during the, the stalking bill, that I would continue to keep a close eye on this legislation, and I meant it. As long as I am elected, if I am elected, I will absolutely keep an eye on it. But I made a promise that whoever came behind me would do the same. So I think that we as legislators need to ensure that we don't think that when we pass final stage that is our work done, it is far from our work done, it is our work only beginning. We need to ensure, as others have said, that this legislation delivers, that it is workable on the ground, that proper training, proper resource is all put into this. And we all have a responsibility for that, all of us as MLAs and the department and the minister who is in charge of that department. So I think that we all need to remember that we, when we leave here today, we have a responsibility to come back to this legislation time and again and keep the promises that we made during the process. Committee 
particularly during the committee process, whenever we spoke to victims that, that suffered this terrible crime and to the groups and organisations and advocates who support them. So I welcome this today and thank the Minister for bringing this to final stage and the committee for all the hard work that they have done. Gormila Mayogov. Thank you. And I call Rachel Woods. Mr Speaker, and I too welcome the opportunity to speak at final stage um, on the protection from stocking bill and I am glad that this bill will soon become law and that the amendments made at consideration stage now mean that we'll have more robust training, data collection, reporting and guidance in relation to the new criminal offences. And I do, like others, want to thank the department, the committee staff, um, our bill clerk and wider bill team to, of, and for all our hard work and support in the progression of this bill and in facilitating our scrutiny of it at committee. And as we know, stalking, like other forms of gender-based violence, is rooted in gender equality or gender inequality. It has been said elsewhere, in a society that gives men agency and power and denies it to women, stalking makes up one part of the epidemic of violence against women and girls across the world. And like most crimes of violence against women, it often goes unreported. And as we know, stalking takes many forms. It can involve physically following or spying on a victim, loitering outside their work or home, or monitoring their activities, often through social media and online accounts. And it can involve all sorts of intimidating and intrusive behaviour, such as being sent on wanted messages, gifts, or receiving numerous phone calls, which can, on the face of it, not look insidious. So for any victim, stalking can take its toll emotionally and it can be very distressing and frightening. And it can also be a precursor to more serious crimes and acts of violence. And this is why these new legal protections are so important and will save lives. Many victims of stalking will know their perpetrators, but others will not. And it could be their partner or ex-partner, but the offence is not always tied to an intimate relationship. And it could be as a result of a dispute a person's public profile or linked to the workplace, the education establishment and so on. So incidents of stalking may not appear criminal in and of themselves. However, repeated unwanted patterns of behaviour are what constitutes the new offence. So it's so important to look at the impact of this behaviour on the victim and the entire catalogue of behaviour that they've endured. And stalking leaves victims feeling fearful, threatened, powerless and isolated. And as I mentioned at second stage, there will be a need to educate citizens of all ages and spread awareness of these new offences. We need robust workplace policies rolled out across all sectors and guidance for employers and trade unions, for example, as well as detailed guidance for the police, prosecutors, the courts and everybody in our society. We need to ensure that those at the front line of our criminal justice system are fully trained, especially the police officers who will be the first port of call for many when reporting this, say, for the first time. And given that sections one to five of the bill, which cover the new offences and court rules, are to be commenced the day after royal assent, I would ask the Minister for an update on the training programme and the statutory guidance that her department will be rolling out. And I would also hope committee could get more detail on these issues before the law comes into force. Stalking can be a life or death situation, so I do make an appeal to anybody. If you need help or advice, please do reach out. There are people and organisations that can help. So, Mr Speaker, I do thank the Minister for bringing forward this bill, the former Minister Claire Sugden and the previous Justice Committee for laying the groundwork, and all of those who gave evidence to committee. It is your voices that we are trying to capture with this bill, and I thank you for speaking up and speaking out. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member, and I now call uh, the Minister for Justice, Naomi Long, to conclude the final stage. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker, for the opportunity to close the final sta uh, stage of the Protection from Stalking Bill. I'm very grateful um, to all of those who have spoken today in favour of this legislation. It is important legislation that will help many people in our community who, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, age, race, religion or disability, are victims of what is a debilitating and insidious crime on a daily basis. The completion of this legislation will play a crucial part in generating confidence in victims to come forward and report their experiences to the police, knowing that they will be believed and will receive the support and protection they need and deserve. I appreciate the assurance that was sought um, by Sinead Bradley with respect to resourcing. Unfortunately, I know the member will understand that that is an assurance that I simply cannot give. 
In the absence of an agreed budget for the next three years, and one which recognises fully the challenges that face our justice system, and the importance of the work we do in creating safer communities and protect, uh, protecting the vulnerable, it is impossible to do so. However, I can assure her and all members of this House that I will do everything in my power to secure those adequate resources and to prioritise these services. I will indeed. And I thank the, mini the Minister, and I, also, I do thank the Minister for being honest uh, and open in relation to that issue. Uh, and, and sadly, the, the uh, former Vice Chair of the Committee, Linda Dillon, has left the Chamber, but I, I want to place on record the, the work that she did as well, and also the point that she made in terms of now her role with others on the policing board. But what conversations, Minister, can you have with the police to ensure that there is, while there is a piece of legislation that will come into law, that it will be taken, in, and I know it will be taken seriously, but that they will also recognise the challenge that there will be for them in, in resourcing, because this will, I think it was mentioned by Rachel as well, this will be resource intense sadly because of the magnitude of the issue that is out there. Well, I thank the, the member and the chairman for his intervention and I was going to come to that when I responded um, to the comments that Rachel Wood had made because of course legislation is a first step. It creates the legal framework within which people can be prosecuted for this offence. It raises the the uh, profile of the offence and hopefully gives people the reassurance and the confidence to come forward. But if this legislation is to be truly successful, um, then when people do come forward, they need to get the kind of service from the police, from the PPS, from the courts, that will actually encourage other victims to feel confident in coming forward. It isn't easy to talk about things like stalking. People often feel that they doubt their own, their own mind when they've been stalked, where the, the behaviour is so um, superficially insignificant. And yet it can be so terrifying when you're subjected to it. And so often victims will doubt themselves. And it's important um, that the right training um, is there for, for members of the, the PSNI um, so that they're able to get that, give that support at the right time. We, of course, are engaging with the police. There have been a number of significant pieces of legislation passed in this mandate. And indeed, there is another one which will hopefully be passed in the next few weeks. And all of that will add to the burden that the police have in terms of their response. However, what I would say is this, that whilst this is new legislation which creates new duties, these are existing crimes that are already, in many cases, being reported to the police. And their frustration that they cannot respond in many cases because the law is inadequate, I think is something that this legislation addresses. So there are already victims out there, people who would have been protected by a law such as this, who will not have, we were not able to access it, who in future would be able to. That is a help to the police, but I don't think we should underestimate the call on resources that it will make in terms of training um, and also in terms of delivering successful cases for prosecution. It is important that we recognise that if we are to create a safer society, one in which everyone feels secure, one in which women feel particularly confident to be able to go about their business without the fear of street harassment, without being stalked either by former partners or by other obsessive individuals, where people feel confident um, in terms of their own safety and security, then we have to invest in our policing and justice structures. We have to ensure that they are properly funded because without that, if people get bad responses, it undermines confidence in the system and it means that people are less likely to come forward. And of course, it is a serious issue because we know just how serious stalking can become if it isn't interrupted. I also want, um, Mr Speaker, to associate myself with the comments of Paula Bradshaw in thanking charity, voluntary and community sector organisations, such as, for example, the Susie Lamplew Trust, uh, which has really driven this process right across these islands in terms of looking at stalking and how that can be tackled much better after the atrocious experiences um, that led to the death um, of Susie Lamplew. I also want to thank Women's Aid, the Rainbow Project, the Men's Advocacy Project, and many more who work on behalf of victims who have been subjected to stalking, as well as those victims themselves. Anyone can be a victim of stalking. Anyone can be a stalker. So we need to be careful that whilst we recognise that this is a heavily gendered offence, 
that there will be men out there who have experienced stalking, there will be people from the LGBTQ community who will have experienced stalking, and we need to make sure that our laws and the support for victims is adequate for all of victims to feel confident in coming forward and sharing their experience. This bill, I believe, is our chance to support those victims in a meaningful and practical way and make a clear statement that stalking in our community is not acceptable and criminalising that behaviour. That is a message not just for victims, but it is one that I hope today will be heard by perpetrators of stalking. If someone says they are not interested in your attention, if it is unwanted, then stop. People must have agency over the choices and the relationships that they make. And if someone does not want to engage, then you should stop harassing that individual and you should stop stalking that individual. This is fixated, obsessive, unwanted and repeated behaviour. It terrifies victims and it ruins lives. Victims are often rendered almost unable to function as a result of their, the stalking activity. When they do function, it's often under enormous stress and strain and emotional disturbance. And many have had to not only leave their homes, but their jobs and their friends behind in order to build a new life away from the stalker. And even that is no guarantee because often the stalker will find ways at, at distance to be able to stalk their victim. In the most serious of cases, Mr. Speaker, it can lead to murder. And therefore, we should never take stalking lightly. This legislation makes a positive difference to many lives within our community. It gives us the tools to disrupt and to stop stalking behaviour and to protect those who are victims. On that basis, Mr Speaker, I want to commend the Protection of Stalking Bill to the House. I thank the Minister and all those participating in the debate this morning. The question is that the Protection from Stalking Bill do now pass. All those in favour say aye. Can't we know? The eyes have it. The eyes have it. And that concludes the final stage of the stalking bill, the protection from stalking bill. Members, please take your ease for a moment or two. Consideration stage of the Motor Vehicles Compulsory Insurance Bill. I can see it on either in infrastructure, Nicola Mallon, Nation Villa, or from Tassie. And I call the Minister for Infrastructure, uh, Nicola Mallon, to move the bill. I beg to move that the consideration stage of the Motor Vehicles Compulsory Insurance Bill be agreed. Uh, no amendments have been tabled to the bill. I propose, therefore, by leave of the Assembly, to group the two clauses of the bill for question on stand part, followed by a question to agree the long title. So therefore, the question is that clauses one and two stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that the long title be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. That concludes consideration stage of the Motor Vehicles Compulsory Insurance Bill. Oh, sorry, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Um, do we have a few speakers down for this one? No? 
Okay. Um, just checking in case we had, in case anyone wanted to contribute to that, to the long title issue. <laughs> uh, that concludes consideration stage of the Motor Vehicles Compulsory Insurance Bill. The bill stands referred to the Speaker. Uh, may me members may wish to note, as the bill is proceeding under the accelerated passage procedure and further consideration stage is listed on the provisional order paper for 1st of March, the deadline for amendments is half past nine tomorrow. That's Wednesday morning. Okay. Thank you for that. That concludes that item. Members, just take their ease, please. We now move to the next item on the order paper, which is a motion on accelerated passage for the General Teaching Council Directions Bill. Uh, Clark, could you please read the motion? That the General Teaching Council Directions Bill proceed under the accelerated passage procedure. Thank you. I now call the Minister of Education to formally move, please. Moved. Thank you, Minister. Um, the Business Committee has agreed that there should be no time limit on this debate, and I therefore now call the Minister to open the debate on the motion, please. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and with your indulgence, as this is my first opportunity to speak in this House since the untimely passing of my friend and colleague, Christopher Stolford, I'd like to offer my heartfelt sympathy to his family. Whilst I've also done so privately, I feel it's appropriate that I do so in this place where he excelled and was a larger-than-life character. To, Trinity, to Laura, Trinity, Oliver, Cameron, Abigail, Christopher's Karen, mum Karen, his siblings and his granny, I send you my love and prayers at this sad time and I will miss Christopher greatly. I welcome the opportunity to address the Assembly on this motion. The use of accelerated passage is not something to be sought routinely, nor do I take it lightly. When taking forward draft legislation, my preference is always to have a full committee procedure to um, ensure scrutiny of the resolution and any issues resolved to the committee's satisfaction. Nonetheless, there are times when accelerated passage is unavoidable, and given the shortness of this bill, I'm convinced that its use will not compromise the member's ability to adequately scrutinise this matter. I would begin by noting that in accordance with Standing Order 42.3 of the Northern Ireland Assembly, I appeared before the Committee of Education on the 1st of February to explain the need for accelerated passage for this bill and to outline the consequences of it not being granted. I wish to put on record my thanks to the Chair and to members of the Committee for their acceptance of the case I presented and for their support to move this bill under accelerated passage arrangements. Members will of course have opportunity to raise issues on the detail of the bill during its second stage debate. However, as required under Standing Order 42.4, I now wish to provide members with an outline of the bill, why I believe accelerated passage is required and the possible consequences should accelerated passage not be granted. The General Teaching Council Directions Bill is a very simple two-clause bill seeking to bring the General Teaching Council for Northern Ireland GTC and I, within the scope of an existing provision which permits the department to issue directions to a body. In this case, it could be used if the leadership persists against advice in taking damaging decisions or pursuing damaging actions. Members will recall from my statement to the Assembly on the 13th of December 2021, in which I announced on the foot of the scathing conclusions of an independent effectiveness review of GTC and I, 
my intention to legislate for the dissolution of GTCNI and to stand down its council with immediate effect. There was widespread consensus in the chamber that day that my decisions were warranted, necessary, and that they represented a positive step forward for an organisation which had been struggling and dysfunctional for far too long. Members may ask if the council if the council has been stood down, why is this bill required and why is accelerated passage needed to move it forward so quickly? The answer is simple. The decisions I announced on the 13th of December rely on an untested legislative power and while legal counsel has advised the department that its use is sound, an untested power is always vulnerable to challenge. Given the damning assessment of GTCNI's performance, Legal advice has recommended, as a safeguard against a judicial review and a reinstated council, that DE should secure a direction-making power as a matter of urgency. The Department has already received recent correspondence stating that a judicial review may be pursued, and so I believe that it's now imperative that DE secures this power as both a precautionary and protective step. Failure to progress this bill under accelerated passage would mean that it could not hope to complete its assembly passage within the remainder of the current mandate, forcing us to restart this legislative process early in the next mandate. To leave GTCNI and the department exposed to legal challenge for such a period and to potentially permit a reinstated GTCNI council, a council assessed as broken, divided and toxic, to take any further action without the department being able to intervene would not be acceptable. I would therefore ask for approval for the introduction of this bill under accelerated passage arrangements. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I call Chris Little, the Chair of the Education Committee. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And can I start by reiterating my thoughts and prayers for the family of Chris Stafford and indeed to uh, extend my sincere condolences to the Education Minister on the passing of her close friend um, and ongoing support to her at, at this difficult time. Deputy Speaker, the Education Committee has engaged in scrutiny of the General Teaching Council for some time. The Committee was so concerned that it approved the Minister's decision to take action in dissolving the General Teaching Council in December 2021. In January, the Minister briefed the Deputy Chair of the Education Committee, Pat Sheehan, MLA, and I on her intention to bring forward this bill to the Education Committee. The Education Minister then attended Committee on 1 February, where she answered questions and advised of her wish to use accelerated passage in legislating to strengthen the Education Department's position in relation to the dissolution of GTCNI. The General Teaching Council NI is the independent regulatory body for the teaching profession, and unfortunately, GTC NI's interactions with the Education Committee over the past number of years has not been to represent success. GTC NI has repeatedly been in special measures due to long standing issues with internal governance. The Education Committee was alerted to serious concerns of deep dysfunction by the Northern Ireland Teaching Council and engaged with the GTCNI Chief Executive and the Education Department to urge resolution and a constructive way forward. The Education Committee recognised that a complete reform of the organisation might be necessary. It also urged the Education Department to remedy shortcomings in its legislative underpinning of the organisation. The Committee for Education received briefings from the Chief Executive of GTCNI and the Department of Education in March 2021. Additionally, the committee heard from the chair and vice chair of the council and the chief executive in late May 2021. These briefings revealed fundamental disharmony over matters regarding council composition and powers, the Department of Education's role with the GTCNI, and a pathway out of special measures and into transformation. Recent media coverage of GTCNI highlighted inquiries into bullying in 2019 and 2021. In this matter, the committee's primary focus is the creation of a GTC or an equivalent organisation that is of service to the teaching profession in Northern Ireland, and it is vital that such an organisation can be competent and professional in exercising a comprehensive range of functions, 
in respect of the registration of teachers, teacher misconduct and safeguarding of children and young people. In due course, the Department will have to bring a package of legislative measures to redraw the new or revised entity and provide it with a full range of appropriate powers and sanctions. Deputy Speaker, in closing, the Committee understands that this will take some time, but urges that that be done without delay. Today's legislation represents a simple and immediate measure. Currently, the GTCNI is not listed among the arm's length bodies that the Department of Education has a power to direct. By bringing forward this bill with its single focus on amending Article 101 of the Education and Libraries Northern Ireland Order, GTCNI will be included on this list. And Deputy Speaker, on behalf of the Education Committee, that is why we support the accelerated passage of the GTCNI Directions Bill, which will bring us one step closer to implementing the tangible change needed for GTCNI to provide a responsible and representative professional body that works in the best interests of education in Northern Ireland. Thank you. First of all, can I also offer my sincere condolences to the family of Christopher Stalford, uh, particularly his wife and his young children. And it's heartbreaking uh, to realise that there are four young children uh, left without a father. And I'd also like to offer my sympathy and condolences to the Minister uh, and to DUP colleagues, and I know they will miss Christopher greatly, as I'm sure everyone in this Assembly will. You couldn't help but admire Christopher's intellect, uh, his intelligence, his wit, and his, his sense of humour. Uh, and I said the other night on Twitter, and I said here again, this Assembly will be all the poorer for Christopher not being here. So thank you for that, uh, uh, um, yeah, We have known for a long time that uh, GTCNI has been a, a completely dysfunctional organisation. Uh, their responsibilities to regulate the teaching profession and to register new teachers uh, has been abysmal uh, for, for many years now. Uh, and it's important, and I acknowledge the fact that the Minister has taken decisive action although it will take uh, quite a long time before um, she can fully implement change within that organisation. However, this is a first step uh, in terms of ensuring that the department can give direction uh, to leadership in GTCNI. Uh, and uh, for that reason, uh, we give qualified support to accelerated passage in this case. Gormaga. I now call Robin Newton. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, uh, like others in the chamber, could I pay tribute to Christopher Stalford and sad passing, um, degree to his wife uh, and the, the four children. And can I say thank you to the SDLP um, representatives who spoke with me on the way into the chamber this morning? And, their decision on Sunday on their party conference uh, was greatly appreciated by DUP members. So thank you for that, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In bringing this uh, bill uh, by accelerated passage, can I thank the minister for doing this? Because, uh, and the chair of the committee really has, has concentrated, I think, and captured uh, the minds of, of, of the committee um, as they started to take evidence on the General Teaching Council. Um, evidence was given, as the uh, Chair has said, uh, and indeed in, in those evidence sessions, uh, I think every member became increasingly concerned as, as the, the, the evidence was, was starting to, to roll out, and the very divergence of opinions that there, there seemed to be and indeed, on examining and hearing uh, the, the evidence, the dysfunctionality of, of the, the council uh, became very, uh, very evident. And I, I, I thank the minister for taking uh, this decision uh, on, on indeed uh, the accelerated passage decision on replacing uh, the body. Because I think, and I know that we all, and particularly over the period of this pandemic, we all appreciate the, the efforts 
that school teachers, principals, uh, schools in general have put into uh, keeping our children safe and ensuring that the continuation of education was, 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 on, was undertaken. And the General Teaching Council is a, a body, a professional body, and, and the body has, it is, it is, first of all, it's a statutory body. We have to have a General Teaching Council. So the work that the Minister will do will be replacing a statutory body. But it is an independent body. And its independence uh, is shown by the very fact that school teachers pay, they pay a fee every year to the body to ensure that the standards of teaching are kept up. And indeed, the body wasn't able even to address issues such as where a teacher was to be disciplined or even to the extreme when a teacher was to be removed from a position. The body wasn't functioning. And those who were suffering from that were the professionalism of teaching as, as a whole. A bad teacher couldn't be removed. And you can understand, it doesn't take too long before you understand the impact of, of that. And the body is a regulatory uh, body as well. So the whole teaching profession was suffering. And the remarks of the, the, those who gave evidence to the committee and encapsulated by what the, the, the chair has said was, were really concerning that here was a body which was supposed to set the standards for the profession that we all hold in high esteem and yet was functioning. It was, was not functioning. So professional registration couldn't take place. The code of professional values, as, as I've already mentioned, wasn't functioning right. And the teaching competences, the reflective view on teaching competences wasn't, wasn't being, being, being adhered to. So I th suppose, and I hope that we can agree today that the minister has taken the right decision, that accelerated passage will be uh, granted by, by, by the chamber today, and indeed that we can work towards the establishment of a body that in the future will deliver all of those aspects that it was established to do. Thank you, Mr. Principal. Deputy Speaker. Sir Justin McNulty, Hon Chai. Now call Justin McNulty. Minister, your heartfelt words on the loss of your feeling with the passing of your dear friend and our fellow member here, Christopher Salford, were very moving. I want to share with you, in offering my sincere condolences to Christopher's family, his wife and four young children, to his extended family, his friends, and to you, his DUP colleagues. He was a man I respected, a man of passion, and a man of principle. I hope that the glowing tributes made here in this house and elsewhere will provide some solace in the future to Christopher's family. Christopher Salford made an indelible mark in the short time he was here. I speak as a son of two teachers, and I'm very proud of their commitment to their profession. There should be a prestige associated with the, the professional representational body of that proud, proud profession. Unfortunately, that no longer is the case. I recognise that the GCC has had a very rough passage over the last few years. And I recognise that there are good people there who, have, who are not necessarily associated with the culture that has been allowed to cause all the damage. The concept of the profession of teachers having a voice in shaping their profession, including teacher conduct, is an important one. But the vehicle as it currently is constituted is not fit for purpose and is not delivering for teachers professionally or for society. We therefore must go back to the drawing board. The SDLP is supporting the Minister's Bill because it's a necessary step to starting again. Gurma Yogis, Lashkan 
I don't have any other notified speakers, so I'll now call on the Minister to conclude and why, please. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd like to thank all members for their expressions of condolences and tributes um, on Christopher's passing. I'd also like to thank members for their comments and also for their support for the Department's further use of Accelerated Passage. A number of important points have been raised in particular by the Chair of the Committee in respect of GTC and I, and I'll be happy to discuss those during the second stage. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you, and I would like to thank members for the, their kind and respectful comments here today, and uh, for the Minister as well. Thank you. Um, um, before we proceed to the question, I would remind members that this motion requires cross-community support. The question is that the General Teaching Council Directions Bill proceed under Accelerated Passage Procedure. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The, the ayes have it. As there are ayes from all sides of the chamber and no dissenting voices, I am satisfied that cross-community support has been demonstrated. The next bit is the eyes having had it, the General Teaching Council Directions Bill may now proceed under accelerated passage procedure. And that brings us to the next item on the order paper, which is the second stage of the General Teaching Council Directions Bill, and I call on the Minister of Education to move. I beg to move. Thank you. The second stage of the General Teaching Council Directions Bill has been moved. In accordance with convention, the Business Committee has not allocated any time limits to this debate, nor is the bill is proceeding via accelerated passage. Are there any time limits on individual contributions? I therefore call on the Minister to open the debate on the, the bill, please. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And you'll be delighted to hear that the General Teaching Council Directions Bill is a very simple two-clause bill seeking to bring the General Teaching Council for Northern Ireland GTCNI within the scope of a long-established departmental power allowing it to issue directions to a small number of bodies. In this case, it could be used if the leadership persists against advice in taking damaging decisions or pursuing damaging actions. Members will recall my statement to the Assembly on the 13th of December 2021 regarding the GTCNI. The Department had received a final report from our consultants, Baker Tilly, Mooney Moore, on the findings of their Board Effectiveness Review of GTCNI. They identified extensive governance and leadership failings, deep-seated divisions and animosities among its members. In their assessment, these failings were so endemic that they felt it necessary to offer some very stark conclusions and recommendations. Bigger Tilly Mooney Moore concluded, this review demonstrates a council which is functioning, but not functional, which is not providing leadership or advocacy to the profession. Bigger Tilly Mooney Moore also concluded, it's our opinion that GTCNI is irretrievably broken and there is no prospect of recovery to any form of adequate performance, and as such, we believe that DE should move to dissolve GTCNI with immediate effect. Having carefully considered the report, I accepted this recommendation and took the decision to stand down the GTCNI Council on the 13th of December 2021. This decision was conveyed in my statement to the Assembly on the same date. On the advice of legal counsel, I took my decisions using the Department's authority under Article 3 of the Education Reform Northern Ireland Order 1989, which imposes the general duty upon my Department to secure the effective execution by boards and other bodies on which or persons on whom powers are, confer are conferred or duties imposed under the education orders of the Department's policy in relation to the provision of the education service. However, the use of this duty in this way has not occurred before. Its application has not been tested before in court, and there are no case law or prior court judgments to give us insight into how a court might rule in such a case. As our legal counsel pointed out, there is therefore a risk to the department that my decisions could be challenged, and should such a challenge prove successful, the same counsel about which Baker Tilly Mooney Moore have concluded, and I quote, there is no prospect of recovery to any form of adequate performance. 
would be reinstated pending the passage of legislation to formally dissolve the organisation. In such a situation, there would, under the Department's current powers, be no means for DE to prevent the Council from pursuing the same damaging and divisive agenda which resulted in this damning assessment of its performance. And I wish to be very clear on this point to members. Legal Council strongly believes the Department would have a very robust defence for our actions based on both the primacy of our Article 3 power and the strength of Baker Tilly Mooney Moore's report and recommendations. Nonetheless, there is always a risk in any judicial review process. Given Baker Tilly Mooney Moore's verdict, which was heavily based on the views and self-assessments of council members themselves, that GTC and I was the worst performing organisation they had ever been asked to review, I'm unwilling to take any risk that DE would once again find itself powerless to intervene in the operation of an ineffective, factionalised and frankly toxic organisation. Furthermore, I'm not willing to allow further damage to the already tarnished reputation of the GTCNI, nor to take a risk that by its actions a reinstated council might damage public confidence in our teaching workforce more generally. Legal Council's advice, therefore, was that the Department should, in parallel with pursuing the dissolution of DGTCNI, seek to take a power to direct the Council in the discharge of its duties, should the need arise as a result of a successful legal challenge. Legal Council and DSO have both identified that adding GTCNI to the list of relevant authorities to whom DE can issue directions under Article 101 of the Education and Libraries, Northern Ireland Order 1986, is the most straightforward means to secure this outcome. For the benefit of any members who may not be familiar with this provision, Article 101 currently permits DE to direct a small number of defined relevant authorities in the exercise of their powers and duties. The current list of relevant authorities set out in the order include the Education Authority, Boards of Governors of Schools, the Council for Catholic Maintained Schools and the Northern Ireland Council for the Curriculum, Examinations and Assessment. It may reassure members to know that this is a power which has very seldom been used and it requires DE to consult with a relevant authority before issuing it with a direction. As such, it's a power which gives any organisation within its scope every opportunity to act reasonably, professionally and in compliance with its legal duties before the department intervenes. My officials have been working closely with the Departmental Solicitor's Office, the Office of Legislative Counsel, and the Office of the Attorney General to develop a suitable bill, and the result is the succinct two-clause bill before the Assembly today. However, I would point out that if you exclude the introduction and commencement details, this is actually a single line bill, adding GTCNI to the list of relevant authorities set out in Article 1013 of the 1986 order. It seems hard to conceive how the safeguards which we are seeking could be delivered in a more minimal way. Some members may be, remind, may be minded to ask the question, the need for this bill, and its urgent passage at this late stage in the current Assembly mandate. And as I've already alluded to during the previous debate, I have received three pieces of correspondence asking for clar clarification of the legal authority under which I stood the Council down. One of these was from a group of former Council members. Another explicitly mentioned the possibility of seeking a judicial review of my decisions. So in this context, being mindful of legal counsel's advice and of Baker Tilly Mooney Moore's assessment of GTCNI, I believe that it is essential to bring forward and expedite the passage of this bill at this time. In closing, I would also remind members, as I outlined in my assembly statement in December, of the department's commitment to bring forward at the very earliest opportunity a public consultation exercise to identify those functions currently assigned to GTCNI, which are critical to the sector and must be preserved, and to seek views from the public, the teaching profession, and key educational stakeholders on how these can be delivered, both efficiently and effectively. In the interim, the department has taken on immediate oversight of GTCNI's executive team, allowing its staff to continue their work, progressing new teacher registrations and registration renewals. 
Any decision on a replacement for the current council will naturally need to be included in the drafting of a GTCNI dissolution bill. We will also want this bill to address all of the is issues which have prevented GTCNI from exercising teacher regulation in the manner which it was originally intended. It's our firm intention to introduce the substantive GTCNI bill early in the new Assembly mandate. I commend the bill to the Assembly, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Christopher Little, the Chairperson of the Committee for Education. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. As I mentioned previously, the Education Committee has engaged in scrutiny of the GTC and I for some time and approves of the Education Minister's decision to take action to dissolve the Council. The GTC and I has repeatedly been in special measures due to long-standing issues and the Committee heeded the warning of the Northern Ireland Teaching Council engaged with the GTC and I, uh, Chief Executive and the Department of Education in relation to these matters. A complete reform is obviously needed of the education uh, and also a remedy of the education department shortcomings in the legislative underpinning of the organisation. A gap in the statutory varies of the GTC NI has been long standing and there should be no further delay in addressing this failure of governance. The Education Committee wrote to the Education Department in June asking that it urgently progress legislation giving public statements by the GTCNI that a deficient regulatory framework means children and young people could be at risk, and to provide further information on the roadmap out of special measures for GTCNI. Replies from the Education Department made clear that a significant level of support had been provided by the Department of Education to the troubled GTCNI by departmental officials, and I want to recognise the hard work that was undertaken by a small team of individuals in relation to that matter. The Education Department also advised that a, an independent council effectiveness review was underway, and as the Education Minister has reported today, when that review reported, the Education Minister did take ac action to dissolve the organisation, and the Education Committee uh, supported that course of action. Deputy Speaker, this is, however, an unacceptable failure to support our valued teaching profession in Northern Ireland, and the focus for everyone must now be the creation of a fit-for-purpose organisation for our esteemed teaching profession in Northern Ireland. It must be competent, professional in representing and registering teachers, regulating misconduct, and protecting and safeguarding children and young people in Northern Ireland. This legislation before the House today is a necessary step towards achieving that aim, not to detract from the need for comprehensive legislation to deliver that professional body for teachers in Northern Ireland. Deputy Speaker, I support the GTC NI Directions Bill in this second stage debate. Thank you. The General Teaching Council has been blighted uh, by a series of governance and leadership failures in recent years, and as a consequence, it has failed to live up to its responsibilities as the regulator of the teaching profession here. And such is the scale of the dysfunction we find ourselves here working to fast track the winding down of the General Teaching Council, uh, and Sinn Féin are supportive of this approach. The GTC describes itself as a statutory independent regulatory body for the teaching profession, dedicated to enhancing the status of teaching. I would argue, Kion Korla, that rather than enhancing the status of teaching in recent years, the dysfunction of the leadership and governance arrangements of the GTC actually threatened to undermine the status of the teaching profession. In the autumn, at what was a very difficult time for our schools due to COVID and the associated staff absences, the General Teaching Council could not process hundreds of newly qualified teachers, preventing them from entering the classrooms when they were most needed. A departmental public body that is failing, and one that many of its members believe is failing. So as legislators, I think we would be failing in our remit 
if we didn't bring this to an end sooner rather than later. And it's important we also acknowledge the child safeguarding issues which have been of grave concern to the Education Committee as we looked into the GTC. And going forward, we must address the shortcomings and put the welfare of our children and young people first. Now, we were told in committee that school leaderships and Board of Governors would be able to deal with the safeguarding issues in schools. However, a teacher facing serious allegations might not be an employee of a school, and this could apply for a number of reasons. For example, a teacher could resign from a school before any disciplinary action could be processed. A substitute teacher who does not have a contract with a school could be accused of serious professional misconduct. A teacher who has been referred to GTCNI for serious professional misconduct but makes an application to teach in another jurisdiction. Or a teacher who has been referred to GTCNI for serious professional misconduct but wishes to work from home as a tutor using their teacher registration certificate as proof of their suitability to teach children. So I would impress upon the Minister the importance of tightening up these areas in terms of child safeguarding and ensuring the welfare of our children and young people. We need a fresh start. Our pupils, our teachers and school leaders deserve better and they are quite prepared to work with the powers that be to bring about this much needed change. Graham Galt from the National Association of Head Teachers summed it up well when he said, we are the school leaders union and our members desire a regulatory body that ultimately serves our children. We are glad that the minister has taken this action and we are committed to working alongside her and her department in developing a new effective and fit for purpose regulatory body. I think the draft legislation before us provides us with an opportunity to take a first step and make some progress. And of course, the Minister is aware that ongoing work is required by her and her department to produce a clear plan which shows us what teacher registration looks like, but crucially, what regulation looks like also. And I look forward to continued engagement with the Ministers and others as we progress this in the weeks ahead. Colonel Mowat. I call Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. And again, I rise to support the Minister in, in taking this, this action. I think when you, when you sit at the Education Committee and a professional uh, consultancy organisation such as Baker, Tilly, Mooney, Moore appear before the Committee and uh, in giving a background to the work that they did on the review of the General Teaching Council, indicate that uh, their report uh, and their experience in writing the report has indeed um, produced for them an experience that they'd never had uh, previously, that it was indeed the most dysfunctional organisation that uh, they had uh, experienced, and indeed that their report uh, in indicated that. I do welcome the fact that the Minister, despite the fact that she and she has indicated that she was indeed moving into unchartered waters, uh, in the sense that uh, she's outlined the risk that the Minister is taking in terms of the legal risk and indicated that already there have been three inquiries uh, around that, that legal risk. So I, 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 I accept that the Minister is indeed making a very brave uh, decision here. But making that decision for all the right reasons, uh, not a political decision, but a decision to create an organization that, that will replace um, and indeed uh, take, take our, our, our profession, teaching profession uh, forward. But I do have to say this, and uh, when we get into the next mandate, the, there, there have often been in this mandate areas of controversy between the, the committee members uh, and the minister. Um, but on this issue, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, if, the, if this House is to produce a body, the minister is to, to produce a body that will replace the GTC 
and, in, and embrace all the functions of the GTC professionally, then the minister needs the support from the Education Committee. And that support should be coming forward in a very professional uh, manner. The minister has also, uh, and I welcome the fact that the minister has indeed indicated her willingness to consult. And I think that's a, a very positive step. And I, I suppose without exaggerating it, in many ways, the, the, the wider the consultation, uh, the better that the, the report will be in the end. I suppose it really is to produce a, a body that will promote, protect, and enhance the, 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 the teaching profession. And that the outcomes of the working of that body will be to ensure that our pupils, our school pupils, are all provided with a much more enhanced educational experience uh, within their years in, in school. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Just McNulty on Kanchai, called Justin McNulty. Again, I rise in my role as an SDLP MLA on the Committee for Education to support the Education's, Education Minister's Bill. Um, I have nothing further to add other than to say thank you, thank you, thank you, Gurmai Yogov, to our teachers who have kept the show on the road throughout this pandemic. And um, they've been pulled from, pushed from pillar to post, um, often putting their own health and their family's health at risk in their efforts to keep educating our children and young people. So, Gurmai Yogov, thank you. Let's go. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. If I could take it just a, a very brief moment at the start, because um, I didn't get a chance yesterday, because there were so many that wanted to pay tribute to Christopher Stalford, the Minister's uh, colleague and party colleague. Uh, I'd just like to put on record my sincere um, sympathy uh, and regret um, with regard to the past of Christopher Stalford and echo the words of the Minister. Um, and just say to everybody that paid tribute yesterday across this House, uh, fair play to every single one of you, because you give the people of this country a little bit of hope yesterday and a little bit of insight into the relationships that actually exist within here. Um, and Christopher was indeed a unique individual, as we know. He was certainly not grey, as the colour of his suits was called. He was one of the most engaging charming, articulate and talented legislators that we have in here, and he will be missed forever by every single one of us. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, in regard to the accelerated passage in this stage of the bill, yes, indeed, you do have the support uh, of the, the committee, and indeed ourselves. We listened to um, a lot of evidence uh, on the committee with regard to DTCNI and its uh, poor performance. And from, from my um, a recollection of it, there was a lot of it was uh, cultural and relational and had went beyond the point of being able to be fixed because I think having been in special measures for, for, for some time, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, things uh, were irretrievable. Um, I would just like to ask the Minister, while she has her support, if she might be able to clarify um, just something for me with regard to the intention of this bill. I know this bill in itself literally just moves the powers and moves the name of GTC and I uh, within the provisions of a, of a body. But in terms of the Department's ideas for the, the, the next phase, um, would it be, now that the GTC and I will be uh, front-facing in primary legislation and captured there, is it likely that that is where it may be kept, or is it going to be resurrected as a, a body that be reformed in the manner that it was and then will be taken out of the legislation sometime? Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you, and then I call Minister to Wayne, please. Uh, thank, the, um, thank you, Deputy Speaker. And and I would like to thank the chair and the deputy chair and the committee members for their engagement on, on all matters associated with GTC and I. Um, this has been a problematic organisation for many, many years um, and was so whenever I was on the committee um, and it was raised as um, the issues particularly around its functioning um, were highlighted at, at, the, at that time also. Um, I welcome the comments by all members who contributed um, and I also share very much um, the desire of, of the chair um, and the deputy chair uh, in particular um, that we do have going forward uh, an organisation which is competent and professional and which will give support to the teaching profession. Um, the deputy chair, however, did raise some concerns in, in relation to allegations of teacher misconduct and the potential for issues of, of child safeguarding. And if, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, you don't mind, I might be indulged just to, to maybe explain the importance of that and the current situation with regards to that. Under the Education Library Board, uh, Northern Ireland Order 19, 
2003, the Board of Governors of each school is responsible for safeguarding and promoting the welfare of its, welfare of its pupils, and they carry the, the primary legal responsibility in this matter. They do so by carrying out thorough pre-employment checks, effective school management, and the timely application of disciplinary procedures as soon as any allegations of teacher misconduct in, involving children or otherwise come to their attention. In respect of their safeguarding practices, they must follow DE guidance, safeguarding and child protection in schools, a guide for schools, and where any allegations are received involving a member of their staff, the school must additionally follow the guidance set out in DE Circular 2015-13, dealing with allegations of abuse against a member of staff. As part of these processes, the school will seek advice from key contacts and agencies, including the Chair of the Board of Governors, the designated Deputy Designated Teacher for Child Protection, the EA's Child Protection Support Service for schools, the relevant employing authority, social services, and the PSNI. Depending on the nature of the allegations, a criminal investigation or an employer's disciplinary process will normally be commenced. A GTCNI professional miss Conduct investigation can only commence once these investigations have concluded. While an initial misconduct referral to GTCNI may be made at any stage in a PSNI or school investigation, GTCNI has no role to play in any of the immediate actions taken to safeguard the pupils involved. And, and I appreciate that the Deputy Chair also listed other circumstances. So, these are the same safeguarding processes which apply equally to permanent teaching staff, substitute teachers and those employed on temporary contracts. The guidance makes it clear that even where a staff member resigns immediately after an allegation is received, this must not prevent an allegation being followed up in accordance with this guidance. By the time that any disciplinary and or criminal investigations have concluded, any teacher judged to present a safeguarding risk to any pupil should long since have been removed from the classroom. Given the sequencing, GCCNI's current inability to investigate and sanction teachers for professional misconduct could only theoretically give rise to a child protection risk where the PC, PSNI or employers' investigations have found evidence of a safeguarding risk but then failed to take action to appropriately address that. So I appreciate the concerns that have been raised and I really just wanted to underscore the fact that there are measures in place in order to try to address that so that we don't sort of create um, fears um, amongst, particularly amongst parents as, as well. Um, so in, just in conclusion, uh, Mr um, Butler raised concerns, a, a question really about what the next steps were and I think I've reiterated this maybe on a number of occasions that there will be um, a substantial amount of um, consultation take place um, in advance of um, new proposals coming forward that will be in relation to the recommendations which came from Baker Tilly Mooney Moore and also really to reflect what is required within the teaching profession uh, as well because I think we have an opportunity to do the right thing um, and I think, it, there's the, I think we need to do that and take that very seriously and to ensure that the, the profession is supported in a way that it hasn't been um, for a very long time. Um, so that will be taken forward then with a new bill, which will at the same time then dissolve the current GTCNI. So I'd like to thank members for their contributions today. Um, and given um, the comments which you have um, made, I'm assuming that we will get support um, with regards to the General Teaching Directions Bill and I do look forward to continued engagement um, with members as this bill progresses through the various stages. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the second stage of the General Teaching Council Directions Bill be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. That concludes the second stage of the General Teaching Council Directions Bill. As the bill is proceeding by accelerated passage, there will be no committee stage and the bill stands referred to the Speaker. Amendments to the bill may be submitted to the Bill Office up to half past nine tomorrow morning. That's Wednesday, 23rd of February. Thank you for that. Uh, members, um, given that the Business Committee is due to meet at half past one, I propose by leave of the Assembly to suspend until 2 o'clock when we will recommence with questions to the Minister for the Economy. Thank you.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. Okay, members, we resume the sitting. Members, time for questions for, to the Minister for the Economy, which have been rescheduled from the 14th of February. Question 11 has been withdrawn. And I call Linda Dillon to ask the first question. Linda Dillon. 
Question number one. Madam Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank you and the uh, Business uh, Committee for rescheduling uh, these questions? It's appreciated. Uh, my department is helping to address the skills gap for engineering in Mid Ulster with a range of skills programmes, including apprenticeships, assured skills, skill up, skill focus, and innovate us. I would encourage employers to avail of my department's apprenticeship programmes which play a key role in creating an effective and sustainable pipeline for skills development in the Mid Ulster area and the Northern Ireland workforce as a whole. Latest published statistics show that Mid Ulster has the highest number of higher level apprentices per capita of any local government district in Northern Ireland. In response to the pandemic, my department's Apprenticeship Challenge Fund has supported work to create a new higher level apprenticeship for the manufacturing sector, developed by the Manufacturing, Engineering, Growth and Advancement Network in Mid Ulster. This is currently in its first year and is delivered by Ulster University at the McGee campus. Latest figures show 136 apprentices participating on engineering frameworks at levels 2 and 3 in the Mid Ulster area, with the further 53 apprentices participating on the Mechanical Services Engineering Framework, which covers plumbing. In addition, Economic Recovery Action Plan funding is enabling the delivery of up to seven Assured Skills Collaborative Welding Academies at South West College, developed with local engineering companies and offering 84 training places. Skills Focus offers industry-relevant Level 2 qualifications and above, while Innovate Us delivers upskilling for innovation in this sector. Skill Up, with a budget of £23 million over three years, supports free training linked to priority areas for future economic growth in Northern Ireland. I think there can be. I thank the minister first for his answer, and, and I do appreciate that there are a high number of apprenticeships in Mid Ulster, and I think that that's testament to the work that has been done by the engineering industry in my constituency of Mid Ulster. However, every single engineering company that I've met with are still crying out for people with the required skills, even to the point where I met with one business who had someone who had taught themselves via YouTube how to use a machine. So I think that we really need now to be looking at. Uh, a centre of excellence in Mid Ulster for engineering apprenticeships, and companies would be more than happy to work with the department in order to That's deliver this. Well, um, I think that the challenges that the member has um, expressed uh, are challenges that are faced all over um, at Northern Ireland. I am aware of the of the skills issues that we face uh, right now. Um, of course, these aren't just unique to Northern Ireland. We're seeing this across the UK and the Republic of Ireland, and indeed uh, further afield. Um, I'm looking forward soon to be able to publish my skills strategy, which deals in the longer term with what we need to do to ensure that we have the skills uh, in place. Um, in addition to creating that culture of, of lifelong learning. Um, in addition, um, I'm also pleased with the progress of the Assured Skills Academies to ensure that we are pushing um, our young people and making them aware of the opportunities that exist at now and, and into the future. Um, it's also why I've launched a careers uh, review, because I want young people to be aware of the different options that are available. Uh, there's clearly a demand and a need here uh, for this, and I want to make sure that we work together with businesses. Um, and with the universities and higher and further education colleges uh, to make sure that there is the provision there that will actually make a, a, a difference. If she has a specific proposal that she would like to write to me uh, about, I'll be more than happy to consider that. Uh, Thanks very much to the Minister for his responses. Uh, Minister, uh, you will know from the constituency that it's one of the high-end manufacturing constituencies and a whole range and a plethora of, of very, very skilled workers. Um, one of the things that I have always encountered, aside from the shortages, is the, the lack of connectivity. You've got FE colleges, you have some of the best schools anywhere in the area, but that joined up connectivity between business, between departments, and that has to take place in a much more coordinated way. Some of the companies are actually going and headhunting themselves from those schools. So, is there any way between yourself and the Department for Education or whomsoever that much more coordinated approach is taken to that, please? 
Well, Mr. Uh, Speaker, I think that's why the careers review is so important because that does look at how we can work better together. Um, that schools have an understanding of the opportunities that exist for young people and how we can make sure that those pathways are known uh, to our young people in, in, in schools. I think there actually has been uh, an improved working together and collaboration between businesses, between the department, and um, between the education providers. I think you see that actually through the Assured Skills Academies. I think they've been absolutely fantastic in, in businesses coming to us, identifying need, and us working with education providers to, to address that. Of course, there's always um, uh, room for improvement, and I'll not be found wanting in making sure that can happen. Well, Peter Weir. Um, thank you. Uh, thank the Minister for the responses so far. Can I ask the Minister, in terms of um, the issue of upskilling, um, for his assessment of the importance of the Assured Skills programme, and what feedback has he had from companies in terms of the programme? Um, <clears throat> well, Mr Speaker, as I've already um, indicated, um, I think the great benefit uh, of the Assured Skills program is the ability to bring forward, bring together um, business and further and higher education, and um, my department to identify the needs that, that are there. And in terms of the specific question uh, that he asked, I can say to the member, I have had businesses that have come to me, uh, some major businesses that have invested in Northern Ireland, foreign direct investors that have come in here and have told me that they are reinvesting. And one of the reasons why they are doing that is because of the Assured Skills uh, Academy. Um, they have been highly successful. They have set out to, with an objective in mind, they've been able to achieve that. And as a result, we have seen um, provision being met and uh, need being met and uh, additional investment jobs in Northern Ireland and uh, that's something I want to see continue beyond what's in my economic recovery action plan. Call Sheer Dixon. Um, thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. Minister, can I express my dismay at your recent decision to abandon all age apprenticeships and how important they would be in an area like Mid Ulster and indeed across Northern Ireland in delivering the genuine skills that we need uh, to deliver for these new and growing industries uh, that require and are calling out for apprenticeships, regardless of the age of those that want to do that work? Well, look, Mr. Speaker, I fully understand and I'm aware of the challenges that exist uh, out there in terms of employers who need to get the skilled um, uh, workers that, that, that they require. And um, you only have to look, I think, at the plethora of um, programmes that we have put in place that were as actually what we're trying to do and actually trying uh, to address. If there are specific issues that he has, if there is something that he thinks that we need to be doing that we're not, I'm happy, I'm happy to hear from that. This will all, of course, um, be further explored in the skills strategy that I am um, bringing forward, and I think that he, he will be pleased with the actions that we intend to progress on that. Nicole Kelly Armstrong. Question number two. <coughs> With your permission, Mr. Speaker, I wish to group questions two and uh, three. And with your permission, I wish to avail of the extra minute to answer uh, this grouping. Project Stratum is a broadband intervention scheme that was allocated £165 million of public funding, £150 million of which was secured under the confidence and supply agreement between the Democratic Unionist Party and the Conservative Party, and £15 million from the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. After a competitive tendering process, Fibrous Networks Limited was appointed as the contractor to deliver gigabyte capable broadband to over 76,000 premises using £165 million of public funding and their own substantial investment of more than £45 million. Network Build is on track to deliver gigabyte capable broadband infrastructure to those 76,000 properties by March 2024. My department has now secured an additional capital funding of £32 million to bring a further 8,500 premises into Project Stratum, again mainly in rural areas of Northern Ireland. The additional premises now include premises that were out of scope due to insignificant funding when the contract for Project Stratum was signed, as well as premises that were not considered for inclusion at that time due to anomalies in the pointer address database maintained by Land and Property Service. Now, as a result of this much-needed public intervention, some 85,000 eligible premises will now benefit from Project Stratum, meaning these homes and businesses will have access to gigabyte-capable broadband, delivering the fastest speeds available to consumers. 
To date, Fibrous has completed infrastructure deployment work to over 22,000 premises. All scheduled builds in seven areas for this quarter are on track to be delivered in line with deployment targets. More than 10,000 fibre poles have been planted and 2,000 kilometres of fibre cable installed, despite challenges to working conditions faced by the contractor and its subcontractors during the pandemic. The deployment of the new full fibre network infrastructure to reach all 85,000 premises now within Project Stratum will continue across four extended quarters of network build, with fibres networks on target to complete deployment to some of the most hard to reach premises, included as part of the extended coverage plans by March 2025. Kelly Armstrong, Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Minister, you've just mentioned there the number of poles that have gone up, and some of those hard-to-reach areas are areas that are in areas of outstanding natural beauty. Um, could you confirm if part of the contract with the Fibrous Network was to put those poles in AONI, or in, sorry, areas of outstanding natural beauty, underground as opposed to overground? So, um, Fibrous Networks contact environmental bodies prior to every build phase of Project Stratum, as well as inviting them to the virtual community events that they host prior to build commencement. And Fibrous Networks use these events to explain their build plans, provide more detail on their approach, and provide contact information in the event that there are any issues uh, with the network uh, rollout. They also consult with various rural community networks, local political representatives, and councils. Build letters are distributed to local residents by build teams, informing them of the work taking place. And if there are any queries, those should be dealt with uh, promptly. And on-site meetings are also held with local residents and political representatives to resolve issues, for example, the visual impact of poles. So during build phases uh, within the Mourns area, for example, Fibrous Networks held on-site meetings with local residents and political representatives to resolve issues, for example, the visual impact of uh, poles. And um, maps produced at the low-level design stage contain details of poles infrastructure planned for public land considered an area of outstanding natural beauty. And details of the placement of the poles are then provided to the relevant council area with at least 28 days' notice of Fibrous Networks' intent to commence works. If the member has a problem with um, individual polls, um, uh, then I would encourage her to get in contact. However, uh, that should have been done through uh, the local councils uh, for that consultation to take place. If it hasn't, I'm more than happy to chase that up for her. I thank the Minister for that detailed answer. Minister, although it is deeply concerning that BT has chosen to hike its broadband prices when we're already in the midst of a cost of living crisis, hitting thousands of workers and families. Can you confirm if there are any price controls within the Project Stratum tender that prevents unfair price hikes like, um, for, like this for customers? So, um, Mr Speaker, I understand the uh, concerns that people have uh, around um, the cost of, of living crisis that we, that we find ourselves uh, in at this present moment uh, in time. Um, this scheme is helping to deliver uh, broadband to those that don't uh, currently uh, have it. I think that is to be welcomed. In terms of the pricing schemes uh, themselves, um, I would appreciate it if we get some more uh, detail from the member about the specific area that she would be uh, talking about. I can then uh, take that forward and see uh, what the issue is. Um, but ultimately, um, this will, I hope, go in the direction where there will be competition. Uh, in the areas um, that are going to be affected by Project Stratum that will then help uh, to keep the cost of uh, broadband down. Ultimately, that competition is, is what will achieve that. Michael Deborah Erskine. Thank you, and I, I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Uh, Project Stratum demonstrates what the DUP can deliver for people across Northern Ireland in every community and from every background when given the power to do so. I know the importance of better broadband in my constituency of Fermanagh and South Trone, while others try to diminish the importance of investment in rural areas. So can the Minister detail how vital this project has been, particularly for people and businesses in rural parts of Northern Ireland? 
Well, Mr. Speaker, absolutely, I agree with what the uh, member has said. Um, it's absolutely right that um, my party prioritised this as an issue because we understand the importance of good broadband and of good uh, connectivity. And uh, I, I was disappointed to hear a Sinn Féin member say last week that he didn't believe it was the job of, of government uh, to intervene um, in, in this way. And um, I have to say, I was a bit shocking to, to hear such a, a, a pro-capitalist uh, approach coming from uh, Sinn Féin. But there, obviously, uh, there is change uh, afoot. It seems, uh, from my point of view, and my party's point of view, uh, where there has been what I would consider a, a market failure in this way. I, I think it is right that we intervene, because look at the outcomes that we have been able to achieve as a result of this investment. 85,000 properties that previously didn't have um, access to broadband will now have access to that um, high-speed uh, broadband, and uh, that is something that I think should be, should be welcomed and, and welcomed warmly. Um, the member herself will know, coming from Fermanagh South Tyrone, of the issues um, that she has had and that other members uh, have raised about the, uh, the lack of um, uh, broadband, and she will know the change that it makes. And um, In some cases, it is a game-changer uh, for um, businesses, for those that need access to the internet, but also in the home as well, because some people need it in the home for work reasons, for, for social and recreational reasons, and some need it for educational purposes as well. That's what we're able to deliver through um, the money that we have been able to secure. And for her own benefit, and for Anna and South Toronto, she will know by now there were 13,572 properties uh, that now have that access or will soon have that access uh, to, to broadband. The other benefit for us as well is um, that it makes Northern Ireland as a whole much more connected. And connectivity is repeatedly um, mentioned to me by investors and by businesses in Northern Ireland about being really key for economic growth and for uh, the future. And that's what we have been able to secure and deliver through Project Stratum. I call Justin McNulty. Can call can I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. As a member for the predominantly rural constituency of Nuri and Armagh, I recognise the critical importance of connectivity for high speed broadband to all country families and businesses. Given that Sinn Féin are on record as questioning the, um, appearing to have serious reservations around the, the broadband connectivity to rural businesses and families, can the Minister give me an assurance that he remains committed to ensuring every family and every business in our rural communities is connected with high-speed high broadband and demonstrating good value for public money? Well, not only have I um, and my party said that we are concerned uh, about access to broadband, but we've actually done something about it and we have delivered on it. And I'm delighted to say that in Mr McNulty's constituency, uh, 9,061 additional properties will now have access to high-speed broadband that did not before. Those are businesses and it will make them more efficient. It will help families, it will help school children who are doing their work from home, it will um, help those that are working from home. And uh, I have to say, I, I really was struck by the comment from Mr O'Dowd uh, last week. I think that is absolutely uh, the wrong thing to question money going in to uh, Project Stratum um, as a government intervention to help those hard to reach properties. I'm more than happy for the difficult questions to be asked about the, about the process, about how it's being done. I'm here in this chamber today taking questions from members, but on the principle of this uh, executive, uh, through the confidence and supply agreement secured by uh, my, my party, uh, through that um, helping those that need it, I, I don't think that should be questioned at all. It's absolutely the right thing for us uh, to help those people get access uh, to uh, broadband, and I make no apology for it. I call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister. He'll be aware that uh, at the Economy Committee last week, uh, we were alerted to some uh, disturbingly negative customer satisfaction reports with regard to Fibrous. Uh, what's the Minister's view? Um, Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, I haven't had uh, time this week to listen back to the uh, committee. I do look forward. Uh, I do look. Uh, I, well, I, I heard part of it. I haven't seen. I haven't seen the entire entirety uh, of it. Um, if there are specific complaints, I, I, I'd be more than happy to to um, look into those and to see what the issues are. Um, there are 85,000 properties that are going to be affected uh, by this. Um, it may well be the case that at some stage some things go wrong and people aren't happy with that service. What I want to do is to help those people 
um, if there are uh, problems that are being faced and do what I can to, to support that and I know that my department and Fibrous will, will do that uh, as well. Um, but again, if there are specific queries, please do raise those uh, with us and we'll be happy uh, to take those forward. Um, but I have been speaking to a number of people that have already been connected and they are certainly content and happy uh, with the service that they have provided. If there's others that aren't, I'll be more than happy to chase it up. I call Carly Killen. Rick Hacker, question number four. Mr Speaker, I understand the impact that rising energy prices are having on people in Northern Ireland and from the very beginning of my time as Minister for the Economy, I have made it clear that affordability is front and centre of the strategy to achieve net zero by 2050. The strategy and the supporting action plan aim to develop policies and interventions to achieve affordable and stable energy prices. This will require reducing our reliance on fossil fuels, prices of which are inherently volatile and driven by factors outside of our control, improving the energy efficiency of our buildings to reduce the amount of energy that we use, including setting clear targets, standards and regulations, as well as providing support to consumers, and maximising the use of indigenous renewable resources to reduce the amount of carbon taxes that consumers pay on their energy bills. The energy strategy takes into account also the impact of the recent increases in energy prices um, that, and the impact that they're having on our citizens, with a focus on the measures that assist vulnerable consumers. These include establishing a one-stop shop to provide information, advice and support to consumers, as well as establishing a cross-departmental steering group led by the Department for Communities to develop and deliver actions to address fuel poverty. So, Minister, you outlined in your response to the question that you're concerned about obviously rising costs, and I think there, you'll not find a member in this assembly who certainly isn't. But given, given that concern, you have said your department are providing a one stop shop in conjunction with the cross departmental response led by the Department for Communities. The Department for Communities have provided £57 million to help people heat their homes. What money is your department bringing forward, for example, in terms of retrofitting, which will hopefully reduce the bills that people face in their homes, particularly at this time? Well, of course, um, Mr Speaker, that is front and centre of the um, energy strategy, because I said from the start, as soon as I came into this uh, office and was looking at the options for our energy strategy, I wanted to make sure that we were doing everything that we could to make sure that this was first and foremost affordable for people in Northern Ireland. I have constituents, the member will have constituents, we all do, who are struggling at this time, and I want to make sure that we put the support where it can be most uh, useful. That's why I want to make sure, first of all, that we are putting our efforts in terms of energy efficiency because the cheapest form of electricity is the one that you don't use. Um, so we want to make sure that people are using as little uh, as possible but still being able to heat their home and that's where efficiency comes in uh, to place. So that's why we are going to establish this one-stop shop really for everybody's energy uh, needs so that they will have the information, the advice, uh, the support that they need to make those decisions that will ultimately help save them money. For some that could be um, uh, pointing them in the right direction in terms of um, uh, renewable uh, energy and, and energy that they can create themselves. Uh, for uh, others, it will be efficiency measures. So that's where our focus is. You already see in the uh, energy strategy action plan for this year how we propose uh, to take uh, that forward. Um, I don't want to encroach on other departments' uh, responsibilities. Um, fuel poverty is um, a issue for the Department for Communities, but at the same time, we are creating that cross-departmental group so that we can deliver on those actions as well to address fuel poverty. Stephen Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Clearly, events between Russia and Ukraine could have an impact on energy markets, including the German Chancellor's decision to pull the plug in the Nord Stream 2 pipeline project. How concerned is the Minister that these events could cause further pain to local energy users here? Um, well, the news today, uh, well, the news over the last uh, couple of days in terms of um, Ukraine and also the uh, news from the um, German Chancellor today. 
um, will inevitably lead to uh, an increase um, in the uh, cost of um, energy. In the UK, we don't depend um, overly uh, heavily on, on Russian um, uh, gas. Our supplies come from elsewhere, but it will have an impact on um, world markets. I think that's why um, I put into the uh, energy strategy a focus on where we can, um, creating as much of our own um, energy as, as, as possible. And um, I think that's where we need to see further investment because the longer we are reliant on fossil fuels, uh, the longer we will be dependent upon the volatility that comes uh, with fossil fuels. And in particular, I think we're well placed in Northern Ireland to take advantage of, of, of hydrogen and the opportunities that hydrogen will bring for our economy. So not only will that create jobs and investment, but at the same time create a more stable supply of, uh, of energy, and, and that's why it's front and centre in the strategy. Thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Uh, Minister, I just want to get back um, to the, the conversation uh, regarding energy efficiencies. And, and as we all know, fuel poverty is very prevalent within our communities at the minute. You know, if you, the heat is going out the doors and windows of your home, particularly in our public housing stock, no amount of efficiencies can actually plug that gap and keep people's homes um, warm. So therefore, there has to be a certain amount of urgency on um, developing a programme to help support retrofitting. And, and wh while you have said that there are conversations happening and a one-stop shop, you know, is it with that sense of urgency that is currently required now to help support people in their most moment of need? Absolutely there is. That's why I didn't just publish a strategy and leave it on the uh, shelf. But what I have done uh, is um, actually produced an action plan for this year um, so that we can start to make the progress that we need. But ultimately, this is an executive uh, agreed energy strategy and there will be responsibilities for, for, for nearly all, um, uh, if not all, uh, ministers in the Department for Communities and the Housing Executive will be key partners in addressing some of the issues that she has raised. I call Jim Allister. <coughs> Isn't it the case, Minister, that uh, energy bills could be reduced at a stroke by 5 per cent if VAT was removed from household and other bills, but that that is impossible because of the iniquitous protocol which subjects us to the EU's VAT regime, which itself dictates there must be a minimum 5 per cent VAT charge? Mr. Speaker, it's long been the case that um, EU regulations have stopped us from taking actions that we would like to take um, in, in, as, an, as an executive, as a, as a UK government, uh, and this uh, is another example um, that, the, that the member has given us uh, today. And, uh, I want to be able to provide as much support as I can to those who are struggling with energy prices uh, at the minute. But what I don't want there to be is confusion um, or an inability for us to take action that would immediately um, uh, help uh, consumers. And that appears to be the problem with the protocol right now. Call Alan Chambers. Mr. Speaker, question five. Mr Speaker, I am well aware of the increase in costs of many products coming into Northern Ireland from China and other global markets. I appreciate the challenges that this creates for our local businesses and consumers. Cost pressures are being driven by global factors such as shipping and logistics bottlenecks, reflecting a much stronger than expected economic rebound from the COVID-19 pandemic. While welcome, uh, this has created inflationary pressure as supply chains stre uh, strain to catch up with demand. Unfortunately, these global market forces are largely beyond the control of government and will take some time to rebalance. The current volatility in both availability and prices is causing some businesses to assess the resilience of their supply chains, including taking steps to source inputs closer to home. My officials continue to monitor the situation closely, including through engagement with the UK government, business and industry stakeholders to understand the issues involved. Uh, thank you for the answer, Minister. Uh, Minister, it's also a question, and you did touch on it, availability of products for wholesalers, for instance, to sell on to, uh, to retail customers. Uh, would your uh, departmental officials uh, commit to meeting trade representatives to discuss these difficulties being experienced by the uh, wholesale trade? Um, uh I just didn't pick up all of his question there, but if it's a, if it's a request for a meeting with officials from industry, interested business and industry stakeholders, uh, I'm, I'm sure that that can be arranged by my office, and I would encourage him to get in contact with the private office. 
Okay, members, that concludes the uh, period for list of questions. Moving on to topical questions, and I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Speaker. Um, Minister, it was good to hear you say there with regard to the energy strategy that you didn't want to produce a report and leave it sitting on the shelf. Um, and it's been well over two years now since the executive parties agreed to close down the RHI scheme as part of the new decade, new approach agreement. And I note that the public consultation on this closed way back in April 2021, yet no decision has been announced. Minister, has that been shelved? Um, Mr Speaker, on a number of occasions, uh, I and indeed my predecessors have brought papers on um, the future of the RHI scheme uh, to, um, or sought to get it onto the uh, executive uh, agenda. Uh, unfortunately, that has not been possible. Can the Minister give any indication as to what the response to that consultation and the ministerial decision he would like to take would be if he can't get it at executive level? Um, Mr Speaker, this is a decision that will require uh, executive approval. Anything on the future of um, uh, the RHI scheme will uh, require executive approval. And um, I'm disappointed that I haven't even been able to get it onto the agenda to discuss it. Philip McQuiggan. Uh, Kian Collier. Minister, earlier this week, uh, the Finance Minister outlined proposals on how match funding could be provided to projects funded under the European Social Fund to allow these to continue uh, for the 2022-23 year. These projects support 1,700 jobs and serve 17,000 people in communities across the north, including my own constituency, by providing education, training, skills and employability support to some of our most uh, vulnerable citizens. Minister, can I ask why you have rejected the Finance Minister's proposals? Well, look, I, I want to thank the member for this question because it gives me a, an opportunity to provide some, some clarity on our plans to deliver these programmes next year. Uh, it seems to have gone uh, unnoticed that I had already committed £6.3 million next year to support uh, these projects. This represents a third of all match funding needed, so it is a sizeable and significant contribution. I also welcome the announcement from the Communities Minister that she is committing £1.5 million to uh, these projects. Uh, I know that the delay in making that announcement had caused many of them to fear for the future, um, so I'm glad that it's now been uh, confirmed. In respect of the Finance Minister's plans announced here by him last week, I've already written back to the Finance Minister to explain why his proposals were simply not feasible. And it wasn't just my department that came to that conclusion. I understand other departments reached the same as, uh, as me on those uh, proposals. However, let me finish on a more positive note. Uh, just this morning, my officials met with all of the uh, projects. Uh, they will be following that up in the coming days with further detailed individual uh, discussions. The message my officials gave this morning was that nobody will be left behind, and I'm happy to reassure uh, this chamber that that is my position also. So I value um, the work that these organisations do, and I am already committed to supporting them, and I will support them. Phil McGuigan, supplementary. Oh, good. Uh, Minister, you're, you're quite right. These are uh, vital pro programmes and projects, and you did indicate the unnerve and unease that the, uh, the DEP pulling out of the executive and the, the uncertainty about this fund had caused people involved in these projects. I, I, I welcome what I seem to be hearing from the Minister, a commitment that these funding will be in full. I mean, I did note that the Community Minister did uh, support the Finance Minister's proposal, so in, in fact that could have been done. But I mean, can I ask the Minister just again to commit to this House that these uh, projects will be funded in full for the next year? So, um, Mr Speaker, I think first of all it's important that I set out um, that I had recognised the, the issues that were coming down the track. That's why I had submitted to the Finance Minister a bid for £5 million to allow this to continue. Unfortunately, he refused that within the draft uh, budget, and uh, that was very disappointing that it was not prioritised at, at this time. I can say to the member that I am uh, committed uh, to supporting uh, these. I recognise the work that needs to be done. I, I will support them, and I want to ensure that these programmes can um, continue in April 2022, and I believe that's what we will do. I call Tom Buchanan. <clears throat> yeah, Mr Speaker, can I thank the Minister for the overall success of the High Street Voucher Scheme? However, the Minister will know that there was some that there was a small percentage there was uh, some problems with. Can he provide an update on progress being made uh, to deliver to that small percentage who didn't receive their voucher or whose pen failed to work? 
Yes, uh, absolutely, um, Mr. Speaker. I'm delighted with the success of the scheme. Um, the overwhelming majority of those who, who applied were verified, and the overwhelming majority of those received uh, their cards and spent their cards. And I know it's been a fantastic um, uh, help to the uh, high street. And uh, I want to, to, to thank um, Diane Dodds for the work that she did in, in setting up uh, that scheme because it has had a fantastic impact and it put money directly into uh, the hands of consumers who are able to go into businesses and spend more uh, than the uh, £100. And I hope when the member spent his £100 card, unless somebody else spent it for him, uh, I hope that he added in some uh, extra money there uh, as well. But, Mr uh, Speaker, I do recognise that there were some who were unable to either... Um, get their card uh, or uh, spend their card through no fault of their own. Those are the people that we are trying to help. And in addition, if there was at any time maladministration on behalf of the department or the card provider, those are also people that are going to uh, be helped. And um, emails have already gone out uh, to those affected, and the payments will be made in March or April of this year. Supplementary Tom McCannon. Thank you, and thank you for that, Minister. Can you give us any indication then as to when this will finally be brought to a close? Well, um, Mr Speaker, I, I hope that we will have in place all of those that were affected very, very shortly, and then that spend can begin. This will not go on for a prolonged uh, period of time. Once we have that information of those that are eligible for a remedy payment, um, we will send that information um, back to them to say that, yes, they are verified. We will give them the form to fill out, to put in their bank details, and then by March, April time, that will be back. And uh, I hope that that will be the, by the end of the scheme. Um, we'll be able to have assisted those that weren't able to get their uh, cards. And for those that did get their cards, we have a fantastic economic impact right across Northern Ireland. Could I ask the Minister, uh, please, what is the shortfall and the implications of the funding pause at Invest NI? Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, this issue had been uh, raised this morning um, during the statement on the uh, Invest uh, NI review. It's certainly not the case um, that there has been a, a pause in terms of businesses are still being supported. Commitments that were, ma that were made um, are still being uh, honoured. Um, but of course, as a result of the uh, lack of a budget and uh, the funding settlement, um, that was due to come our way not being sufficient. Um, there will need to be some prioritisation and uh, analysis of um, the support that we can give. Um, I hope that that can uh, be rectified. I hope that we will have a better budgetary position so that we can support those businesses that are creating jobs and bringing investment to Northern Ireland. Thanks very much to the Minister. <clears throat> and I see that's contingent upon the budget and the budgetary implications of that might be something the Minister would want to speak about too. Um, but um, could he be maybe just a wee bit more uh, precise about any offers of funding that have either been delayed or withdrawn as a result of this pause? Sorry, I think the Member was asking, have there been any um, offers of funding? No, at this stage, um, to the best of my knowledge, and I certainly haven't been told anything else, there has been uh, nothing that has been uh, withdrawn um, at, at this stage. All, all bids will be uh, considered. Call Paul Fruit. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister, you recently visited the United Arab Emirates. Uh, what, what opportunities are there for Northern Ireland companies in the Middle East uh, region? Um, there, there are huge opportunities in the, in the Middle East region for Northern Ireland companies, and I think that we um, have seen that in our, in our recent visit uh, there. Um, I, I met with a, a company that is providing waste management facilities in uh, the Middle East, and um, I think that Northern Ireland is, is at the heart um, of innovation uh, right now. You know through the, the 10x strategy what it is that we're doing and what it is that we are trying uh, to achieve. The United Arab Emirates in particular is really important uh, for us as, as a gateway uh, through into the wider Middle East and we're seeing huge changes taking place there, in particular in Saudi Arabia, which is really opening up to us in a way that hasn't been uh, before. And um, one of the key sectors is actually uh, mining um, uh, equipment, um, the equipment that we make uh, here. Um, so a huge opportunity for uh, Northern Ireland uh, uh, companies in, um, in, in that region. Paul Flew. You, Mr. Speaker, and the Minister will know well that all politics is local, so can I ask the Minister, does uh, his work there impact positively on any companies from the North Antrim area? 
Yes, uh, indeed, there were, there were a couple of companies uh, from the uh, North Antrim area that I had uh, met with and that Invest NI are uh, working with in uh, the Middle East. And um, I think actually it's, it's worth mentioning at uh, Gulf Food um, that I was at as well. Uh, we saw a huge demand and interest in dairy products in, in Northern Ireland. And I know that there are many, many uh, dairy farmers in uh, North Antrim that are also uh, uh, benefiting uh, from that. So it's great to see the, the manufacturing uh, industries um, uh, doing really well and exports out to, to the Middle East. I would mention Wrightbus in particular. I had the pleasure of meeting with them uh, recently, and I know that they have a lot of interest and a lot of work uh, in the Middle East uh, as well. So I'm happy to report uh, to the House um, that there is a bright uh, future for North Antrim uh, businesses in the Middle East. Well, Eileen Riley. Uh, Minister, you'll be aware that university staff are currently on strike due to reductions in their pension entitlements and broker promises over what they are owed. And I think we'll all agree that no worker should ever have to take it to the picket line to secure fair working conditions. So will you join with me to encourage university management and pension fund managers to work with staff to find a solution? Um, well, Mr Speaker, the um, universities and and further in higher education establishments are all autonomous uh, institutions and uh, it's not something that I have direct control over. However, I have encouraged them to get to the table and to uh, get a solution. I don't believe that this is good for anybody. It's not good for um, the uh, education establishments and it's certainly not good for um, our students and uh, others uh, who have seen enough disruption over the uh, last number of years. So I urge everybody to come back to the table and get an agreement. Supplementary, Riley. thanks for that answer. Um, Minister, you, students are frustrated that their lecturers have had to take strike action, especially as they continue to pay fees and can't get access to lectures or teaching. Um, do you intend to raise the issue with the universities and encourage that solution so that this dispute can be further dis or can avoid further disruption? Thank you. Um, certainly, if there is any role that I can play in that, I will be ha happy to do so. Ultimately, though, as I have said, it is an issue um, between the em employers and, and all the, the, the employees. But I would reiterate the point that she has made uh, that um, it's disruptive um, to those uh, students. And uh, like I say, they faced enough disruption already. Good Minister, just last week it was announced that sales from north to south had increased by 65 per cent, a £3.6 million daily increase in the value of trade. Therefore, do you agree that, the, that no one has anything to fear from increase in trade north south, which is in fact creating much more needed jobs? Well, of course, the increase in trade in North South uh, isn't isn't new trade. It's the diversion of trade um, that was previously between Great Britain and Northern Ireland as a direct result of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, it's a change that others have had to make um, as a result of the protocol. It doesn't mean that it's better for them or cheaper for them, but it's just easier as a result uh, of uh, the protocol. So I think that's where our um, uh, focus needs to be on resolving these issues. I recently uh, received figures to demonstrate the um, impact on food prices. Um, over the last uh, number uh, of years and the impact that that is having. Average food prices in Northern Ireland increased by 5 per cent compared to a 13 per cent decrease in Great Britain. Uh, that is uh, a massive change between uh, GB uh, and uh, Northern Ireland. Frictions in the Irish Sea have contributed to that and that should be a cause for concern. So I hope that everybody in the House would want to join uh, with me in ensuring that we deal with those frictions between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, because if we do, it will help all of our constituents. Supplementary, Liz Cummins. Minister, the South are purchasing less products from Britain and, and are instead using supply lines here in the North, so certainly that is, is positive for us here in the North. So I would like to ask then, how is your department supporting those local business businesses to benefit from these new trading realities um, that we are seeing? Well, um, Mr Speaker, again, I think that she misses um, uh, the important point in all of this, which is the frictions that exist between Great Britain and Northern Ireland uh, are causing economic harm uh, to uh, Northern Ireland. She, 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 this, is, this is part of the problem. She refuses to accept that that is an issue. I can take you uh, to businesses right across Northern Ireland who are impacted by this, businesses that are having to take on additional staff to deal with the paperwork. I have uh, complaints here. Uh, about the problems that are being caused by the protocol, a 10 to 20 per cent increase in cost directly attributable to uh, the, pro the protocol. Uh, letters from, from members on the other side uh, of the House complaining about the checks that are taking place and the impact that it's having uh, on their businesses. Um, 
uh, goods and products that they can't get uh, from uh, Great Britain, the increase in the food prices that I have already uh, mentioned. And remember, that is all held up and supported by £500 million worth of a trader support system that is due uh, to go. So our focus should be on dealing with those issues because they are the issues that are having a direct impact on our constituents. The members' time is up. Members, please take your ease for a moment or two before we move on to the next question time. Okay, members. Sittings resume. We now move on to questions to the Minister of Finance, and I call first of all Andrew Muir. Well, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Cancora, uh, just before I answer, I, I had the opportunity to be in the chamber yesterday, and I just want to add my condolences to the family and friends and, and colleagues of Christopher Stalford. Uh, it's a very sad loss. He, I think we'll all be poorer for his passing. Uh, in relation to the question, I have noted the views of the Fiscal Council and their view that the Department of Justice have done less well than other departments when considering the combined impact of the required 2 per cent savings and the general allocations provided. However, it is worth noting that the Fiscal Council's assessment did not take into account the other significant funding that was proposed for DOJ in the draft budget, namely $44.4 million for the PSNI and $10.7 million for the work on reducing and preventing domestic and sexual abuse. Further to this, DOJ would also continue to receive the security funding, which provides $31.2 million per annum for the three years outlined in the budget. Of course, many pressures remain throughout this budget process. I have highlighted the significant financial challenges we face. It simply remains that the funding available to us falls well short of what is required. As such, we must prioritise expenditure. On this issue, the Executive has consistently indicated that the priority is health, and the draft budget reflected this, with the Department of Health receiving additional funding significantly above that received under Barnett. To do this, savings from other departments, including the Department of Justice, were necessary. I welcome the views of the Fiscal Council and indeed all the respondents to the draft budget consultation. These will be fully considered as and when the final budget proposals are developed. On this issue, it will be imperative that the Executive works together collectively to find solutions to the financial challenges faced. Thank the Minister for his response. The reality is that we don't have any budget for the next financial year, never mind the next three years, and also the Fiscal Council's findings in relation to the impact upon justice was clear. Does the Minister agree with me that we not only need a budget, but we also need a budget that keeps our communities both safe and healthy? And will he reconsider his decision to terminate the consultation on this draft budget? Well, uh, I, I agree with him in relation to that, that we do need a budget. Uh, we, we need to ensure that an executive is in place to do that. I have taken uh, advice in relation to whether we could proceed through this assembly chamber with a budget. That is not possible, I uh, am advised. Uh, and I, uh, I absolutely agree with them. We need to ensure communities are safe and protected. Uh, I have paused the consultation on the budget. I have not terminated it. Uh, and I, I still, there still is a facility in the Department to receive input if people do want to continue to make their views known in relation to it. But there is no point in putting departments and other public uh, bodies through the process of responding to a budget when the executive is not in place uh, to do anything about it. But I would hope uh, that sense will prevail and that we do return at a very early uh, opportunity to deal with the budget. Probably. Well, Philip McGuigan. 
John Collier. Uh, Minister, the Independent Fiscal Commission said that a multi-year budget provided a golden opportunity to reform public services, including uh, to reform and improve our health service. Uh, would you agree with me that, uh, that it is actually disgraceful that this golden opportunity has been jeopardised by the DUP's reckless and selfish decision to collapse the executive? Well, we have long recognised that the health service needed uh, support in, in terms of dealing with the big issues in cancer treatment and waiting lists in mental health provision. We have also recognised that the, in order to transform the health services that we have lo I've long wanted to do, uh, that that would require multi-annual funding, uh, so there could be recurrent funding to allow us to employ the staff that are needed uh, for that. So there was the opportunity uh, now, after a long number of years, to do that, to get uh, this uh, agreed. Uh, and to have uh, that certainty given not just to the health department but to a whole range of departments and other bodies who rely on funding through executive departments. And that that is certainly isn't going to be there, uh, I think, is a huge wasted opportunity. I could see if there was some logic in this, if the idea to pull out of the executive was actually influencing the protocol negotiations, but they're going on regardless of what is happening in this institution. So surely the logic is to come back in, get the executive working and try and ensure that the only people who are being punished, uh, ensure that it isn't the case that the only people who are being punished as a result of the stance of the people that we collectively represent. Well, Rose Kelly. Could uh, a moment <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I, I've been called the wrong spot altogether. But in, in terms of the uh, recommendations uh, for the budget, um, the Department of Justice obviously is saying that in terms of both uh, prison service, but more particularly the police service, which, as you know, as I said before, Minister, uh, uh, does deal with vulnerable people. So could you tell me just in terms of what representations you have had, uh, even or, or recommendations from the Fiscal Council in relation to dealing with people with vulnerabilities right across the piece? Well, the Fiscal Council didn't get into making any recommendations in relation to the budget. They, they did note that the Department of Justice was particularly pressed. And, and I recognise that if we were going to make the big uh, commitment that we wanted to make and that all parties had agreed should be the priority for health, that that was going to put strain on other departments. None of them are receiving a reduction. They all received an increase, but not at any level that they would need to do all of the th important things that justice does. We had the opportunity next year, because we had about £300 million additional uh, pounds to take into next year to allocate to try and ease some of those pressures, and that would have been very important, I think, for justice and policing, uh, uh, certainly for next year to, to supplement their budgets, but we're not now having the opportunity to do that either, and that is regrettable. Call Mike Nesbitt. Question two. Minister Long wrote to myself and executive colleagues advising that the Chief Constable Simon Byrne intended to defer the March 2022 PSNI recruitment intake as a result of the draft budget proposals. Members will be aware the executive has prioritised the health service for financial support during the next budget, and my draft budget is reflective of this. That said, the draft budget provides DOJ with an increase of 2.9%, 3.9% and 3.3% over the baseline in each of the respective budget years. Additionally, it makes specific provision of 14.8 million in each of the budget years to maintain police numbers at 7,100. It was my intention to consider the public consultation responses and bring forward final budget proposals in March. However, with the resignation of the First Minister, this is not now possible. Without an executive, there will not be a budget, and this creates greater difficulties for departments delivering public services. On this issue, it is imperative we come back together as an executive and we work collectively to find solutions to the financial challenges faced, produce a final budget and ensure that all the funds we have available are effectively utilised. I thank the Minister for the, for the answer. There is talk that without the budget, departments get 45 and then 95 per cent. But of what, Minister? Is it of this year's budget or of what? It's, it's of what would be expected to be their baseline for this year. So it's 45% initially up as far as 95%, and uh, that's if there's no executive form by the summer. Uh, there is some ring fence uh, uh, monies associated, particularly with the Department for Justice, which they would have access to as well. Uh, but the extra 300 million that I've talked about that could have been spread over to help ease pressures in departments, and of course the bigger budget itself is now not available. So it will really be a, a care and maintenance budget that departments have to work forward with uh, over the next period of time until such time as an executive is formed. Call Gemma Dolan.
Minister, and you've briefly touched on this in a previous um, question, but the Department of Justice have confirmed that it intends to cut the legal aid budget. Have you engaged with or had representations from the Law Society regarding the potential implications of this? Yes, I did a discussion with the Law Society last week, I think it was, uh, and they outlined the pressures that they're facing in relation to that. It was a very useful discussion uh, for myself as a finance minister. Uh, I, my impression was that the difference between what they needed and what may be available or the department were advising were available isn't a huge amount in the overall sum of the department's budget. So I would hope, of course, it's for a justice minister, whoever that may be in the new mandate, to prioritise uh, according to uh, their needs. But I would hope that that gap could be uh, bridged between what the Law Society have said is needed uh, for, to allow people who are struggling to access the legal services and, and what the department can afford to give them. Call Peter Weir. Thank the Minister for his question, uh, responses so far. Can I ask the Minister, he mentions about the baseline impact in terms of the Department of Justice. Can I ask him, in, in light of the concerns that have been raised by DOJ and by the police, that the baseline figure, at least as regards policing, uh, does not reflect the money that is uh, currently being spent on policing, that effectively in your money has had to be drawn in to plug gaps even to meet the current demand in terms of policing, what discussions he's had with either the DOJ or the police itself as regards the baseline figure currently for uh, policing? Well, I haven't had any discussions with PSNI, but I have uh, ongoing contact with the Department for Justice, and we're trying to understand, uh, uh, and we have had, had numerous communications with them to get a sense of the issues that they're struggling with in time ahead. Uh, and I do recognise, as I've said many times, that the, if we were to make the, the, the offer to health that the uh, parties had said uh, sh should be prioritised, that that does put a stress on other departments. Not a cut, because uh, all of them get an increase, but it's certainly not the amount of money that they would want. Uh, so I am happy to continue to work. Uh, however, that may, might inform uh, an incoming executive with the Department for Justice to understand these matters and to see what solutions could have been found. I do think the £300 million that we could have carried over into the next financial year uh, and allocated could have met some of the immediate pressure, certainly in year one, uh, of, of departments like Justice, and particularly in relation to its, uh, its funding for PSNI. That, unfortunately, is now not available to us, uh, but I would hope that there will be an executive back in place soon to take those decisions. Well, John Blair. Speaker, Mr Speaker, my, my colleague Andrew Muir mentioned just a moment ago that, that we were currently operating in a situation where we do not have a budget. But even if we did, the new decade, new approach commitment to an increase in police numbers to 7,500 and to also delivery of, uh, to deliver um, committal reform to speed up criminal, the criminal justice system um, are, are still outstanding. How on earth could those be delivered under the current budget proposals? Well, there are a range of new decade, new approach commitments uh, which ministers do try to meet. Uh, and the question is that within every department's budget, there's a very significant degree of autonomy for a minister to decide what their priorities might be. Uh, and as I say, if this collectively this institution decides that health is a priority, that there are big, big issues in health need tackled, uh, and if that was the outcome of the budget uh, consultation and the final budget process, then uh, that's the budget I had presented to reflect the discussions that had gone on to date. Uh, so that undoubtedly does put pressure on other partners, but that's where ministers then prioritise uh, new decade, new approach commitments that were made, uh, and a range of other matters which they consider to be priorities, and they try and match the budget available to them to the priorities they identify. Senior Bradley. Question three. The executive's corporate response to the RHI inquiry was published on Thursday, the 7th of October. It sets out the substantial work that has been done to date, and those pieces of work still required in a detailed action plan. Work to date includes the revision of codes of conduct for ministers and special advisers and the introduction of guidance for ministers, a better business cases policy and a new guidance on policy making the people's strategy to build the capacity and capability of the civil service, the revised guidance on project delivery and the creation of a project delivery profession within the civil service, new commercial skills and financial awareness training, significant reviews of policy and practice in records management, a revised civil service code of ethics, transformation of the workforce model in the civil service, as well as the policies on civil service recruitment and to workforce planning, and the development of a unified policy for raising concerns. Senior Bradley, supplementary. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer so far. Minister, can you confirm that all the recommendations pertaining to ministers and their SPADs will have been um, put in place before any new executive is established? Well, there are a number of recommendations that can't be implemented exactly set out. Uh, the, the independent mechanism for discipline of special advisers is recommended. We are following the recommendation that the discipline of special advisers is the responsibility of ministers, and following the Function of Government Act, that will be in line with the NICS handbook. There are recommendations which will be addressed as part of wider reforms and not immediately, as standalone changes without the relevant uh, context and not uh, as standalone changes without the relevant context being put in place. Some of the recommendations are couched in terms that cannot be affected by making new rules, but simply require responsible ministers and officials to conduct themselves in line with good practice. Uh, and the remaining actions have timescales proposed in the, in the response report, and there will be annual progress reports in relation to them. Thank you, Minister, for the update. Minister, would you agree with me that the DUP, having botched the introduction of the RHA scheme, are now failing to close it in accordance with their NDNA commitments? Well, I know that the paper has, was brought to the executive. Uh, I was due to be brought to the executive before the first minister uh, resigned uh, from the executive in relation to RHI. We have been pressing for some certainty in relation to the future of the scheme because uh, you are correct. The executive had adopted a position that they wanted to see the scheme closed. That went out to consultation. There are complex legal issues involved in that, uh, but the executive did want to get back to a position where we could take a decision in relation to the, the future of the scheme. Uh, the paper wasn't in a time uh, in order to be considered uh, by the executive because the, the first minister resigned. But uh, I would want to see uh, that matter brought to a conclusion as we, as we had promised before the executive was put in place. Steve Egan. Yeah. Minister, for his uh, replies so far. Minister, in the light of only one person being disciplined by the NICS board over RHI, does the minister think it was appropriate for the civil service board to have taken the disciplinary process decisions without informing ministers or the executive on this very controversial and cross-cutting issue? Well, I think you find the timeline meant that there was no executive in place when the disciplinary processes were uh, begun. Uh, there was no, no, there wasn't, because I, I know when I came into office where the disciplinary process was sitting, it had already been initiated uh, and that had taken forward the work uh, from the inquiry. The, the outworking of that is not something that I, there was a due process there and people were entitled to due process and uh, the outworking of that perhaps doesn't reflect what the public might have expected from listening through the inquiry, but nonetheless that was the process that was put in place uh, ahead of the executive return uh, and I have to respect the outcome of it. Well, sure, Dixon. Speaker, thank you, Minister. Minister, the uh, RHI uh, report makes recommendations with regards to ministerial directions and record keeping, and indeed you are required to take note of those uh, ministerial directions. So, can you tell the House today uh, what, what information you have received to date from the Agriculture Minister concerning his directions with regards to SPS checks and reports? Well, we haven't received any as such, but this is now subject to court proceedings. Uh, I presume that the matters then become sub judice in terms of the decision uh, that he took or the direction he gave is now subject to legal challenge. Uh, I understand there's a court hearing due in the next week or two in relation to that, so perhaps we will get some level of understanding of what uh, his rationale was behind the, the, uh, the instruction that he gave to officials. But thankfully, in terms of our own protocol arrangements, which we need to take and which the executive have agreed uh, is the course that we need to follow, uh, the courts have put a stay on his instruction, and we'll see how that, then, uh, uh, how that is dealt with in the coming weeks by the courts. Justin McNulty. Kesh Devra Cahar, question four. The last opportunity for departments to submit reduced requirements due to underspends is the January monitor round. We know from historic performance that departments will not always spend the full amounts that they forecast in January monitoring. This position is not confirmed until the accounts have been audited after the end of, year, end of the financial year. However, provisional outturn, which provides a good indication of performance, is notified to the Assembly alongside the June monitoring round. Departments do provide a monthly outturn and forecast outturn information which may provide an early signal as to where underspends might emerge at the year end. This is routinely provided to the Finance Committee. However, at this point, the published January monitoring position remains the latest available. Just McNulty, supplementary. For your answer, Minister. Minister, will you agree with me that the cost of living crisis, with the cost of living crisis our constituents are facing, it will be entirely unacceptable 
for any more to be left unspent, any more money to be left unspent. So what proposals does your department have to deploy any underspent funds to help struggling families who need that money the most? Well, I have proposals to, to spend uh, underspent funding that's left to make sure that we don't uh, surrender any money at the end of the financial year to the Treasury. I have circulated around those around the ministers. Uh, I, I would have liked to also do allocations for next year. I would have liked to done a three-year budget, uh, but that's not now available because there's no executive. So in the absence of that, I do want to make sure that we spend out what we can, that we carry over as much as we can so that hopefully an incoming executive in, in, in short term uh, will, will be able to allocate that money where it's needed next year. So a number of departments, including the Department of Communities, have bid for additional funding. Uh, and I have written to other ministers who are left in the executive, obviously absent the first and deputy first, uh, to, to take their view in relation to that. I have to say the response has been largely positive. Uh, and so I do intend to propose spending of some £45 to £50 million pounds between now and the end of the financial year across a range of departments. Minister, recently you wrote to ministerial colleagues uh, regarding your intention to allocate £45 million this year in the absence of the executive to the health board. Uh, can you confirm if other ministers were supportive of this initiative and that this allocation has gone ahead? Well, the, the £45 million that I was proposing to spend was across a number of departments. Uh, and it was on the basis that if that money was not spent by the executive, it would be, we would exceed uh, our carryover limits. I do want to, did want to try and balance that out because we are in need of a significant amount of uh, additional funding next year, and that would have been used to supplement uh, some departmental budgets next year. So, uh, to try and manage that in a way, we, we had written to other ministers to say, uh, and it was left at the end of the January month round that we did recognise there was going to be more money coming into the system, and that I would require to take further action in relation to managing that. So, on that basis, I did write to other ministers and say uh, this was my proposal. I have to say that the response has been largely positive. Positive to date, so I do intend to press ahead with that. Well, Andrew Muir. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, lots of the debate thus far in relation to this question is focused on resource spending. We understand that there was about £30 million of capital which is unspent, and if that wasn't spent, about £8 million of so that would be lost and handed back to Treasury. What progress has there been on allocating that unspent capital funding? Well, actually, Treasury have done their redone their books at the end, and they've changed the capital position for us. So they, they notified us that we have will, would receive 37.4 million less capital than previously uh, advised. So that means that we're now in actually an overspend situation with capital. So it's not a question of trying to allocate any of that between the end of the financial year. But we do anticipate, as is always the case with capital, that there will be some smaller amount of surrenders which will even that that out. But that 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 only came to us post January monitoring when Treasury was doing its own books. Well, Deborah Erskine. Five. The draft budget reflected the executive's wish to prioritise health, providing it with a 10 per cent uplift. While this has meant less resources for other departments than they might otherwise have received, no department faced a reduction from their baseline. And furthermore, since the publication of the draft budget, an additional £300 million has been made available for next year. As I said out in my statement to the House last week, the absence of an executive means that the budget cannot be agreed before the start of the financial year. This means departments will not be able to access the additional resources proposed, importantly, nor will they be able to plan on a long-term basis. Thank you. Um, cuts of 2 per cent indicated by the Minister's budget would create difficult decisions for departments which they have indicated in the media and at committees. Does he believe that that cut over all the departments impacts upon education, roads, public transport, policing, investment in our businesses? Uh, does he think that that's fair and provides the best services for all our constituents? Well, it wasn't the case of cuts in Department 2 per cent. Departments were asked to find efficiencies of 2 per cent over the budget period. Every department had an increase, with that, even with that, to its baseline budget. Every single one had an increase in spending. Uh, so the question is, with finite resources, and it becomes prioritisation, because we would love to spend all of the money on all of the areas that you have outlined, if we had all of the money to do that. Ten years of austerity budgets from the Tory government have meant that our public services are under a huge strain 
particularly our health service. And time and time again, the people in this institution, the people around the executive table have said, health is the priority. We need to tackle the big issues in health. We need to complete uh, and bar begin the transformation process in health. And therefore, we need an opportunity to do that. We now have a three-year budget, which gives us an opportunity to do that. So the question to people was, do we want to match the actual spend with the rhetoric that people have been indulging in for the last four or five years in relation to health. That means other departments don't get the level of increase they would want, but they do get an increase. And then it's up to ministers to prioritise within that department where they spend that money. Matthew O'Toole. Mr Speaker, um, Minister, you're right that prioritisation is necessary. You're right that uh, various parties here, including my own, have said that health should be prioritised. But it obviously isn't as simple as simply prioritising health, and then that means that anything else you uh, decide to do goes. Um, can I ask, Minister, when it comes to the plan now that the DUP walkout means the three-year budget has been delayed, does that mean that the findings of the Fiscal Commission might feed into a more strategic three-year budget document which can look at other either alternatives for raising revenue or perhaps more ambitious use of our borrowing powers to fund uh, the next three-year three budget that we hope will be agreed with the new executive? Well, his initial premise is a uh, premise of that you can you can prioritise health, but then you have to look at other areas as well. That's fine. I mean, that's what the budget constitution was for. But if you are going to give health, you either take back that prioritisation from health, or you you increase some departments and decrease for other other departments. Uh, so that's the choices that you have to make. So it's not a case of we can have motherhood and apple pie. We have to have one or the other. Uh, so in relation to the fiscal commission's work, uh, we obviously were ex hoping that it would be before the end of this uh, end of this mandate. It probably would be early in the new mandate. It depends very much on, on how long it takes an executive to get back into place. If it takes a long period of time and you're back to restarting an entire budget exercise, then that might well uh, coincide with the time frame around that. Uh, but I would hope, for the sake of all the people that we represent, that it won't be a very long time before an executive is back in place. There's no logic currently to an executive not sitting. It's not having any impact whatsoever on the protocol negotiations. None whatsoever. So the, the whole point of walking out and damaging the people of the North has been a pointless exercise in as far as the stated objective it is. So I would hope that logic would lead people back into the executive sooner rather than later. Uh, but nonetheless, I do look forward to the, uh, the work of the Fiscal Commission to see. I think it will contribute substantially to the debate in the next mandate. Call on you, Murphy. Earlier, and Minister, would you agree with me that the extra £300 million pounds available for next year, which is now sitting idle as a result of the DUP collapsing the executive, would have been much better utilised in helping relieve the pressures facing our department? Yes, uh, and I mean, I, I would have liked to have been, had I got legal advice, to be able to pre allocate that for next year to give departments, because uh, a lot of departments and a lot of organisations who, who depend on spend coming from departments are now sitting in a very uncertain position. And I did meetings with the voluntary community sector this morning. Uh, I did meetings in recent times with people involved in charities uh, this morning, and people who are relying on that certainty in the next financial year to decide whether they can employ staff, continue to employ staff, continue to provide training and other support programmes, uh, and they do not have that certainty as of yet. Uh, and so the, the £300 million that we had for next year would have gone a long way to supporting some of the departments who were particularly squeezed and, 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 and in turn gone a long way to providing certainty to those who rely on funding for them. Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Would the Minister explain why he stopped the consultation in the draft budget? Because whether it is the current Minister or a new set of Ministers, you're going to have to start and consult on the draft budget, and you're actually elongating any solution and a, a finalisation of funding that will be going to departments and ultimately to different groups and bodies and agencies. Well, as I say, I paused the exercise. I didn't think, I mean, I had engaged, and this morning's exercise was part of that, I engaged in a series of budget discussions with various sectors. Uh, that was part of the consultation exercise. Uh, and the meetings that I was proposing to have it substantially changed by the fact that we hadn't got an executive to agree a budget. Nonetheless, a lot of them have wanted to continue the discussion anyway. They still have an opportunity to make a response into the department if they wish to do so. But to put all of the departments and all of the arms and bodies through a, a body of work at this time in the financial year, with the uncertainty that has been caused by the walkout from the First Minister out of the executive and the collapsing of the executive's ability to do collective business, uh, then meant that it was a rather futile exercise. So I do hope that we do get back to a situation. What information has been gathered to date will not be lost. It is banked, uh, and, and people can continue to make submissions if they want. But I do hope that we do get back to a situation where we can pick it up in the near future. Members not in this place, move on to Linda Dillon. Question number seven. Thank you. 
I have sought legal advice on this matter. In the absence of an executive, it will not be possible to agree a final budget 22 for 2022-25. That means that departments cannot plan on the basis of a settled multi-year budget. While there are mechanisms in place which will allow departments to continue spending to maintain public services, these mechanisms will not allow departments to utilise the additional resources proposed in the draft budget. This is a particular concern in the Department of Health, which was expecting a full 10 per cent uplift, which funded waiting list mental health and cancer strategies in full. Supplementary, Lena Dillon. Thank the Minister for his answer. Thank you, Ken Corlea. Um, Minister, given the fact that we do not have an executive as a result of the DUP withdrawn from that executive, is there a real risk of underspending, given what you have just said around health services? And I think we are probably most of us in this chamber in the same position that we, we all will have been impacted in some way or another by, by the loss of someone or someone becoming seriously ill as a result of cancer. You have just outlined that that is one strategy that is at real risk. Is there a, a real risk of money being returned to the Treasury? Well, I'm doing what I can in this financial year to make sure that that risk doesn't arise, uh, and that's why I have written to executive colleagues to propose a level of spend uh, to try and ensure uh, that we manage what we can carry over and, and what uh, is spent in this financial year to make sure that no money is returned to Treasury. If this situation continues on for a lengthy period of time, then it will be very difficult to spend that £300 million in the next financial year. So I think the imperative is on people to get back around the executive table as soon as they can. Well, that ends the period for a list of questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. I call Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, um, I think the Minister knows that around the committee tables there is uh, general dissatisfaction with his budget. But can I ask uh, the, the Minister, since the Sinn Féin collapsed the Assembly for three years and we came back for the past two years within the Education Committee, there has been a considerable amount of discussion on special education and needs provision, both revenue and in, in capital. Can I ask the Minister why there is no annually managed expenditure? Why Amy is not mentioned uh, as a special area of special education and needs investment within his, uh, Northern, Ireland, within his Northern Ireland supplementary estimates? Well, I, I will certainly come back to him in relation to that. Uh, I, I, I'm happy to write back to him in relation to the reason for that. i just say that when the executive did collapse in, in 2017, there was a solution, a deal on the table in February 2018 to return to the executive. Your party rejected it. Uh, they returned to the same deal two years later and accepted it. So two of those years were down to yourselves. Uh, and, and we can go over all the whole history of the RHI if he wishes. I do understand that this is a budget consultation process that has been going on. That means that all of the challenges and difficulties that will arise from budget will be discussed around committee tables, will be discussed around arms length bodies uh, and all of that, because we don't have the resources for everyone that we want to give to everyone. And that's a consequence. Your own, government, your own party supported and kept in government an austerity uh, Tory government in the option of putting in a Labour government instead, where they opted to choose to support Theresa May in her government. Uh, so those are the consequences that flow from that in terms of our overall uh, budget spend. Uh, and so we haven't got the ability to do all that. But we will have to come back to a decision to decide what we're going to do, what our priorities are. And we know in doing that that there are other areas that don't receive the level of funding they might otherwise have wanted. Uh, and that was the choice that was faced. And that's what every executive has done, is to face, I, I don't recall any executive since 1998 having all of the funds that they wanted. So we have to make priorities and have to make choices. I will come back to him on the Amy question, though. Supplementary, Robin Newton. Thank, thank you, Minister, for his uh, response. Uh, Minister, you see, it is a simple question, and it's a question that I raised with you 12 months ago in the debate around the budget as to why there was not a line in the budget, a NAMI line in the budget, for special educational needs provision. And at that stage, you indicated to me you would consider the matter and come back to me. Well, can I say that I have done uh, quite a degree of consultation with the Education Department in relation to the draft budget, and that issue hasn't been raised with me. Uh, so I am quite happy to look and see why that is the case. I can assure you, and I'm sure you would expect that myself and any other finance minister 
we'll want to get as much into our budgets as we possibly can. And if there's another method of achieving that through Amy, I certainly would be very happy to explore that. But it's not an issue that has been raised with me as a significant deficit by the Department of Education. Well, the Minister agree with me that uh, the British Government should reconsider its plans to restrict the use of rebated red diesel. Sorry, I did catch that. That the British government should reduce us, uh, should reconsider its plans to reduce the use of rebated red diesel. Yeah, I mean, I, I do understand that we have all of a responsibility to to try and uh, engage with uh, policies and proposals that would help reduce uh, the damage to the environment, uh, and this is included in, in one such proposal. I do think, though, there there are unforeseen consequences of that in terms of farms. Uh, of small contractors, and I don't think that viable alternatives have been put in place, uh, or even any support mechanisms to move people away from that. It's really a, a very short, sharp uh, uh, reduction in relation to that. And I have no doubt uh, that he and, and many others around the chamber have been lobbied in relation to that uh, over the over the recent weeks and months. I have engaged with Treasury in relation to it uh, and asked them to reconsider that proposal uh, and, and outlined the effect it was having uh, certainly on our agriculture and other sectors here, as you say, contractors are affected also. Uh, and while we do want to make a contribution to uh, climate change uh, support for uh, ensuring that, that we undo some of the damage of climate change, I think we also have to do it in an organised and structured fashion that we can bring people with us and make sure that people are able to make the changes that are necessary. I thank the Minister for his uh, response. And I think Minister I agree with you. It is clear that restricting the use of red diesel you know, it won't reduce emissions alone because there, at present there are not uh, sufficient alternatives to this here. But would he also agree that if the British Government continues with these plans, that the hardest hit sectors will be small businesses, construction, manufacturing, and indeed the agri-food sector, which indeed will place jobs at risk as well in all of those sectors? Well, I know that we certainly have been hearing uh, loud and clear from those sectors as to the, the consequences uh, for them. And as I say, well, uh, we want to ensure that we play our part in, in reduction of emissions and, and meeting uh, climate change targets. Uh, I'd say that those have to be done in a way which people can engage with. Uh, and it seems to me that there are unforeseen consequences to the British government's action. And that's why I have raised with them uh, that proposition and asked them to reconsider that. <laughs> Members not in this place are called Stuart Dixon. Thank you much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Minister, what additional funding uh, are you planning to deliver for Northern Ireland's three air airports beyond that funding already allocated for air connectivity? Well, the uh one of the propositions that was agreed in the draft budget paper, there were a number of things were actually agreed and others were, were noted, and that's why we can't proceed with the actual budget itself. But one of the propositions that was agreed was for rates. Uh, holiday continuation uh, in the next financial year, and airports are included in that three-month rate holiday, and they, they have obviously received significant support. They are starting to get back to more business, obviously, since the pandemic has, has begun to recede somewhat, but nonetheless, they are continuing to struggle. It's a, it's a, a, a very sort of high-risk business in terms of the, the profit margins in relation to it. So, uh, the responsibility for, for airports isn't as clear-cut here as you would have in another jurisdiction. So Department of Finance has been playing a role, Department of Infrastructure's role, Department for, Department for Economy has a role, and we've been trying to engage specifically with Derry Airport in relation to its business case for the time ahead. But we will continue to try and engage with the airports and see what support we can. But from a finance perspective, we've been able to include them in that three-month rates holiday coming into next year. Thank you. And I appreciate your, your answer, Minister. Minister, the United Kingdom government recently announced an airports and ground operations scheme to support the regeneration of airports following uh, the COVID pandemic. What share will Northern Ireland get of that funding, uh, and how do you plan to have it distributed to the airports? Well, we're not sure as yet as what it will be. Sometimes from an announcement in Britain takes quite some time to find out if, if a barnet uh, flows our way at all, uh, and if it does, then how much that will be. Then that requires an executive discussion 
to actually decide that they, because we don't necessarily have to spend that on, on, on for what it, it came across, uh, for, for the reasons it came across. Uh, and so I, I would be afraid that in the absence of executive, we can't take any decisions, should we be aware at, 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 in the near future of what barn consequential might arise uh, from that decision. But we will keep across it. And, and obviously, uh, I've been very committed to working with the airports over the last couple of years, and we have very good working relationship with them. And we will continue to engage them to try and support them in whatever way we can in the time ahead. I call Patrick McGlone. Could I ask the Minister if, in fact, or if he could advise if it's intended that there be a rates holiday for businesses this year? Yeah, I, I suppose just to follow on from the last question, uh, one of the issues that was agreed in the draft budget paper was that uh, as a consequence of the uh, as a sort of compensatory factor that came across as a barn consequential, all businesses will receive a one month rate holiday uh, that, that will be the month of April in the new financial year, and that targeted business sectors, including retail and hospitality, airports, childcare sectors, newspapers, uh, some of the sectors which we have agreed and have had done some policy work on, will be, have been hardest hit by a pandemic, will continue to struggle to recover. They will receive a three month rate holiday, which will bring them up to July. Supplementary, Patrick uh, I've got him, I've got so, j just to get it perfectly clear, Minister, all, minister, all businesses one month and those particular sectors you just announced three months. Is that correct? Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's correct. The, the, uh, there is a compensatory issue where people could have claimed, uh, uh, because of the pandemic, could have actually claimed compensation back on rates. But we had already compensated people for the impact of the pandemic, so it would have been a, a double, uh, a double uh, receipt in that regard. So we brought through legislation to close off that opportunity, but as a compensatory factor, there was a 50 million Barnet consequential came across. We decided that to use that for one month for every business to recognise that there was some loss there, uh, I mean loss of uh, a right in terms of claim and compensation, although they had already been compensated, but also then to continue to recognise that those sectors like retail, hospitality, etc. were continuing to struggle. Uh, now the next two members are in their place, and I call Melissa McHugh. Just, I'd like to apologise as well for referring to the health board the last time when in fact I did mean other departments and so on. But this time, Minister, I am returning to health. And I've been contacted by many constituents and I think that many other uh, MLAs this, are the same, worried at reports of the waiting lists and how they're going to continue to grow as a result of the DUP's action and bringing down the executive. So, Minister, have you looked at alternative ways of actually funding uh, uh, the health services? Well, <coughs> the, the primary means to fund our health service is the budget, and where we had put in place a draft budget over three years with a significant, as I say, 10 per cent uplift for health uh, in the time ahead. Health were planning on that basis to tackle wait the waiting list issue, to fund in full cancer treatment services, to fund in full mental health services, and also to begin the transformation of health, which has been talked about for many, many years and is long overdue and actually needed in terms of trying to uh, get under control public spending in relation to health. So none of that is possible now in the time ahead. There also was a, 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 if you like, a Barnett consequence to come across as a consequence of the national insurance increase in Britain. Uh, and we've been uh, engaging with both Treasury and with legal advice to see can that Barnett consequence come straight into health rather than have but our advice to date is that it has to go through an executive. So that may well even jeopardise that money that was going, that national insurance contribution, which was been used to increase funding in health in Britain, may well get stuck in the logjam because of no executive here. So I'm hoping that won't be the case, but the advice that we have to date is that that is very likely to be the case, that we don't have an executive uh, to be able to give health that uplift. So you can see that all of the plans to try and give health significant support have been stymied by the absence of an executive. Melissa McHugh, something, Andrew. And I got the And Minister, I'm sure too that uh, you would agree with me that it's an absolute disgrace that at a time of a pandemic, that uh, because of this reckless decision by the DUP uh, to bring down the executive, that funding won't now be available. In particular, you know, uh, for the cancer services and the mental health strategy and the other needs that are, exist within the whole health service currently. Well, I mean, the strategy might have some logic attached to it if it was having an impact. But the negotiations, as far as I can see, and I'm sure as far as anybody who's sitting around here can see in relation to the protocol, are going on undisturbed 
uh, and almost oblivious to what's going on over here. Uh, so the strategy is not having any impact, apart from impacting on the people that we represent and people who are on waiting lists and people who are, 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 are desperately seeking a better health outcome. So I, I would say to those who have decided to bring down the executive, you know, if you want to protest against what's going on in relation to the protocol, bring that protest to where it has some impact, bring it towards the discussions, bring it to, bring it to the British government, bring it to the European uh, Commission who are conducting the negotiations. Don't impose penalties on the people that we represent here because it doesn't have any outcome in terms of the, the discussion on the protocol itself. I call Justin McNulty. The member may not get a supplementary. Minister, I find it quite extraordinary. Just weeks after the announcement on the withdrawal of emergency surgery from Daisy Health Hospital, your department is announcing handing back money to the Treasury. Surely some of that money could be apportioned to the Trust to enable them to facilitate a widespread recruitment uh, process to ensure we can get the, the surgeons into Daisy Hill to have our, surgery, our, our ED 24-7 hour, surgical access in our hospital at Daisy Hill. Well, I'm, I'm not quite sure where the member got the information that we're handing money back. I spent about the last hour and a half explaining I wasn't intending to hand any money back uh, to Treasury. Uh, perhaps explaining and repetition is required in some of these things before it eventually sinks in. Uh, and the other th fact is that the health department, who would need to bid for additional money to deliver it to the trusts to do whatever the trusts want to do, uh, haven't bid for any money at the end of a year. Uh, either. So my ability to, to foist money on the health department and on the trust to do recruitment uh, is limited, uh, regrettably perhaps on, on some occasions, but the fact is uh, his initial premise that we are handing money back uh, is completely false. We are spending the money that's available at the end of the year. We are ensuring that whatever happens in terms of an executive in the new financial year that they will have £300 million at their disposal. And I would hope that whatever executive comes in does engage with the budget that I have proposed, because that does give health the uplift to do the sorts of things that he's talking about across all of the health sites that we have, including Daisy Hill. And time is up, members. And uh, members, please take your ease for a moment or two before we move on to the next item on the order paper. Thank you. Order members, the next item of business is the further consideration stage of the school age bill. And I call the Minister of Education, Michelle McElveen, to move the bill. Moved. Members will have a copy of the marshalled list of amendments detailing the order for consideration. The amendments have been grouped for debate in the provisional grouping of amendments selected list. 
There is a single group of amendments which contains four amendments, dealing with the definitions and long title. Within this group, amendments two and three are consequential to amendment one. I would remind members intending to speak that during the debate on the single group of amendments that they should address all of the amendments in the group in which they wish to comment. Once the debate on the group is completed, any further amendments in the group will be moved formally as we go through the bill, and the question on each will be put without further debate. And if that's clear, we will proceed. We now come to the single group of amendments for debate. With Amendment 1, it will be convenient to debate Amendments 2 to 4. And I call the Minister of Education to move Amendment 1 and to address the other amendments in the group. Minister. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and, that, and I beg to move Amendments 1 to 4. Turning to the First Amendment, I am pleased to introduce a substantive amendment which will allow premature children to defer entry to primary school if their due date was after the 1st of April. This amendment encompasses with in young for year children those babies born between December and March due to their prematurity, but who were born due to be born between April and June, or even in the summer months if born at term. Members will note cases such as children born at the 24th or 25th week in late March, who due to this amendment will be able to defer entry to both preschool and primary school. This approach enshrines fairness and equity as it means no child is further disadvantaged and excluded from the young for year category due to their prematurity. The amendment focuses on the expected birth date of the child and whether they would have fallen within the young for year category if born at term. In a small number of cases, there will also be very premature babies born in late March, which would have been part of a younger chronological year group if born at term. My proposed amendment is an approach that representatives of premature children have advocated for many years, an approach based on corrected age. No longer will any child in Northern Ireland be required to start school a year earlier due to their premature birth. This is very much in line with the evidence around the double disadvantage of being both premature and young for year, and with the broader intent of the school age bill to permit deferral for all those who are young for year. It also continues to avoid a situation where children separated by almost two chronological years are educated within the same school class. This amendment, coupled with the right to defer for all young for year children, will give Northern Ireland one of the most progressive and evidence-based approaches to school starting age in the world. Mr Deputy Speaker, Amendment 2 is consequential on Amendment 1. The School Age Bill amends Article 46A of the 1986 Education and Libraries Order to recognise that deferred children will not start post-primary school until they reach the age of 12. This amendment includes premature children due to be born after the 1st of April who choose to defer into the scope of that definition. Amendment 3, Mr Deputy Speaker, another consequential amendment. Amendment 3 applies the same definition of final preschool year for children who defer to those children born prematurely, but due to be born after the 1st of April. This means that premature children, like all young for year children, will have the option to defer entry to preschool education and receive priority for a government-funded preschool place in the school year after their fourth birthday. Amendment 4 provides a technical amendment to the long title of the bill to ensure that it is wide enough to include amendments 1 to 3 within the bill's competence. In conclusion, I have listened to the parents of premature children and their advocates such as Tiny Life and have brought forward this amendment to include premature children who would have been born after the 1st of April into the scope of the bill. My bill gives choice, real choice, to the parents of many thousands of children born in April, May and June each year, and now also to premature children who would have been young for a year if born at term. My bill is unprecedented in its scale and scope and will transform the lives of many children 
in the years ahead, and I trust members will support the amendments. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I call the Chair of the Committee for Education, Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I welcome this uh, overdue but extremely important uh, progress that has been made on deferred school start age via the bill presented by the Education Minister and its amendments um, worked in cooperation with the Education Committee. Uh, I acknowledge the efforts and liaison that has occurred between the Education Minister, her officials, the Deputy Chair and I, uh, and the, the work that has been done to address as many provisions as possible under the accelerated passage of this bill. At consideration stage, the Education Minister brought an amendment providing for review of the category of deferred cases as urged by the committee. The committee had requested this measure to provide an opportunity for other aspects of flexible school starting age to be addressed, and we requested and, and welcomed the further amendment at further consideration stage to also include uh, premature children in this legislation. Assembly Research Service detailed extensively the potential gap in attainment between some are born and other children. The youngest in class across Northern Ireland have been overrepresented in referrals to the Educational Psychology Service, and primary school teachers have been more likely to identify behavioural problems in children with May and June birthdays. Subsequently, this group's attainment in literacy has been poorer than average. But one of the most concerning findings revealed in the RAISE paper suggested that the youngest in the year group tend to be less mature cognitively, socially and emotionally than older classmates. And as a result, the youngest pupils are up to 1.5 times more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD and 1.3 times more likely to be diagnosed with depression. The Education Committee welcomed views from Tiny Life early years and parents with an informal meeting on the 14th of December on the Education Department's proposals to allow flexibility in school starting age. And whilst the group as a whole was supportive of this approach and the enactment of legislation this mandate, a number of concerns were outlined around the impact of proposals, particularly on children born prematurely. And this uh, amendment is welcome in that regard. Stakeholders represented to the committee that children born prematurely and or experiencing developmental delay should be included in the new deferral arrangements, and also that two years funded preschool should be provided in cases where children began school too early and their parents discovered belatedly the need for them to defer. And I understand that that is a provision that will form part and consideration of the review mechanism that is included on the face of the bill. The Education Committee did express the view uh, of the stakeholders to the Education Minister um, and looks forward to the review and report of operations of the bill in due course. The Education Committee asked the Education Minister to add this review mechanism so that these matters may be addressed in further legislation if necessary in the next mandate. I welcome the Education Minister's liaison uh, with the Deputy Chair and I uh, to engage with us on the text of the definitional amendments that are being brought forward in further consideration stage today. And I am reassured by the proposed inclusion of prematurity via the amendments in defining the category of pupils referred to as deferred cases. That this should appear on the face of the bill now, hopefully as it passes today, uh, lifts a burden from the shoulders of many parents. It also precludes the need for children to miss out on the provisions of this legislation prior to the review process taking place. It may affect a small number of families, but it will make a significant difference in the lives of those children that have this provision. This important piece of legislation does show that with resolve, goodwill and precision, it is possible to make good law quickly. I welcome the introduction of these amendments by the Minister, and I commend the parents who have worked long and persistently to bring this issue to the fore. For my part,
Deputy Speaker, I've worked and supported the campaign for a number of years uh, and asked the Minister to progress uh, this bill uh, since her first days in, in office, and I'm grateful for the work that she has done in that regard. It does seem that we did have time to achieve uh, this outcome before the end of the mandate and, indeed, uh, the end of my time in this role. Thank you. I call Nicola Brogan. Last Concorla, may I begin by expressing how sorry I am about the sudden passing of uh, Christopher Stafford and can I take this opportunity to pass on my deepest sympathies to his wife Laura, their four young children and his extended family and can I also offer my condolences to um, the Minister here this afternoon and to the entire DUP on the loss of a friend and a colleague. There's no doubt that Christopher will be sorely missed um, within this chamber. Um, he was always very warm and kind to me in any interactions we had, and he really made me feel very welcome as a new MLA. Um, so I know he'll be a huge loss to you all, so you're all in my thoughts and prayers through this difficult time. Uh, last and Corla, I welcome the chance to speak um, on the school age bill, and I'm pleased to see that this important piece of legislation is progressing through the Assembly. As I've said before, um, this legislation legislative change will have a huge positive effect on the lives of, and education of so many young people and it will be welcomed by many parents and carers. I will of course support the amendments um, brought by the Minister and I'm particularly pleased to support amendment number one. This amendment stretches flexibility to meet the needs of children who were due to be born uh, between the 1st of April and 1st of July but um, who were born prematurely. This flexibility in school starting age is something that many groups have argued for. So with this amendment, um, the bill is a victory for those parents and support groups like Tiny Life who have been such strong advocates for change. It's also a victory for children because it continues to safeguard their absolute right to equal access to statutory education because children whose parents decide to delay starting school for a year will still stay in school beyond the age of 16. In this way, it's also a victory for society because the bill manages to recognise different needs while protecting equal rights. Um, this is a great achievement for what is a very modest bill. Um, the parent of any child who meets the criteria has a choice to defer their school starting age. So this simple and straightforward approach is very welcome. This bill deserves to make it through to enactment, so let's ensure that it does. I call Diane Dodds. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, first of all, I want to also record um, my sadness at Christopher's um, passing. It is a, a huge loss to the Assembly, but also a huge loss to his wife and family. Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Deputy Speaker, I also um, rise um, to support uh, the bill and, of course, to support the Minister's amendment uh, to the bill. Um, this, in, in terms of the length of the bill, is a relatively small bill, but it is a bill that will make a massive change um, to the lives of young uh, children and to their parents as they struggle uh, with uh, very young children who are young for a year um, starting uh, primary school. The original intent of the bill um, to defer, to allow uh, parents to defer uh, primary school for one year for those uh, children born between the 1st of April and the 1st of July um, has been uh, added to by uh, the amendment that the Minister has uh, brought today and that amendment will see children um, who are born uh, extremely prematurely, um, but whose birth dates would be within that qualifying, uh, original birth dates would be within the qualifying April to July period to be allowed uh, to defer um, their education for uh, a further year. And as the chair of the Education Committee has said, um, these, uh, many of these children um, who are premature or others who are just simply young for a year um, sometimes have a more difficult start to education. And while that attainment gap can narrow, um, then many of those children still go on to um, have a range of difficulties and problems um, that the flexibilities um, and the intent of the early curriculum 
uh, will uh, not be able to meet. So um, we want to support the Minister's amendment today. We also uh, want to commend the Minister on bringing forward the bill and indeed the Education Committee for the cooperation um, that uh, has been enjoyed in uh, getting this bill very quickly to the stage that it's at. The bill will give parents real choice about the early education of their children. It will ensure that we have a progressive evidence-based uh, school starting age policy and the uh, idea of having uh, a review inserted into the bill will ensure that we continue with appropriate policies at the appropriate time. I'm also really delighted that not only has the bill uh, gone through its legislative passage very quickly, but it will be in operation for the, 20, uh, for the September 22 intake. And that again is a very positive move for many parents in Northern Ireland. So I commend the bill to the House and reiterate our support for the amendment. I call Justin McNulty. I'm supporting the school age bill because children, particularly premature children or children young for their year, will have the flexibility to start formal education at a time when they are ready. The current system does not afford them that flexibility. Other jurisdictions have already addressed this important issue for children and families and now is the time for us to do the same. Accelerated passage is not an ideal way of doing this. However, in this instance, the cause is a good one and I support it wholeheartedly. Huge credit to the Minister for listening and to the parents and families and tiny life who have brought this issue to the fore and who have been instrumental in bringing it into legislation and who have been really important in terms of the positive impact they will have on children and families in the future. And now invite the Minister for Education to respond to the oh, apologies. Call Robbie Butler. Hey, Deputy Speaker, you're picking on your party colleague here, not allowing me. That'll be noted because I'm the Chief Whip, by the way. Okay. I, I did speak at, at reasonable length on this the, the last time, so I don't intend rehearsing what I said, other than to say well done to the Minister, well done to our team in the Department, because I know very often we can be quite hard on the Department and the Minister with regard to, to, to just politics and what, what we do. But this is a really good day. I said that in the, in the last debate and I look forward to this. And I'd like to thank the, the Committee Chair in case I don't, because he's, he's, he's outgoing, he's not going to stand in the next election. So if there's anything that he has achieved in this mandate, particularly, I think this is the one that will affect most lives in terms of the, the, the cooperation that there's been at the level that we all like to see. So thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you, and I now call the Minister of Education to respond to the debate. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank all members who spoke in regard to these important amendments. I'm really encouraged and pleased by the level of support, particularly from the Chair and, and the committee members, and for, the, for the inclusion of premature children and, and for the bill as a whole as we've worked through this in a very short period of time. Today's amendments address very real concerns um, regarding a potentially vulnerable group of children who have been impacted by premature birth. The amendments will give the clarity and comfort that parents of those children have sought. These amendments fit very well within the broader intent of the school age bill, which is to permit deferral for all those who are young for a year. I thank again those parents and supporting groups that have made the case for both young for a year and premature children. It has been inspirational to hear their voices, and I'm delighted to have been able to bring forward change on their behalf. These are important, groundbreaking and progressive amendments, which I commend to the House. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Members, amendment proposed to Clause 1, page 1, line 10, insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 1 be made. All those in favour say aye. Country, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 2 has already been debated, and I call the Minister of Education to move formally. Amendment 2. Amendment proposed to Clause 2, page 2, line 31. Insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 2 be made. All those in favour say aye. Country, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. 
Amendment 3 has already been debated, and I call the Minister of Education to move formally Amendment 3. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 2, page 3, line 7. Insert words as printed on the marshalled list. The question is that Amendment 3 be made. All those in favour say aye. Country no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 4 has already been debated. And I call the Minister of Education to move formally Amendment 4. Moved. Amendment proposed to the long title. Insert words as printed on the marshal list. The question is that Amendment 4 be made. All those in favour say aye. Country no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. And that concludes the further consideration stage of the school age bill. The bill stands referred to the Speaker. I'd ask members to take their ease for a few moments. Members, the next item on the order paper is a motion to approve a draft statutory rule. I'll ask the clerk to please read the motion. That the draft, envi the draft Environment 2021 Act Commencement and Saving Provision Order Northern Ireland 2022 be approved. Thank you. And I call the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs to move the motion. I beg to move. The Business Committee has agreed that there should be no time limit on this debate, and I now call the Minister to open the debate on the motion. Minister. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I am grateful for the opportunity to bring before the Assembly today the Draft Environment 2021 Act, Commencement and Saving Provision Order, Northern Ireland 2022. The order will be made under Sections 147, uh, Bar 6, 148, Bar 4, and 148, Bar 7 of the Environment Act 2021 which require the order to be laid in draft and approved by a resolution of the Assembly. It is the first and only commencement order for the provisions of the Act relating to the Northern Ireland devolved matters. While it is unusual for a commencement order to be subject to the draft affirmative procedure, this approach respects our devolution agreement and affords members an opportunity to approve the coming into force of the Act's Northern Ireland provisions. This Assembly has, of course, debated the provisions of the Act before, in respect of two legislative consent motions, and I am grateful for members' consideration and consent on those occasions. The Executive has also had the opportunity to consider and agree the Northern Ireland provisions of the Act on several occasions. I am grateful for my ministerial colleagues' support and that of the Area Committee, which has scrutinised this legislation in a thorough and expeditious manner. 
The Act received royal assent on 9 November 2021 and has two main themes. The first provide a legal framework for environmental governance and accountability now that the UK has left the EU, while the other provides for changes to the environmental legislation on producer responsibility, waste resource efficiency, charges for single-use plastic items and carrier bags, water, chemicals and forest risk commodities. This order, if approved, will commence the sections of the Act in Northern Ireland on the 20th of February 2022, which I will now set out. Section 49 and Schedule 3 set out the functions, duties and powers of the Office for Environmental Protection, the OEP in Northern Ireland. The OEP will operate independently and in enforcing and monitoring environmental protection in Northern Ireland. Section 50 and Schedule 4 allow my department and the DEFRA Secretary of State, with their consent, to make regulations in respect of producer responsibility obligations and their enforcement in Northern Ireland. They also repeal the producer responsibility obligations order, uh, Northern Ireland Order 1998. As a result of this repeal, a saving provision has been included to allow producer responsibility obligations, packaged and waste regulations, Northern Ireland 2007, made under that order, in operation until a new regime is established. Section 51 and Schedule 5 enable the making of regulations for extended producer responsibility for packaging. This will require those involved in manufacturing, processing, distributing or supplying products or materials to meet the disposal costs of these products. Section 52 and Schedule 6 enable my department and the DEFRA Secretary of State with DEFRA's dearest consent to make subordinate legislation requiring the provision of resource efficiency information to consumers about products, durability, life cycle and repairability. Section 53 and Schedule 7 enable the making of regulations by my department and the DEFRA Secretary with dearest consent that set resource efficiency requirements for products that have a significant impact on natural resources at any stage of their life cycle with a view to reducing that impact. Section 54 and Schedule 8 provide enabling powers for my department and the DEFRA Secretary of State with dearest consent to make regulations establishing deposit schemes. This will bolster enforcement procedures by creating a new criminal offence for any serious breach as well as fines and sanctions for minor breaches. Section 55 and Schedule 9 give my department powers to make regulations about changes, charges for single-use plastic items. This measure also creates a number of civil sanctions designed to minimise use of plastic items and is an example of our commitment to tackle the climate crisis and reducing our carbon footprint. Section 56 amends Schedule 6 of the Climate Change Act 2008 to provide a power for my department to make regulations requiring sellers of carrier bags in Northern Ireland to register with an administrator. Section 59 amends the Waste and Contaminated Land Northern Ireland Order 1997 to create powers from my department to introduce electronic waste tracking in Northern Ireland. It will create associated criminal offences and civil penalties. Section 61 gives my department increased domestic powers around the regulation of hazardous waste. This will enable the current hazardous waste legislation in Northern Ireland, including provisions related to fixed penalty notices, to be updated and strengthened in the future. Section 65 gives my department powers to make charging schemes related to waste licensing, waste licensing exemptions, producer responsibility, end-of-life vehicles, waste batteries and accumulators, and waste electrical and electronic equipment. Section 67 amends Article 27 of the Waste and Contaminated Land Northern Ireland Order 1987 to provide my department with powers to give direction in specified circumstances to registered carriers of controlled waste, keepers of controlled waste or the owner or occupier of land on which waste is being kept. Section 71 <coughs> is a technical amendment to Article 22 of the Waste and Contaminated Land Northern Ireland Order 1997 to reflect the transfer of functions from the Department of Environment to DERA. Section 89 enables the DEFRA Secretary of State, with DERA's consent, to make regulations about the substances to be taken into account in, accessing, in assessing the chemical status of surface water or groundwater and to specify standards for those substances. Section 91 gives similar powers to my department. Section 140 and Schedule 21 relate to chemicals and enable my department or the Department for Economy 
to amend the REACH Enforcement Regulation 2008 so far as they relate to Northern Ireland. As I previously stated, all of these provisions will commence on the 28th of February to ensure that Northern Ireland has, where possible, the same access to legislative power as other parts of the United Kingdom. The following provisions will come into force a little later in the year on the 25th of July. Section 48 and Schedule 2 cover two significant policy issues, environmental improvement plans or EIPs and a policy statement on environmental principles. The first of these places a statutory duty on my department <coughs> to prepare and publish an EIP. The first Northern Ireland EIP will be the environment strategy that is currently under development, a draft of which I recently consulted upon. The second requires my department to prepare, lay and publish a policy statement on environmental principles. Northern Ireland departments and UK government ministers will be required to have due regard to the statement when making policy for Northern Ireland. The statutory duty to have due regard to the policy statement will commence six months after the final policy statement has been led at the Assembly to allow for sufficient preparation time. We face a challenging time ahead in tackling the dangers posed to our natural world. These provisions represent a comprehensive package of measures to not only protect but improve the environment in Northern Ireland. Accordingly, I ask the Assembly to approve the draft order. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call on the Vice Chair of the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, uh, Philip McGuigan. Uh, last can call you. Uh, as Vice Chair of the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, I welcome the opportunity to speak today to outline the views of the Committee on the Commencement Order, which will bring into effect uh, a number of provisions of the Environment Bill, which completed legislative passage at Westminster in November 2021. Uh, members will recall the Assembly previously granted its, its legislative consent for the extension of the Environment Act here on the 30th of June 2020 and for supplementary provisions on the 21st of September 2021. The regulations before us today will bring into law most of the aspects of the Act which apply uh, here to the North. As members will be aware, the Environment Act establishes a framework for environment policy and oversight and provides powers to jurisdictions in respect of a number of different areas, including water, uh, resource efficiency, biodiversity, air and water quality management. The commencement order will bring a broad swathe of the Act into effect locally, including provisions regarding the activities of the Office for Environmental Protection, producer responsibility requirements and provisions pertaining to DEERA's ability to bring forward regulations to set charges on single-use plastics uh, and carrier bags. Uh, it also provides a legislative basis for the Department to enforce the removal of controlled waste make regulations for waste charging schemes and facilitate water quality monitoring. The committee notes that certain aspects of the Environment Act, including the management and use of forest risk commodities and provisions regarding disclosure of information to the OAP, will not be implemented via the order and will come into effect at a later date through alternative means. The Department notified the committee of its intention to lay the regulations on 16th of December 2021 and the committee considered the policy intent on the 6th of January 2022, where it recommended that the department proceed to lay the regulations. Uh, following the submissions of the SL5 by the department on 25th of January 2022, the committee referred the order to the examiner of statutory rules for scrutiny. The examiner reported back to the committee on the 4th of February and did not draw the committee's attention to any of the provisions. The committee therefore uh, subsequently recommended that it be affirmed by the Assembly. So, uh, in summary, Las Collier, the committee is satisfied that the order being considered today is appropriate and recommends that it proceed in order to bring into effect important provisions in the Environment Act, which will provide DEER with the legislative authority to discharge its duties in respect of environmental oversight and will also legit uh, legitimise the role and function of the OEP in respect of local matters. I call Harry Harvey. Sorry. Moving on, I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> I welcome the opportunity to speak here today um, on this legislation, which, which the purpose is to commence Northern Ireland provisions within the Environment Act, insofar as it relates to the Northern Ireland resolved matters. 
The Act can be divided into two parts. The first for the environmental government, governance and accountability, including plans and provision for a new office for environmental protection, as the UK has now left the European Union. And the second part refers to environmental legislation, enabling powers to Northern Ireland departments or amends existing legislation with respect to environmental measures, including producer responsibility for disposal costs, deposit schemes, charge for single-use plastic items, charges for carrier bags, waste charging and tracking where possible. The provisions being brought include resource efficiency requirements on products that will have a significant impact on the environment and natural resources, such as the possibility of encouraging the disuse of single-use products, disuse of products that take a considerable time to decompose. Consumers will also be provided with the necessary information to help them make informed choices, including information about the product's durability, life cycle and repairability. There will also be the power to introduce electronic waste tracking and create punishable penal penalties where necessary. While there has been no consultation carried out locally, there has been UK-wide consultation before implementation, and the department will have to prepare and publish an environmental improvement plan for a policy statement on the environmental issues, including the importance of the natural environment and environmental principles. This will also have a consultation carried out on it. Given that these provisions essentially bring most of the local effects of the Environment Act into law here in Northern Ireland, the Ulster Unionist Party will be supporting this motion. I call John Blair. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise today on behalf of Alliance content to agree commencement of the um, Environment Act and provisions within the Act which extend to Northern Ireland. The Act uh, addresses key environmental governance gaps exposed by the UK's exit from the European Union. I have shared with many others already my frustration at the incredible delay in progressing this bill. As the only jurisdiction, Deputy Speaker, within the UK and Ireland without an independent environmental protection agency, a climate change act or specific net zero emissions targets, Northern Ireland is in urgent need of policies and frameworks that will restore our damaged ecosystems. Yet it seems to me that there has been a reluctance to accept independent oversight or increased independent oversight, both in the Assembly and, it should be said, at Westminster. Foot dragging by the UK government on that issue was the main cause of delay in the implementation of the UK Environment Act, for example. There is an existing and outstanding new decade and new approach commitment to have an independent environmental protection agency in Northern Ireland plans for which seem to have been put on the back burner until the next programme for government. It is regrettable that that commitment, which was made in the early days of the restoration of this Assembly, has been delayed. Deputy Speaker, I welcome the inclusion of uh, Northern Ireland within the remit of the Office of Environmental Protection, but I also want to stress that that Office for Environmental Protection cannot be the absolute of environmental governance in Northern Ireland. With Differing roles and scope, the establishment of an OEP should not be used as an excuse for not proceeding with the independent environmental protection agency that I have referred to previously. Governance needs to be considered separately from policy. It should go without saying that independence and an ability to prosecute effectively are critical for the Office of Environmental Protection, but that is not the case. Whilst technically correct, it is clear that the new power will have the effect of allocating DEFRA and DERA ministers a central role in shaping the basic principles of the oversight body, therefore constraining the role of the OEP and its ability to act independently going forward. Finally, Deputy Speaker, I have to say this. The pandemic has laid bare the need for a new outlook on our economy and our wider society. We need to look, therefore, at a new, more holistic and inclusive economic model including our models, including more sophisticated economic objectives and indicators such as environmental regeneration, renewable energy and our impact overseas, alongside equality, inclusion, health, income, housing and the well-being of future generations. Deputy Speaker, I am content to support the motion, but I wish to stress again the pressing need for bespoke environmental legislation for Northern Ireland and the establishment of that independent environmental protection agency for Northern Ireland. Thank you. I call Claire Bailey. Deputy Speaker, um, and I welcome the Minister bringing this motion because it does allow us to speak to the, 
the commencement and saving order. Um, and with some reservations, the Green Party welcomes the Northern Ireland provisions of the UK Environment Act coming into operation. And we welcome, in particular, the oversight of the Office of Environmental Protection, as Northern Ireland has been left without oversight of the European Commission since Brexit. But it remains to be seen how the OEP will function in Northern Ireland and how effective it will be. Ultimately, the OEP does not replace all the functions that the European Commission previously held, and the main issue, of course, being that it does not have the power to levy fines. However, it does have a key oversight role, and oversight of Northern Ireland's environmental performance can only be a good thing. We're also very pleased to see the forest risk commodities provision come into effect in Northern Ireland. This amendment will make it illegal for UK businesses to use products such as soya if they've been produced in a way that is responsible for deforestation. So this gives legal protection against the worst case scenarios for claims that we've heard the Minister say will happen as a result of a Northern Ireland net zero target, for example. So fears of Brazilian beef flooding the Northern Ireland ma market overnight should be seen as unfounded with this provision. And I hope that this provision also requires us to reimagine our food systems here. 19,307 hectares of Brazilian land is used to grow soya to feed pigs in Northern Ireland. That's industrial farmland about the size of 19,000 rugby pitches where the Amazon used to once be. It's almost like Northern Ireland are actually offsetting our carbon to Brazil. And much as some may like to point the finger of blame at Brazilian beef as being responsible for deforestation, our current food system and locally produced meat are very well connected to deforestation and environmental damage around the world. And while the Green Party welcomes the NI provisions of the UK Environment Act coming into operation, we have very little confidence that this will result in any improvement to our environment. Departmental actions that have so far come out of the Environment Act do very little to inspire such hope. The environment strategy that's been mentioned, but recently closed for public consultation, is intended to act as Northern Ireland's Environmental Improvement Plan, which the OEP will provide oversight of. Now, the Environmental Improvement Plans are required under the, the Act to significantly improve the environment. Yet the strategy doesn't even set basic measurable targets. For example, the targets on air pollution are so vague, they want to publish further strategies, improve monitoring, so you could really meet them and actually not see any improvements in air quality. So how can a strategy that lacks measurable targets in most areas meet the legal requirement to significantly improve the environment? And when we know that a lack of clean air has been attributed to between five to 600 premature deaths every single year, and yet still we don't set basic measurable targets. And the water quality targets in the environment strategy don't even meet existing standards. The EU Water Framework Directive requires all member states to have all water bodies at good status by 2015. Northern Ireland failed. Then we were told 2021 and Northern Ireland failed again. So failing this, member states were then given the target or the year target 2027 to meet that all waterways meeting good standards. But instead, in our environment strategy, we set ourselves a target to reach 70% of water bodies at good status by 2027. So already we've regressed before we've even begun. And if that's a sign of what's to come, it doesn't bode well. These issues about targets point to a bigger issue. When Northern Ireland misses its target in the environment strategy, what sanctions will we face? The answer I see is none because there is no duty on Northern Ireland in the UK Environment Act to set and meet targets. And that's pretty shocking and totally inadequate and really does back up the demand for our very own independent Environment Protection Agency, as Mr Blair has pointed out, was promised, of course, under the New Decade New Approach Agreement. The Northern Ireland provisions that will commence with SLCM are not for, for purpose, really. They don't protect they don't improve our environment. 
and that's why the Green Party voted against them when they came before this House for debate. So I urge all parties to pay very close attention to the detail, and where we can, we should demand better. Northern Ireland is the 12th worst region in the world for biodiversity loss. All our waterways fail to meet basic good standards. These stats and many others are da a damning indictment of this executive's destructive approach to environmental protection. And Minister Poots, you are overseeing a public health and environmental disasters. And both your department and the Environment Agency have serious questions to answer on how pollution in Northern Ireland has been allowed to get this bad. But you're not alone. There have been many blind eyes been turned, and it needs to stop. Northern Ireland urgently needs its own Environment Act that reflects our unique environmental and geographical context, one that includes a substantive commitment to non-regression and that creates adequate legal duties on departments to achieve targets. The overarching target, of course, should be net zero and not hiding behind split targets. And when we get that right, we can begin to build a sustainable future for all. Thank you. And I call on the Minister of the Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, Evan Putz, to conclude and wind up the debate on the motion. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank you to all of the members who have contributed to the debate today, both those who supported the comments of those provisions and those who may have some reservations. And just maybe touch on some of the points that have been raised in the question um, regarding OEP and uh, not having sufficient independence. I believe that that's not the case. More importantly, the Chair of the OEP does not believe that to be the case. The Act does um, contain statutory guarantees of the OEP's independence, so if members are worried about the independence, the best thing they can do is support this order to bring those guarantees into force. On the power for DRA to issue guidance to the OEP, I understand there may be some reservations. Is it <coughs> it's there to ensure that OEP spends money effectively and accountably? Accountably, and I am happy to reassure the Assembly that I have no intention, nor the Department, of any intention of proactively issuing guidance before the OEP is established in Northern Ireland, nor will those powers be used to stop a taking action against my Department or to preclude the OEP investigating a broad category of cases. I remind members that I worked with the UK Government to include an amendment to the Bill as it proceeded to Westminster to ensure the Assembly would have the opportunity to scrutinise any draft guidance prepared by DERA. On the issue of budget, we are currently finalising detailed arrangements. The current estimate for Northern Ireland's contribution is between 800000 for 2022-23, although that is expected to rise in year two as OEP recruits its full staff complement and assumes its full functions. The OEP will cover England and Northern Ireland, and being part of that larger organisation will bring economies of scale and access to a very broad knowledge base. The cost of creating a bespoke Northern Ireland oversight body are estimated to be significantly higher, probably at least double in its first year. Regarding the environmental improvement plans, this will be an open-ended strategy with a series of action plans containing targets relevant to specific policy areas. It will contain both outcomes and high-level targets. The policy-specific action plans that flow from the strategy will turn in will in turn contain more detailed targets and milestones. The plan will provide a coherent response to the global challenges of biodiversity loss and climate change. It will be monitored and reported on by the OEP. This will ensure transparency in how we are improving the environment. The waste and resource efficiency measures in the Act will help us to deliver a circular economy in which the resources are kept in circulation for as long as possible and waste is minimised. In almost all cases, the area's policy will be taken forward through regulations that the Assembly will have the opportunity to scrutinise at a future point. Examples include extended producer responsibility for packaging, a deposit return scheme for drinks containers and electronic waste tracking. While approval of this commencement order is an important step, much remains to be done. Establishing the Office for Environmental Protection in Northern Ireland, publishing an environmental improvement plan and developing a draft policy statement on environmental principles are immediate priorities but there will also be a significant amount of new subordinate legislation, especially on waste, to make during the next Assembly mandate. I can assure members that the implementation of the NI provisions of the Act will be progressed with minimal delay. Finally, I would just like to thank once again the ERA Committee, my executive colleagues and Assembly members for their support through this lengthy process 
of getting the Environment Act on the statute books. The measures to be brought into force by this order will not only enhance existing environmental protections, but will create mechanisms that will benefit future generations through a cleaner, healthier and more sustainable Northern Ireland. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. <coughs> Members, the question is that the draft Environment 2021 Act Commencement and Saving Provision Order Northern Ireland 2022 be approved. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I'd ask members to take their ease for a few moments. All right, members, uh, the next two items of business are motions on the supply resolution for the Northern Ireland Spring Supplementary Estimates 21 uh, to 22 and the vote on account 22 to 23. There will be a single debate on both motions. I will ask the clerk to read the first motion, then call on the minister to move it. The minister will then commence the debate on the motions as listed on the order paper. When all who wish to speak have done so, I will put the question on the first motion. The second motion will then be read into the record and I will call the Minister to move it. The question will then be put on that motion. If that is clear, I shall proceed. Clark, could you please read the first motion? That the motion relating to the supply resolution for the Northern Ireland Spring Supplementary Estimates 2021-2022, as detailed in the order paper, be agreed. I now call the Minister of Finance to move the motion. Move. Last concordo. Thank you. Um, the business committee has allowed up to four and a half hours for this debate. The minister will have 30 minutes to allocate at his discretion between proposing and winding. The chair of the finance committee will have 10 minutes to speak 
and all other committee chairs will have seven minutes. All other speakers will have seven minutes too. I call the Minister to open the debate on the motion. Adam Serenaida, Leshen Gisbrach, Oskilch, Adam Wally. Cancorda, as you have set out uh, the debate covers the supply resolutions. Uh, the first resolution seeks the Assembly's approval of the 2021-22 spending plans of departments and other public bodies as set out in the spring supplementary estimates which were laid in the Assembly on 9 February 2022. Alongside the spring supplementary estimates, the 2022-23 vote on account was also laid and it will be subject of a second supply resolution. The first resolution before the House relates to the supply of cash and the use of resources for the current financial year. Since the main estimates in June 2021, the Executive has allocated additional funding received from Treasury and has reallocated existing resources. In the three monitoring rounds, the Executive allocated over 650 million additional resources and over 90 million capital. The detail of those allocations is published on my department's website. This has been another year in which financial management has been made more difficult by the pandemic and uncertainty over funding our, our final funding envelope. The Executive concluded the January monitoring round with a significant level of funding unallocated. And while the Executive wishes to maximise the amount carried forward into the next year, it is also important that total underspends do not exceed the limits imposed under the Budget Exchange Scheme. As I explained to the Assembly last Tuesday, in normal circumstances, I would now bring a paper to the Executive recommending that £45 million is allocated now. <clears throat> the Department for Communities, Education and Infrastructure have come forward with proposals to utilise the available resources. Having taken legal advice, it is my intention to proceed to make allocations to these departments, despite the absence of an Executive. Sufficient headroom has been built into the spring supplementary estimates to ensure that these allocations can be utilised. On 3 February, the Chancellor announced that a further £100 million would be allocated to the Executive as a consequence of the Council tax rebate in England and confirmed that this can be carried forward in full to 2022-23. We will also receive an additional £150 million in 2022 following the announcement of a discount on electricity bills for consumers in Britain. We can also carry over up to a limit of £104.3 million in unspent resource, and it is my recommendation that we carry over at least £50 million of this. This means that the Executive, if it were in place, could allocate in the region of an extra £300 million to departments next year, on top of the published draft budget position. Unfortunately, the legal advice is this cannot happen without an Executive, so that money will sit idle until such times as an Executive is re-established. As the Bill must receive royal assent before the end of the financial year, accelerated passage of the Bill through the Assembly is required. My officials have attended the Committee on a number of occasions to answer questions regarding the spring supplementary estimates, vote on accounts and budget bill, which we will we'll be debating tomorrow. I would like to put on record my thanks to the Finance Committee for agreeing to accelerated passage. Alongside the SSEs, which are for 2021-22, there is also a vote on account. This vote on account provides authority for departments to spend in the first few months of 2022-23. The vote on account does not represent the setting of a 2022-23 budget, which can only do be done by the executive. The amount for each department in the vote on account is set at approximately 45% of the 2021-22 provision. It is designed to ensure that departments can continue to deliver services until the main estimates and budget number two bill, which will be based on the final budget, are presented to the executive uh, at the assembly. The bill is normally brought to the Assembly in June. Last concord, on behalf of the Executive, I request and recommend that the levels of supply set out in these two resolutions under section 63 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998. I request the support of members for the resolution for 2021-22 and also the resolution for the vote on account to allow services to continue to be funded into the first few months of 2022-23. And I beg to move. I call Steve Aiken, the Chair of the Finance Committee. Okay, thank you very much indeed, and thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. On behalf of the Finance Committee, I would like to thank the Minister for his opening remarks on the supply resolutions relating to the spring supplementary estimates and the vote on account. The Minister's officials have kindly provided written and oral explanations at a number of Finance Committee meetings, and if the Minister could pass on his thanks to those officials, that would be very much appreciated by the Committee. Officials have also provided copies of the estimates memorandum for all of the departments and some other bodies. The committee was, very, was both pleased and pleasantly surprised to receive these. To be sure, further work is needed in order to optimise their content. Notwithstanding this, this is a very positive development in terms of improving the Assembly's scrutiny of the estimates. A number of other statutory committees have indicated as much. 
in their helpful recent submissions to the Finance Committee. Members look forward to further iterations of the memoranda in the next mandate and to all other departments, emulating the Department of Finance by sharing these documents with the statutory committees in a timely fashion. Mr Deputy Speaker, the supply resolutions are the founding resolutions for the Budget Bill 2022 and are part of the process of providing legal authority for the executive spending since the passage of the Budget No. 2 Bill in 2021. The Finance Committee wondered, in the absence of an executive at this critical time in the Budget Bill process, if the legislation would be moved and these debates would indeed take place. Officials clarified that in the terms of the related legislation, executive sign-off is not actually required. Thus, it is understood that, subject to the Assembly's approval, the Supply Resolution and Budget Bill will pass. This means, thankfully, the collapse of the executive will have no adverse impact on the public sector pay run at the end of March. However, Mr Deputy Speaker, there are still questions that need, may need to be resolved in terms of departmental, departmental spending for the rest of 2021-2022 and during the vote on account period. I am referring firstly to the outcome of the January monitoring and the surprisingly high level of unspent resource and capital Dell coupled with some last-minute and very substantial Barnett consequentials. Officials have helpfully clarified that perhaps around $300 million, including the council tax and electricity consequentials, can be carried into next year. However, the position in respect to, of other underspent resource Dell is less clear. Perhaps in his wine, the Minister might provide an update on the additional finance allocations which he mentioned in his previous statement last week and alluded to earlier on in his remarks. Mr Deputy Speaker, dealing with spending in 21-22, more generally, this has been characterised by the exchange of substantial amounts of money for all of the monitoring rounds. Each of these allocations exceeded £150 million. the total change in resource Dell being over £800 million since the main estimates. Both the bids and the reduced requirements were often quite significant, and in the case of the latter, this continued surprisingly until the final monitoring round. All of this is quite unusual and is one of the many unwelcome products of the pandemic. To be fair to the Department, this all presented a significant challenge with a number of new, novel and untried schemes coming to the fore and sometimes driving these large underspends. There were also errors with some ultra-virus payments being made, by L made for LRSS and frauds which are being investigated, and indeed good faith write-offs for other schemes. Indeed, as the Assembly is aware, the Controller and Auditor General has qualified his opinion on certain COVID support scheme matters. Notwithstanding the above problems, the overall strategic financial position prior to the collapse of the Executive was difficult, but seemed to be reasonably sound. Support was going to hard-pressed businesses, and the executive's coffers appear to be heading towards being appropriately depleted as we approached year-end. A very welcome, if quite unexpected, spanner in the works was the additional £250 million of late consequentials. It is hoped that the Minister can assure us that all is well and its department will indeed be able to land all of the unspent resources before the end of the financial year. Mr Deputy Speaker, I also want to take a moment to mention the vote on account. The Committee is more than a little concerned about the £400 million of additional money generated by the increase in all of our national insurance contributions. It would seem that the Department of Health, for which the money is earmarked for waiting list reductions, may not be able to access this accruing resource in 22-23, as it can't be included in the vote of account. Even though we have already heard that £300 million for the council tax and power consequentials can, this appears to be more than just an anomaly. And maybe the Minister could talk about the legal advice that he's had specifically on this issue. And indeed, perhaps the Minister will clarify the position as to whether an executive must be in place in order to access this £400 million plus the £300 million left over from 21-22. Mr Deputy Speaker, turning now to capital, we began this financial year quite ambitiously with a lot of planned conventional capital 
RRI borrowing and financial transaction capital spending. However, throughout the year, we have seen RRI dropping, and then quite surprisingly in January, we had substantial capital reduced requirements. The Minister redirected current FTC at January monitoring to meet future repayment costs. RRI was also reduced and replaced by conventional capital spending. Again, Minister, in your wine, can you confirm that he believes the final capital position, what the ca final capital position will be, and whether any monies will have to be returned to Westminster? And I understand from what we've heard in questions earlier on today, Minister, you indicated that was not the case, but if you could confirm that, that would be quite useful. Mr Deputy Speaker, perhaps also the Minister might comment on how the in-year capital underspends happened. Additionally, could I ask him to comment on the end-of-year capital surges, which, according to the Department's own figures, will see 55% of capital spending happening in the last three months of the this financial year. That's 55% of all our capital spending. Would the Minister agree that this may not be the best approach and might be part of the perennial reason why departments seem to be struggling to spend their capital budgets? Mr Deputy Speaker, statutory committees have kindly provided some commentary on the 21-22 capital and resource spending to the Finance Committee. I anticipate some of these chairpersons, and I hope they will, will eloquently speak to these issues today and tomorrow. In anticipation of this, I will conclude my contribution to this debate as chairperson for the Committee of Finance. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I guess I share him, Sir Kiva Archibald, Kaiherlach, and Kushti, if we curse the the Chair of the Economy Committee. Um, Gurma, good last time, Cordia. Um, and I'm not going to go on at length today as I have further remarks to make tomorrow in the budget debate. But the past year has continued to be a difficult time for many families and businesses. The Department for the Economy was allocated £246 million to fund economic recovery activities, and members will be most familiar with the High Street Voucher Scheme as part of that. In December, when the Finance Minister asked departments to look at their budgets to try to identify any money that could be freed up to bring um, forward the Energy Support Scheme, in response, DFE relinquished £40 million, £30 million of that which was from the Economic Recovery Funding. We were told this was possible because the economy was in a better place than expected, and certainly I'm glad that the money could be made available to the Energy Support Scheme. However, that was before the restrictions as a result of Omicron came about. And I, and I'm sure other members, were contacted by businesses in different sectors who faced difficult circumstances due to those restrictions. However, despite representations, the Department for the Economy did not bid for any additional money in the January monitoring rounds to provide support, despite money being available. The travel sector, for example, which was first hit and is a long way still from recovery. The beauty sector is another that continues to struggle and to make representations. And while the Finance Minister brought forward the Omicron business support scheme for hospitality, hotels, soft play businesses, nothing has come forward from the Economy Minister. Obviously, as a result of the DUP walking out of their executive, there is $300 million of funding that can't be allocated. So as I understand no additional funding could be allocated at this stage for these businesses, even if the economy minister was to decide to support them, although, of course, he does have discretion over his own budget for, um, for economic recovery. But perhaps the, the minister could clarify the situation in relation to any allocations that can still be made at this stage. Obviously, the finance minister announced last week that the draft budget consultation is being paused. However, we were concerned by what was being presented by DEFE to us in committee. The loss of EU funding will particularly hit the Department for Economy because despite uh, a 50 million uplift over the course of the next three years, there is going to be 100 million of loss of EU funding and the so-called replacement fund, the Shared Prosperity Fund, remains elusive. We are no further forward in terms of any clarity around its administration or purpose. The Economy Committee was presented with model savings that would particularly hit skills and business support, obviously entirely counterintuitive to driving forward economic recovery. We are also now in a situation where um, European Social Fund projects, which were extended for a year last year as a result of the Finance Minister being able to allocate COVID funding, have been told that the Department for Economy will not be providing the additional 35 per cent match funding that it would have done in previous years. And although the Economy Minister earlier today said he wanted to support those projects, 
So I would ask the Finance Minister if he could update us on the latest position regarding whether or not the Economy Minister has signalled that he will take him up on the proposed solutions that were outlined to him last week, on which, of course, the Communities Minister confirmed she would and is providing £1.5 million of match funding to the projects funded by her department. It must be stressed again that these projects employ 1,700 people across the north and support 17,000 people in gaining skills and employability programmes, including some of our most vulnerable citizens, those with disabilities and those furthest from work. Those working in these projects are skilled community workers and they are being put on protective notice, which is incredibly stressful. And of course, if they are at risk of losing their current position, they will be seeking other work, meaning their skills could be lost to the organisations that they are currently with. So I would urge the Economy Minister to clarify his position and his comments early today, and, and obviously I will be writing to him on that as well. Concordia, we know also that at this stage we are facing a cost of living crisis with families struggling to make ends meet and businesses struggling with increased costs. Inflation is at its highest level in years and energy prices in particular are really impacting. To date, the interventions from the British Government have been inadequate. What amounts to a loan uh, in reduction of energy bills in Britain and no meaningful intervention in terms of living costs. I know the Finance Minister has made representation to the British Treasury regarding the removal of VAT on energy bills which would immediately cut household bills by 5%. So perhaps he could update us on that, whether there's anything looking likely to happen in respect of that. I, along with other parties, have called for a windfall tax in some of the biggest companies who are actually benefiting from rising energy prices to be directed towards fuel poverty interventions. The reality is that before these energy price hikes, we here in the North had the highest rates of fuel poverty. And that's likely to have risen considerably. We need to see meaningful action, and it does have to come from British government level. Because, of course, there's also the planned national insurance increase coming down the track. And despite the cost of living crisis, it seems the British government is intent in ploughing on with that. And obviously, that will hit lower paid workers and small businesses. And I and others have urged the British Chancellor to rethink that move. We are often left to deal with the consequences of bad decisions or inaction in Westminster, and despite that, our ministers here are making a meaningful in interventions, whether it's Deirdre Hartley putting in place supports for families with energy costs and ensuring workers in community and voluntary sector have proper paying conditions, or whether it's the finance minister supporting businesses through the restrictions and ensuring that procurement rules support local businesses. These are all measures that highlight that the best people to be taking decisions on behalf of the people here are the people on this island. And surely it would be so much easier if we had the powers of a sovereign government and the ability to plan our public services and economic development for ourselves. Gormovid. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And as a member of the DEER Committee, I want to use this opportunity to comment on the issues most pertinent uh, to agri -food, the agri-food industry and the environment at this time. It has been another challenging year for the, this assembly and indeed the agriculture in Northern Ireland. The pandemic has uh, continued to have an effect, and whilst at this time the signs are encouraging in terms of listening, lessening in severity uh, of COVID-19, we can continue to hope and pray that the virus will continue to weaken in order to allow some level of normality to return. Removal of restrictions is certainly a good start and a welcome signal that normal life is resuming across all sectors. Despite the immense pressures the virus brought to bear on many areas of life in Northern Ireland, it is very clear that those many thousands of people who are employed directly in the agri-food industry have continued to provide the most vital service to ensure that all links to the supply chain continue to function from fork to farm to fork. This has been the case from the outset of the pandemic. When many areas of life locked down, our agri-food se sector stepped up in gear and met an increased need, and I pay tribute to them. It's not surprising that pressures and resources across departments have risen significantly, and this has been for a multitude of reasons, and most notably the various support schemes enacted to offset the impacts of co the COVID restrictions. From the farming and industry's perspective, various sectors have been under pressure, not least of all, our pig sector in recent times has been under significant uh, squeeze on their margins. I welcome the fact that some attention has been given by the Minister to various sectors within our agri food industry due to the pressures of COVID, and I indeed urge him to continue to look at ways to support the pig sector at this time. 
While the pressures have been brought to bear on the wider agri-food industry, not least the spectre of continued rising energy prices and general input costs across the production sectors. These are concerning times, and it is most important that this House recognises the pressures being applied in terms of energy and inputs. Security of food supply is vital for any society, and Northern Ireland is no different. The fact that the Treasury has stated that the rebate, rebate on red diesel fuel will be ending in April for most, issues, for most uses, with the exception of agriculture, is a concern. And I know that many industries have spoken their concerns and the impact this will have on their operations. Increasing costs will have to be passed on to the consumer. I re re reiterate my call to the Treasury to consider the change, this change, especially in the current economic climate. I would urge our ministers to redouble efforts around this issue. It will not be lost on the farming public in that the recent weeks Against all scientific and reason, reasoned advice, this Assembly voted to catastrophically impact most severely and heavily on our agri-food industry uh, with a decision to allow a path to net zero by 2050. This, uh, this decision, is, if carried through, will have a profound and long-lasting negative impacts on the finances available to each and every department, given the costs associated with such a move. It will also have a massive impact on the wider society and every sector of business, and yet such a vote was taken despite the reality of this being fully explained to the other parties in this chamber. Whilst the impact of climate change deserves detailed attention, the measures and legislation created and implemented cannot be allowed to damage our agri-food industry or create a situation where the massive gaps that will be left in our ability to produce food for our consumers is then filled by cheap imports from countries with woeful records and emissions. I beg his belief that this Assembly, despite the strongest of objections raised by the UK Climate Change Committee economists, farming representative bodies, indeed the farming public rejected those concerns, indeed the farming public actually rejected those concerns and opted for a massively over ambitious target. In terms of the finances available to our executive, the vote taken for next year by 2050 is if carried through would re require a massive budget to deliver indeed a significant portion of finance direct directed solely at agriculture. This is a huge financial mountain and this has been placed this has been placed in front of this assembly and it is very clear that the resources required are not available. It is therefore most vital that this issue is revisited and the changes made to the DERA climate change bill through the recent vote or reconsidered and the more reasonable approach of 82% by 2050 is re-established. Our farmers depend on us. Thank you. I guess next year I'm Sir Matthew O'Toole on Kansha, and I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I'm going to keep my remarks today on the um, uh, vote and account and supply resolutions fairly brief because we will have, as we do uh, when we uh, debate these things, the chance to do it all again in 24 hours' time, much to the uh, delight of the Finance Minister uh, and whoever is in the chair and gets to sit through people regurgitating the same remarks uh, um, again and again. It hasn't, thank you, for the committee chair. As, um, I'm tempted, back at you, I'm tempted to say um, uh, to the committee chair. Um, Mr. Uh, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, uh, uh, just on the, on the vote and account and uh, supply resolution, clearly this is a necessary and technical uh, measure in order to authorise spending. But I think one thing I do want to say, and I will keep my remarks brief, is to reflect on where we are today and indeed tomorrow. We are going to have uh, voluminous statements from uh, politicians standing up and talking about the priorities, and those are urgent, and there are a whole range of priorities that we face that are particularly uh, acute. We all know the ones that are top of mind at the minute. The health, health service, which has the worst waiting lists, not just in these islands, but in, in, uh, in among the worst in the developed world, uh, an education system which isn't delivering for people properly, um, too many young people leaving here, uh, an, an economy department which is buckling under the pressure of uh, lost EU funding. Uh, but not um, with a strategic plan to take advantage of our new dual market access opportunities and deal with the productivity crisis that we faced in this region for far too long, um, the crisis in our water infrastructure and a whole range of other priorities. But one of the most vital points to make is that uh, in authorising this spending, we are doing so yet again in the absence of a strategic three-year 
budget. Now, there were significant concerns that I and my party had with the Finance Minister's draft budget, but the truth is that the walkout by the DUP will make it impossible for us to produce a three-year budget. So what we are debating today is simply authorising spending to continue, as it were. We are authorising departments to keep going, civil servants to keep uh, the engine running, as it were. We're, We've sort of abandoned the car and we've just said, effectively, the civil servants are in the car, leave the engine on, keep the car in neutral, and we'll just sort of see what happens. Uh, And hopefully we'll come back and put it back into gear when we can agree to later on. That's a huge abdication of responsibility. So people standing up and saying there needs to be this strategic priority or that strategic priority, money needs to to be spent here, there and everywhere on a longer term, unless they're talking about just the absolute immediacy of of continuing spending that has already been allocated or making small, uncontroversial allocations here or there. Particularly, I'm afraid, if they're doing so from the DUP benches, there is a degree of disingenuousness because this is just legal authorisation of um, of spending, and, and, and in this instance, actually, technically, what we're doing is authorising the, lim- the expenditure limits set out in the supply estimates. Um, we have lost the opportunity for now to, de- to, to deliver a strategic three-year budget. Um, that is the three-year budget in which we could guarantee, for example, police numbers over the next three years, or uh, deliver a proper plan from the health department to get waiting lists down. Although it is worth noting, though I am and my party are very supportive of health being prioritised in this budget, we would also like to see a more detailed plan from the health department about how that extra resource is going to be matched to a plan with targets, both short and medium term, to actually get elective waiting lists down, rather than simply um, being used to um, to continue to, uh, to 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 fund the, the pressures on the health service. We want to understand how it's going to be matched to targets. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think it's important to make clear that all we are debating today is the continued authorisation of spending. So, people standing up and saying they want greater prioritisation in the long term for X, Y or Z, uh, I'm afraid, uh, unfortunately, we can't do that because we, don't, we can't deliver a multi-year budget with properly strategic uh, priorities. And I do think it's worth going back to, where, to the very first supply resolution that I debated in 2020, a couple of years ago, when we, when we came back. And, and I think from memory what we were doing there is the slightly surreal thing of authorising spending that had already happened. That's even more bizarre than what we're doing today. We were authorising st- money that had already been spent. We were effectively retrospectively saying that money was spent on the health service and schools and roads wasn't illegal. Um, and we all know that for three years between 2017 and 2020, um, we didn't have institutions in Westminster in a very piecemeal and uh, um, technical way would ke- kept spending running over. It is worth acknowledging and saying that that was because obviously Sinn Féin walked out of government in 2017. That was wrong then and it's wrong now to, uh, to walk away from government. So there is a very important point about taking responsibility. We can't stand up here today and make out to people, people who are putting this up on social media. Or we're, we're, we, we can't call for uh, strategy in relation to spending um, uh, when, when we're not taking our responsibility in terms of um, in, in terms of making these institutions work and delivering a three-year budget. Um, uh, there are a couple of specific things I want to ask. I will be delivering more comprehensive remarks tomorrow in the round, um, but I did want to ask the, the Finance Minister specifically about the budget exchange scheme. There was a degree of um, uncertainty earlier on in finance questions when he talked about um, the lack of certainty about the budget exchange scheme in the it, it, so is he he's, we've talked about the 300 million but it would be helpful to know if there's any if he believes that the um, uh, the lack of an executive jeopardizes the budget exchange scheme the ability to roll over any current what is current underspend we're currently within expenditure limits in terms of underspend it would be helpful to know if the lack of a, an executive uh, will um, will uh, create any problems in terms of rolling it over. Uh, and then my final point, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, today, as I said, I will save most of my remarks for tomorrow. We will obviously be supporting the resolution today. Is really around uh, the strategic piece. This is something that I talk about every time we have these, um, uh, we have these uh, moments. Um, one thing I will commend the Minister on is, sincerely, is that uh, since we reconvened in 2020, we now have two institutions, one hopefully permanent, the other one uh, temporary, the Fiscal Council and the Fiscal Commission. One will be a standing fiscal advisory body to, um, uh, to advise um, 
specifically the finance minister, but the executive in general, on the sustainability of their spending plans, on how they are doing in terms of um, uh, uh, in, in terms of um, in terms of pub the public finances and fiscal sustainability more generally, but also a fiscal commission which is going to advise on the potential for new fiscal powers, but also how we use the powers that we have at the minute and the broad. And, and they've already delivered an interim report and are working on a final report that hopefully is going to come out in the months uh, to come. One thing that has emerged from uh, the utterances thus far of both of those organisations um, is. I ask the member to draw his remarks to a close, please. Yes, indeed I will. Is that we need much more strategy. Uh, much more strategy going forward. Uh, we heard that from the Fiscal Commission in relation to the multi-year budget. So um, uh, I'll close my remarks there, Mr Deputy Speaker, and uh, look forward to, to boring people even more tomorrow on the budget bill. Thank you. I now call uh, Chris Little, the Chair of the Education Committee. <coughs> Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I welcome the opportunity to speak to the Spring Supplementary Estimates and Supply Resolution as Chairperson of the Education Committee. Deputy Speaker, at January monitoring, the De Department of Education bid for £20.9 million of pressures to the Department of Finance. That consisted of £18.3 million for special educational need pressures arising from special educational needs in mainstream schools, special schools, pupil support and special educational needs in, in transport pressures, £2.4 million for the voluntary exit scheme costs. In addition to these pressures, the Department of Education required funding of £22.5 million for COVID-19 related pressures at January monitoring. While the Education Department welcomed the additional funding allocations in the draft budget, it indicated to the Education Committee that the proposed additional funding allocation was wholly insufficient to address the significant pressures that face the education sector. When the Department of Education officials briefed the Education Committee, they emphasised that the education sector faces significant financial pressure and rising service demands associated with delivering statutory and policy obligations, that without substantial additional funding, the budget position would continue to be extremely challenging. Department of Education officials also stated that without additional and adequate funding, it would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, for the Education Department to take actions on the Northern Ireland recovery, COVID recovery plan, the implementation of the Special Educational Needs and Disability Act 2016, the continued implementation of the Fair Start Action Plan arising from the Expert Panel on Educational Underachievement, future teachers' pay settlements and any recommendations that come from the Independent Review of Education. I note also the ongoing absence of a childcare strategy and budget. Special schools have also seen their numbers increase by a staggering 20 per cent in about five years. This has led to increase in costs with the Education Authority's special educational needs expenditure about, by about 52 per cent since 2015 to 16. In mainstream schools, the demand for special educational needs support both for non-statemented and statemented pupils, has increased in similar proportions in the same time. The Education Committee holds special educational needs as a particular priority, and will hear from the Education Authority shortly to assess progress on special educational needs support. Happy to give way, yes. In the course of uh, the Public Accounts Committee hearings, we have discovered that in some post-primary schools there can be up to four classroom assistants standing at the back of the classrooms, not actually engaging, but there in case they are needed. Yet some schools have been granted flexibility to make much better use of that money and are already producing much better outcomes for those pupils. Does it agree that we have to maximise the use and give flexibility to your principals so that they can help those children who, who need additional assistance? Thank the member for his intervention. And yes, I think the Public Accounts Committee report has demonstrated a clear need for more efficient and targeted approach on special educational needs. Um, the Education Committee also heard that over £2 million is being invested 
in ventilation works, the provision of CO2 monitors, window replacements and air filtration units. This is welcome, but there is little detail in relation to the implementation of that expenditure. And the Education Committee has engaged significantly with the Department of Education and the Education Authority on urgently implementing this work, promoting it and stimulating uptake to enhance COVID safety in schools. We will also shortly hear from the Royal Institution for Chartered Surveyors on what constitutes a best practice approach on this matter. Another portion of the resource demand comes from school deficits, with stakeholders raising concern in relation to inadequacies of the present funding environment that have resulted in many schools being unable to operate effectively and many operating in deficit. As I mentioned previously, the Public Accounts Committee report closing the gap points to a need for the Education Department to complete its review of free school meals and exercise more control on funds provided for targeting social need. Despite providing £913 million of targeting social need funding since 2005, the Education Department does not appear to have data to clearly demonstrate this funding is improving performance of pupils with free school meals. The balance between school autonomy and the Department for Education's value for money oversight is crucial moving forward. If we also consider other inescapable costs associated with teachers' pay, it is clear that the very substantial extra sums needed in education will be challenging. The Education Committee has worked hard to monitor in-year allocations, while aware of the system's over-reliance on this process, and greeted news of a three-year budget with great relief that financial planning might finally be less short-term and more transparent for schools. But as has been mentioned previously, it is unconscionable that this opportunity for multi-year budgets for schools has been placed in jeopardy by the resignation of the First Minister. The Education Committee has had regular and for informative briefings on monitoring rounds, and the SSE memorandum certainly cannot be said to represent any granularity in respect of the estimates. Deputy Speaker, in order to address the multi-million pound budget pressures, significant reform will be required. The Committee does not underestimate the task of the independent review of education in somehow rationalising a system which has been in crisis for far too long but it will be urgently needed uh, to meet that challenge. Thank you. I now call Colin Gildenew, the Chair of the Health Committee. Agat, last can call you. Um, I welcome the opportunity <clears throat> to participate in today's debate as Chair of the Health Committee and then to make some brief remarks as Sinn Féin's health spokesperson. I think we should, from the outset, uh, acknowledge that once again this has been a difficult and a very challenging year for our health service. COVID has continued to wreak havoc on departmental and trust spending plans and a number of important priorities have been pushed back as the department continues to deal with the pandemic. Throughout the financial year we have seen a number of COVID related allocations to the department to deal with issues including track and trace, testing and vaccination. These allocations have been welcome and much needed and have helped the Department and Executive to provide a map out of the pandemic and to get closer to a return to normality. However, as we all know, members, the health service, and as far as the health service goes, we cannot accept a return to normality because normality has become increasing waiting lists, overcrowded emergency rooms, and people having to wait longer to get the diagnosis and treatment that they so badly require. The previous committee in 2016 heard evidence that without adequate investment in transformation, hospital waiting lists would rise and GP practices would close. Members will all know that this is what's happening as we speak. As a committee, we have heard of the great work of the multidisciplinary teams in GP surgeries and the real benefits that they bring to patients and to communities. However, this year we saw no increase in the rollout of MDTs, with funding allocated on a standstill basis only. We know that it can be done, and we know how it can be done, and indeed we have cross-party agreement on the roadmap, 
including the rollout of multidisciplinary teams with investment in primary and community care, as advised by countless reports over the years. Moreover, we know that investment will be repaid with early intervention, health promotion and prevention, easing pressure on acute care over the longer term. However, Concordia, we need to acknowledge the risk that without sufficient funding, transformation becomes much more difficult. The committee was briefed on the issue of transformation just last week, and we see the transformation agenda as being key to addressing waiting lists and providing the best levels of cure here across the north. The Department needs to place transformation at the core of all budget and department needs to consider how funding can be directed and allocated into transforming our health service. An example is seen in the continued and indeed the, gro the growing reliance on locum and agency staff. The latest indications are the co total cost of locum and agency spend is close to 300 million for this year. This cost has increased fourfold since 2014-15 and could clearly go some way towards achieving transformation if workforce planning, recruitment and retention issues can be addressed. Throughout this past two years, I have taken the opportunity in budget debates to outline the difficulties that the committee continue to experience in identifying spend across various streams. We cannot look at the papers supplied and identify, for example, how much it is proposed we spend on mental health, how much on cancer or the split between primary and acute care. Nor can we track the investment nor outcomes in relation to addressing the continuing health inequalities which we see across our population. We have struggled to get clarity on total spend and following budget briefings we have written to the Department to ask for further detail. The Department we believe need to undertake further work and progress towards transparency and accessibility in our budgetary processes. Throughout the past two years, we have been advised by the Department that a multi-year budget is required to provide some surety and allow planning to tackle some of the key issues inherent within our health and social care system. While the time in this mandate is coming to an end, I am sure that any incoming committee will be closely looking at the Department's budgetary planning to ensure the Department delivers the transformation that is needed to ensure better health outcomes for everyone in our community. I would like to say a few words now, Deputy Cornelia, as a Sinn Féin MLA. The Health Minister has already set out a number of strategies for improving health outcomes, and it is proposed that, that, proposed that his bids for the elective care, cancer and mental health rebuild strategies are met in full, providing £120.9 million, £182.4 million and £255.3 million over the budget period, a total budget allocation of £1.9 billion. That, members, is recurrent funding over three years, which would allow planning on workforce rebuild and cancer and other services. But this has all been put at risk as a result of the resignation of the First Minister. The health and well-being of our constituents and communities cannot be held hostage to the political difficulties that one party have created for themselves. We need the recurrent funding that Conor Murphy proposed so that we can begin to tackle those waiting lists rebuild a health and social care workforce that are well paid and well respected and to transform the health and social care so that it better meets the needs of our constituents. I will. Yeah, member for Gilman, I do appreciate his concern. Maybe just clarify for me, where was the same concern for his own party for, for three years, not for three weeks? He brought this place to its knees. No assembly, no executive. Maybe he could explain the difference. Member will have an extra minute. Well, if the member is suggesting that the DUP are on some kind of a copycat strategy, uh, I think that's very ill-considered. We are dealing with a public health pandemic. We are not dealing with a situation where this Assembly were presiding over a scheme that was potentially going to bleed millions of pounds over periods of years. So you are comparing apples with pears, frankly, and I, I don't think it adds to the debate in that sense. So we need to see the increased budget proposed by Conor Murphy to address the needs of those patients out there in our community that are waiting so anxiously for their treatment, for cancer, for cardiac care, for orthopaedics and all the other procedures that are so badly needed. We needed to deal with the 358,000 people who are waiting to see a consultant for the first time. We needed to deal with the 116,000 people who are waiting for their first hospital or surgery appointment. 
and we needed to deal with the 147,000 people who are waiting for a diagnostic test. Those needs cannot be cast aside by one party continuing to deal with the political difficulties of their own making. Cormier, I can call you. And I call Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I rise to speak as a DUP member of the Health Committee. Mr Deputy Speaker, these are undoubtedly unprecedented times in the provision of health care in Northern Ireland. The sums of money poured into protecting our people against COVID-19 has been without parallel. And it's worth mentioning, Mr Deputy Speaker, that when we take together resource spend and other things like national insurance spend, projected expenditure for this year exceeds £30 billion. This is a huge amount and once more underlines the scale and importance of financial support provided from the Treasury as part of the United Kingdom. We are certainly in an economic climate where every pound must be made to count. In this context, it is very welcome that we have the ability to carry forward funding under the exchange scheme up to £104 million pounds in for resource expenditure. It is crucial that we explore all routes with the Treasury to maximise flexibility in remaining funds um, that can be carried across to next year. In terms of flexibility, we also need to explore innovative ways of reallocating any amounts that are returned to the centre before the end of the financial year in the absence of executive agreement. There is substantial headroom included in these estimates to enable the executive to make further last-minute allocations. And perhaps the minister could expand on the options um, his officials are exploring to be in a position to make such allocations in the absence of executive agreement and how any process would respect the need for fairness and avoid the type of divisive attitudes threatened by the community's minister toward the sub-regional stadia. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Department of Health has been a significant beneficiary of additional funding from monitoring rounds and that money has been key to addressing immediate pressures, both COVID-related and non-COVID related. However, we do need to go beyond the sticking plaster solutions and it is now high time that we pursued the reform of our health system that is so desperately needed. I listened last week to the Finance Minister and others talk about waiting lists and how somehow the decision that my party leader took to withdraw the First Minister was to blame for our waiting list crisis. Mr Deputy Speaker, our waiting lists have been in crisis for years. The Finance Minister and his colleagues stood dressed in costumes and engaging in pantomime politics on the border for three years while our waiting lists grew longer and longer. Meanwhile, it is this party that secured tens of millions of pounds for our health service and to address waiting lists. We will take no lectures from the party opposite, Mr Deputy Speaker. As I look back on my comments in this House last year on the 7th of June on the supply resolution for Northern Ireland main estimates 21 to 22, one aspect of my comments struck me and it was in relation to the party leaders forum meeting in relation to waiting lists that was to be held the following week. Mr Deputy Speaker, I would dare to say that this meeting produced very little. The statistics in relation to waiting lists would back this up. Mr Deputy Speaker, where is the plan? Some parties particularly the party opposite, claim that the three-year draft budget put forward by the Finance Minister will address our waiting list backlog. Yet, Mr Deputy Speaker, even with the proposed increase in the health budget, it came with absolutely no plan whatsoever to back up the cash. If we were to address waiting lists, address issues like domiciliary care, investment in services and staff, then surely we need a plan first and then to cost the plan. That would deliver the best outcomes, the most efficient outcomes for everyone. We know the party opposite specialises in fantasy economics and political pipe dreams. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, this issue needs taken forward in a structured, coherent way that delivers maximum impact. We have previously argued that the budget process should start between April to June for the next financial year, with the draft budget being consulted upon in the autumn, allowing a full debate for the turn of the year. This would afford greater detailed scrutiny in advance and potentially better align with the more normal siting of the election or formation of an executive in May-June time. The proper process for agreeing a three-year budget should be after a programme for government has been agreed, not in the dying days of a current mandate. Strategy and spending must be a cohesive force, not the back of a cigarette packet, get out the door strategy we see from Sinn Féin. Mr Deputy Speaker, post-election it is our hope that an incoming executive can be formed and that plans put um, in first and then money 
towards that plan. Of course, such an outcome will depend on whether the cross-community consensus needed to sustain this place is established. And in that regard, the ball is very, very firmly in the court of the government and the European Union. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Agus Nishiram, Sir Declan McAleer, Shin Kairalak, and Krista Talvia, Templeak, Agus Kohitu. That's Declan McAleer, the chair of the ERA Committee. Thank you, Las Kankoya. Welcome the opportunity to speak today on behalf of the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs in respect of the spring supplementary estimates. The Department, the DERA, has a wide ranging remit encompassing uh, support for food and farming, protection of the natural environment, and development of rural communities. Its budget is therefore used to deliver diversity of schemes and projects which help to maintain key industries, support animal, plant, and environmental health, improve the health and well being of people living in rural areas. Just under £316 million was used to make direct payments to farmers in 2021-2022, which comprises the vast majority of the DERA revenue budget. This is an essential aspect of expenditure as local farmers fundamentally rely on direct payments to make ends meet. Direct payments comprised 92 per cent of net farm business income in 2020. Other substantial developments of DERA's revenue uh, spend include staffing costs, which incurred approximately £144 million this financial year. The bovine TB, TB, TB control programme is expected to run to around £38 million by the end of March, of which £26 million will be used to pay compensation to farmers whose herd, herds have been affected by a disease. The Department advised the Committee on the 20th of January that it is expected to incur its full budgetary allocation of £18.8 million revenue funding by the end of financial year in respect of measures to support EU exit, mostly associated with the need to recruit additional staff. The Department was successful in securing additional revenue through the October, October and January mounting rounds, including £1.4 million to support inescapable ITCT pressures and £4 million to facilitate compensation payments to owners of flocks which have been affected by the ongoing outbreak of avian influenza. There was a negligible, negligible 0.2 decrease in the Department's resource, DEL, in the spring supplementary estimate compared to 21-22 main estimates. In terms of capital expenditure, the Department spent approximately £30 million this year on research and development activities at the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute, which the committee supports in order to help develop an evidence base for key projects that will be introduced in the years ahead to improve carbon sequestration and optimisation of productive livestock genetics. A further £19 million was expanded in digital transformation activities, included in the development of the rollout of the new IT systems, including the NA Farm Information and Information System. Uh, otherwise known as NAFIS. The Department transferred a total of £14 million in year capital funding to the Department for Communities and Department for the Economy in order to support the, the COVID-19 Small uh, Settlement Recovery Scheme and Project Stratum, respectively. The Committee welcomed these transfers in order to support local businesses to recover from the pandemic and to accelerate the rollout of high-speed broadband to citizens in rural areas. We have the Committee concerned about the significant net reduced capital requirement of £7.5 million, which has been declared by the Department this financial year's year, and considers that there may be missed opportunities to reallocate these monies for alternative purposes, have better financial controls and oversight of planned capital activity initiatives been in place. These concerns have been communicated to the Department. Given the breadth of issues facing the Department, the Committee believes that there are numerous initiatives which would have benefited from additional capital funding, such as the expansion of the existing rural development programme schemes, provision of training grants, and consideration of short-term compensatory support to meet the processing sector. The Committee corresponded with the Minister urging him to consider options for using the declared capital uh, reduced requirement, and it is disappointing that it will not be possible to use this within the current financial year. In summary, the Committee considers that DERA's utilisation of its 2021-22 budget broadly reflects the statutory remit and has engaged usefully in allocation of capital money to support worthwhile initiatives in rural areas. However, the Committee believes that through more proactive and forward-looking financial management, the Department may have been in a position to use its declared capital reduced uh, requirement to support a broader number of uh, projects. It is imperative, given the period of flux that will likely manifest over the next several months, that the Department has some degree of certainty regarding its 2022-23 budget spend, and the Committee therefore supports passage of the vote. And uh, my, my colleague, uh, Philip McGuigan, will pick up on this from the party, the Sinn Féin perspective, during the budget debate tomorrow. Graham Hagen. Graham Hagen. I now call Mervyn Storey. 
Mr. Speaker, and I, or Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to speak as Chair of the Justice Committee in today's debate. Throughout the year, the uh, committee has scrutinised the Department of Justice budget through the regular briefings and updates, both oral and written. This is included in your monitoring rounds, bids for the COVID-19 funding, the forecasting performance. In addition, the Department provided briefings on its planning for the multi-year budget and the 22-25 draft budget, which the committee also had the opportunity to discuss with the Minister of Justice. In regards to the 21-22 spring supplementary estimates, in their oral evidence to the committee on uh, the June monitoring round, the departmental officials advised that the opening baseline for 21-22 left significant resource pressures of some 27.7 million, excluding COVID pressures. Recent reports in the press that the department returned somewhere in the region of 47 million to the Department of Finance were therefore of, gra of grave concern. On the 20th of January, however, the officials clarified that the 47 million referred not just to this financial year, but also to the previous year. In addition, 33 million of that was capital funding, and the majority of this underspend was due to delays caused by COVID. A significant proportion of the resource underspend related to COVID and was ring fenced and could not be used for any other purposes. The ring fenced resource funding uh, that was returned included over 1.6 million for the police ombudsman for historical investigations, which was for a specific purpose and could not be reallocated internally. These estimates arose, or these easements arose, due to a delay in the preparation of a business case, and consequently there has been slippage in the recruitment of staff, which will now be uh, pushed into uh, future years. The committee was also concerned to learn that the TBUC funding had been returned due to delays in a regeneration project on the Spring Martin Moyard interface in West Belfast. And the department advised, however, that the bids for the TBUC funding had been uh, oversubscribed each year, and the executive office uh, had confirmed that the easement declared had been uh, repurposed within other TBUC programmes. The officials advised that the Department endeavours to redistribute easements internally when possible to maximise the use of its budget. Over the last number of years, the legal aid baseline has been insufficient to meet demand and has therefore received internal reallocations through bids for legal aid, uh, though bids for legal aid have also had to be made at monitoring rounds. The bids for additional funding during the year uh, also included 5.7 for the PSNI in relation to the Northern Ireland Protocol, as only 9.8 of the funding to cover the cost of the 308 officers required had been allocated. Uh, 2 million was allocated at the June monitoring round, which was followed by an unsuccessful bid for the remainder at the October monitoring round. The committee was advised that a further bid would be made in January, although the January monitoring position appears to have been subsequently revised. The requirement to bid for this funding in year services uh, to highlight or serves to highlight the difficulty faced by the PSNI in planning and managing headcount. Funding for officers and support staff comes not only from the baseline but from a number of other funding streams which include non recurrent funding that often need to be supplemented uh, by in year uh, allocations. A further significant pressure arose late in the year for the PSNI relating to a legacy case which uh, a bid for £7.5 million was made at January monitoring. Although this bid was successful, the Department has previously uh, flagged up its concerns with regards to legacy, advising that it is not funded for such significant costs when they materialise and which will need to look to the centre for funding. This is far from ideal, and the position will need to be carefully considered uh, in the way forward on legacy is known. Let me turn, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, then, as uh, a few comments I want to make in relation to uh, this process uh, as uh, a member uh, of my own party and a spokesperson on justice. The concerns that I have outlined and have been prevalent in terms of how the PSNI are funded cannot continue to be ignored. Despite all the glossy documents, despite all the promises made by uh, governments in the past and by the executive, uh, would you believe it, through the document called NDNA, that document that is held up as though all of a sudden we have the milk and honey of the promised land. But it seems as though all it is, it's a piecemeal. You can just pick and choose whatever you want to do, and the rest you can ignore. Well, let me make it very clear. 
It is unsustainable for the PSNI to continue to be funded on the basis of what this process has given us and what the budget process will give us. And I'll give you the reason why. If you were to take simply what is the baseline for the PSNI in regards to how it can fund its officers, you would have 6,200 officers in the PSNI. Today we have just under 7,000 officers, and they are there simply because additional money, as I have outlined, has been made available, but that money is not included in the baseline. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, while many talk about their commitment to law and order and commitment to the peace process and commitment to keeping our streets safe and commitment to having uh, the police have all the resources that they need to tackle all the issues that this House debates in regards to various and very serious crimes. The sad reality is the PSNI are being left in, 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 in a, a, a totally intolerable situation. And I think it is something that the Finance Minister cannot continue to avoid. We have pressed the Justice Minister, and I have to say in fairness to the Justice Minister, she has been uh, listening to that issue, and she has endeavoured to bring forward uh, proposals that would be of help. But given that almost 70 per cent of the Justice budget is contained in the payments for and the delivery of the PSNI, it certainly is not an issue that the Justice Minister in and of herself can address. So, therefore, Mr Deputy Speaker, with those comments as Chair of the Justice Committee and also as a member of this House and a member of the DUP, I conclude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. 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 Thank I rise as Chair of the Committee for the Executive Office. I will keep my remarks brief, as I am conscious that the expenditure of the Executive Office is a, a very small part of the overall budget, departmental finances. Um, so uh, it is also very unusual, uh, as the recent trend has been that the Department has been required to manage some high-profile programmes at very sh short notice. The original bu budget was for £120.5 million for Resource Dell and £15.3 million capital. Roughly half of the Resource Dell was for the baseline funds and the other half for ring-fenced funds. These ring fence funds included requirements for payments for victims of the conflict and for historical institutional abuse, match funding for EU programmes and other EU related expenditure for managing the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. The spring supplementary estimates show a reduced requirement for resource Dell of some £32.6 million for a small budget that is actually a significant amount. This reduced requirement has been in areas of payment for victims and survivors of the conflict, payments for historical institutional abuse redress, urban villages, EU exit, peace for match funding, COVID management and the social investment fund. What might at first glance appear to be a startling inability to budget for and manage expenditure has in fact two main um, alternative uh, explanations. The first is the unpredictable nature of the administration of funds at short notice, such as for victims of the conflict and the hysteric, uh, historical institutional abuse. The second is the requirement for ministers to agree on certain matters where they may not see eye to eye on what money should be spent on. Certainly in the case of the former explanation, it makes sense to err on the side of caution to ensure that in any event the funding for people who have suffered due to the conflict or due to abuse is accessible and is available. The committee has been particularly engaged on this last point, having suffered abuse in what stands out as a shocking indictment of the historical uh, treatment of children and young people in our society. The very least we can do is to ensure the timely and effective victim-centred process for redress. This is the reason the committee called for a review of the redress process when victims and survivors of abuse told us that the process was not up to scratch. This is the reason we have worked with the Department to make 
sure that the same thing is not going to happen to, uh, for victims and survivors of the conflict. And this is the reason we have striven to lay the foundations of an appropriate process for victims and survivors of mother and baby homes when the time comes. The second related concern uh, for the committee has been the capacity of the department to form teams at short notice to implement programmes, whether that be to pay travel agents support due to the impacts of the pandemic, something that was right and proper but should not have rested with the TEO in the committee's view, or to ensure the promises um, of redress made to victims of abuse or the conflict uh, are, are honoured. While the committee has had nothing but praise for the individual officials who have come forward uh, before the committee, the recruitment of agency workers or secondments from the Strategic Investment Board are not a good use of money, as they are expensive and do little to invest in and grow the expertise and capacity within the civil service. Finally, the committee has been engaged on the issue of the Mays Lawn Cage site, which costs over a million pounds per annum to maintain but it is a huge potential for investment as a major regional, regional home. Um, it has been undermined by the disagreement on one part of the site, the prison itself. The committee has suggested that there are investments in infrastructure and elements of the site that could take place, but without agreement, that annual amount will continue to maintain a considerably underutilised site. In summary, the story of the Executive Office has been one of maintaining the regular work of the Department, and the committee uh, was pleased to hear that £12 million per annum shared future funding would continue while administering essential programmes that are difficult to produce or to quantify. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I call Roy Beggs. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I wish to concentrate my comments uh, on the Department of Infrastructure, uh, a department which I uh, scrutinise in particular through uh, my membership of the Infrastructure Committee. There are a number of quite significant changes uh, listed within the spring supplementary estimates from what the, the original figures that, that were uh, present there. Uh, and I, I just would, would like to go through some of them. Uh, now, in terms of uh, DVA, the Driver and Vehicle Agency, there was a, an additional £6.3 million that's been allocated in this spring supplementary estimate. That's almost a, an increase of a third. Um, now, that, that is actually understandable because the DVA were operating under a reduced capacity uh, uh, during the COVID period and therefore would have received uh, less income. But I am pleased that they are now working uh, at full capacity and indeed are working uh, with considerable overtime. Sadly, not enough overtime to meet the demand. Um, so my, my question to the Minister is, is going forward in the... Um, uh, they, they vote on account. I, I take it that there's unlikely to be any funds in there for future uh, uh, money to DVA, but hopefully it will not actually need it. We do need to bear in mind that whilst we have allocated money to this area, in the rest of the United Kingdom, uh, during that period, I'm not aware of additional money has been allocated. Garages continue to operate as normal, and MOTs and PSVs were provided by the private sector, uh, and I, again, I'm not aware of grants being, being paid there. Turning on to, to, to some, some other issues uh, of some quite uh, significant increase in funding, I see under railway services uh, an increase of some £47.5 million, pounds, and road passenger services uh, some £86 million. Pounds. Uh, now, in this area, public transport has been operating uh, with lower passenger levels uh, as a result of perhaps hybrid working or people working uh, from home full time or alternatively using alternative means of transport. And again, if we wished to ensure that uh, we provide it, public transport, whether it is our NHS workers getting to our hospitals or, or other facilities, uh, or indeed just to help the economy, we still had to provide those buses and trains, even though they uh, would not have been uh, as, as busy as they otherwise would have been. Uh, and certainly I agree 
that uh, it is something that had to be done. But again, going forward, it would be helpful if the Minister could indicate what funds might be available going forward to subsidise this area, because uh, I'm not aware of suddenly uh, uh, passenger numbers returning to how they were and what difficult choices we'll face, we will face if there is continuing uh, lower income levels in terms of transport. So there, so there is uh, a, a concern there and an issue that needs to address. One other figure that strikes me in these spring supplementary estimates, which would be useful to have an explanation, is under the heading of depreciation, depreciation and impairment costs. Now, the, the original figure was some £168 uh, million, pounds, but uh, the change in gro gross provision is some £25 million. Pounds. Now, that is a very, very significant change in uh, a, a figure under the, the heading of depreciation and impairment costs. And I believe we are uh, due an explanation as what has happened here, what has gone wrong, to ensure that going forward, uh, uh, we, we do not make the same mistake again, because that was money that would have been allocated to that heading, which was not needed to be drawn down and perhaps could have been uh, allocated earlier to some other heading. Another significant heading uh, in, that has changed in these spring supplementary estimates is under Northern Ireland Water, who have received an additional £15 million during, during this uh, publication. Um, and again, Northern Ireland Water uh, uh, have experienced uh, particular difficulties. There, there has been COVID where they would have had received uh, a smaller income, perhaps with uh, businesses using less water. But of recent days, the big pressure has been uh, coming from uh, cost of energy. And Northern Ireland Water, I understand, are Northern Ireland's largest electricity consumer. And as we all know, electricity has significantly increased. So it is, it is perfectly understandable and correct that the executive did allocate additional money because just before Christmas, they had to go through an exercise of what would they do if they could not make the January monitoring round. And it's, I hope the minister will be able to assure us that the vote on account uh, will enable Northern Ireland Water uh, to avoid such... Uh, emergency contingency planning uh, in the next financial year because uh, it is vital that we uh, continue to treat our sewage and even more important to provide fresh water to the Northern Ireland public. Um, so, so there is a pressure uh, issue going forward which, which uh, any budget should have uh, 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 addressed. Um, other areas that strike me as, as being uh, vital going forward uh, is on health. Everybody is aware of the difficulties uh, the health service has experienced, uh, elective surgery having, having to be uh, uh, slowed down or stopped entirely. And we had been uh, looking forward to, to a new budget with the additional funds that were coming from uh, the increases in national insurance which would have been, I, I would have hoped, largely gone to our health service. And again, I would have hoped that the health service would have benefited from some of the other um, additional Barnet formula monies that would have been coming to the Northern Ireland Executive. It is vital that we do address our waiting list, but even more importantly, that there is a larger uh, multi-year budget going forward so that the... Uh, I would uh, ask within, the member to draw his remarks to a close, please. So, so that... Proper planning and employment of new staff and new arrangements uh, so that we can transform our health care and provide a much better uh, service to our public. Thank you. I call Andrew Muir. Uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I'm very conscious uh, that what we're debating here today is the supply resolution for the Northern Ireland Spring Supplementary Estimates 2021 22 and also the vote on account. Tomorrow we'll do the second stage of the Budget Bill. 
Then on Tuesday, the 1st of March, we'll do the regional rates order for Northern Ireland 2022. Then on the 7th of March, we'll have a motion from the Committee of Finance on the Northern Ireland Fiscal Council reports and the 2022-25 draft budget. And then on the 8th of March, we'll have the final stage of the budget bill. And each of these debates are different in their uh, approach, and it's important we approach the, then today's uh, consideration in that context. What we're actually de dealing with here is about keeping the show on the road and also giving authority for spend uh, most recently incurred. And I do welcome the fact that this has been brought to the Assembly here today, and we've been able to do that. This stands in contrast to 2017, where there wasn't an ability to do that. So the fact that these, this motion has been brought for here today is to be welcomed. I would, however, say that the lack of a decision by the Executive on an overall budget as a result of the resignation of the First Minister and the inability of the Executive to meet does deliver real uncertainty for the people of Northern Ireland. There are many examples where our budget was agreed before the end of a previous mandate, so that does not hold water. This uh, Executive should have been able to meet and should have been able to sort out its differences and agree a budget, but unfortunately it can't meet because the DUP First Minister left. What we have here today is not just a sticking plaster, but instead is just one crutch for the public services desperately in need of proper support over the next three years, proper support to help people and communities across Northern Ireland recover and grow from the COVID-19 pandemic to the cost of living crisis and also in the face of climate emergency. What we have today is welcome, but it is not good enough. There is real lack of certainty for the health service over the time ahead, and we should have a three-year budget in order to enable the health service to recover and plan for the future. And I say that today in the context that a potential major incident has been declared in Antrim Area Hospital, but yet we do not have any budget for the next three years. That is not acceptable. We owe it to the health service, we owe it to the patients and the staff to have certainty in the finances for the future. Tomorrow I will talk about the wider issues uh, in the budget bill debate, but in terms of the matters at hand, I want to talk about a number of issues, some of which have already been talked about uh, thus far. One is in relation to justice and policing. Many aspects in the legislation has recently been passed in this Assembly, or is coming up, or has been previously passed by this Assembly, do need funded. There is also commitments within New Decade, New Approach, and it has been talked about that there has been a commitment there to police numbers of 7,500. We need, we need to be able to find the finances to, in order to keep our people safe and in order to be able to deliver policing and uh, justice uh, in, within Northern Ireland. In relation to infrastructure, I am very conscious that we are also dealing with the monitor round which was just uh, passed, and also that Northern Ireland Water and Translink receive funds within that monitoring round. I am particularly concerned in relation to the financial position of Northern Ireland Water. In light of increasing energy costs, they are affecting households across Northern Ireland, but also our public services. And recent events will also contribute to an increased pressures for Northern Ireland Water. They need to be able to have that certainty and not to be having to rely upon monitoring rounds. I am very conscious that £300 million, which could be used, will be sitting idle in the next financial year to assist Northern Ireland Water. Also, in relation to TransLink, uh, passenger numbers are recovering, but it is going to be a hard slog to get us back to the position we had pre-pandemic and to grow beyond that. And they do need to have that certainty beyond just monitoring rounds. Uh, within what has been presented here today, there is an item uh, within it, which is items which were within the sole authority of the Budget Act. I am very conscious of that, and I was reading through that today. There are a number of uh, areas within that. One is from the Department of the Economy. And it's, uh, it describes itself as supporting the operation of HMS Caroline as a visitor attraction, and uh, expenditure is sought under the sole authority of the Budget Act for that. And it's quite significant expenditure in relation to that. It details within the document provision is sought under the sole authority of the Budget Act for expenditure on HMS Caroline. Approval was first granted in January 2020 to incur expenditure under the sole authority of the Budget Act, and in total. And in total, the approval under the sole authority of the Budget Act has been in place for, for three financial years. A further provision is required for the 2021-22 financial year to establish an endowment fund to meet future running costs of HMS Caroline. And I think it is important to raise that today because part of what we are doing here today is about scrutiny of the information that has been provided to us. I understand there has been concerns reported in relation to governance and finance of this attraction. I also am aware that the attraction is currently closed. Um, the last time I visited the Facebook yeah, page, yes, no problem. And of course, I would like to make a declaration of interest as an ex-member of the ship's company of HMS Caroline in the past. 
But I think the member does raise a very good point because the question needs to be asked whether the amount of money in the endowment process and actually the mishandling of the issue with HMS Caroline, particularly with the Department of Economy, has, is the money sufficient for us to be able to make sure the Caroline stays in Belfast, which I think is something we as an Assembly would like to see. Thank you, Member. Members, next minute. Thank you. I thank you, Member, for his intervention. I think this is an important issue. We need to get clarity because what we're doing here is we're approving this expenditure. And uh, when I went on to see what the current situation is, the last Facebook post was on the 6th of August 2020. And it stated, we're sad to say that unlike other sites, HMS Caroline will not be reopening to the public until further notice. I understand that it still hasn't reopened, but yet we're approving the expenditure in relation to this. Uh, one last thing I just wanted to come on is in relation to the Executive Office, and the Chair of the Committee uh, previously referenced this, but she's not here at the moment. Um, I understand that £1.3 million was set aside for the Mays Long Cash site, and it's included within the information we're provided to you today. I think it's important that we ask questions in relation to the good use of public funds of the ongoing expenditure in relation to this, and we highlight that on the record today. As I said, uh, tomorrow we'll debate the Budget Bill and we'll continue further debate. And I do welcome the motion from the Committee in relation to the Draft Budget, because it's important we're able to consider that. But today is about bringing scrutiny to the information that's presented with us, and I think it's important we get clarification on the issue I've just raised. Thank you. I call Mike Nesbitt. Right, I'm going to demote you back to Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker. And ask for your indulgence, uh, because I want to be a little nostalgic. Uh, and I think it's relevant to the way this debate uh, is being conducted this evening. Uh, I was elected first to this House in 2011 for the 2011 to 16 mandate. And one of the first things that, that I noticed, and, and not in a great way, was how we conduct business when it comes to finance. Uh, almost obsessed with the inputs of government, uh, giving X million to health, Y million to education. Uh, but not looking at the other side of the equation, the, the outputs and the outcomes. Or perhaps, to be fair, sometimes, yes, we look at the, the outputs. And actually, uh, Mr. Beggs gave a very good example in a very small way of that. We give hundreds of millions of pounds to the Department of Education. That's the input. Uh, part of the, the outputs uh, would be classroom assistance. So Mr. Beggs talks about a classroom uh, where there are four classroom assistants at the back of the class. But what, what was the outcome of that? According to Mr. Beggs, nothing. They're standing at the back twiddling their thumbs because they have nothing to do. So it was a very exciting day when the office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, because that's what it was at that time, when OFM and DFM said, we're going to do things differently uh, with the next programme for government. We're going to be outcomes-based. Uh, and I'll never forget the evening when Mark Friedman brought a team up here to brief the OFM-DFM committee. Mr. Friedman was the author of, of the book, Trying Hard Isn't Good Enough, uh, and indeed effectively the inventor of this idea of OBA, Outcome-Based Accountability Government. Uh, and I'll never forget one of the examples he gave, which was from Canada, where every agency in the criminal justice system, from you know, the police, the courts, probation, prisons were all asked to take the same percentage cut in their budget. And they went away and they sat down together and then they came back to government and said, we have a better way of doing this. We'll save you the same overall sum of money, but we're going to take different percentages of cuts because we think that will deliver better outcomes. So I think from memory, for example, probation didn't get any cut at all and some of the other agencies therefore took a bigger hit, but they did it because they felt that was the way to do it. And yet tonight we're engaging in a debate uh, on the spring supplementary estimates and the supply resolution where each speaker is standing up and speaking about the committee that they represent, education, executive office, infrastructure, justice, finance, health. We're not coordinating this. So if we think about the issues that we're trying to tackle, such as educational underachievement, we now know we can't simply point the finger at the Minister for Education and say, that's your responsibility. Because we know that healthier children will do better at schools. 
We know children in better quality housing will do better at school. So the Minister for Health and the Minister for Communities has a role to play. Even mental health that I campaign on, and, and, and I am so pleased and I commend Robin Swan for all he has done as Minister for Health uh, in terms of the mental health champion, a proper 10-year strategy on mental health. But it's not just a health issue. Yes, pills and tablets and therapies have their place in helping people with mental health issues. But it's also a societal issue, and we need societal interventions. We need interventions in our schools and in our workplaces. So we have to go for something a bit, a, a bit more holistic than simply analysing the spend department by department from each committee. I, I will give way. I'm nearly finished, but I will give way. Does he accept that in terms of the issue of mental health, it's also a justice issue, given the fact that when the police uh, spend more of their time uh, in wards and hospitals because the health system is not adequately uh, prepared or suited to deal with those issues, so the police end up there when they should be doing other things rather than being the managers of a mental health crisis? The member makes an extremely important and excellent point. Yes, the police will attend a lot of incidents where the issue is mental health, uh, and the member is aware of the, the experiment in the southeastern area, uh, the Ards, kind of North Down area, uh, where there was a multidisciplinary response uh, and a triaging. Uh, and you know, again, traditionally what we would do is you might find somebody on the streets on a Friday night and say, well, we've got to put them in a prison cell. Probably the last place they should have been put because the issue is not alcohol, the underlying issue is mental health and where they belonged was perhaps in a hospital. And I have to say, having spent a night, uh, an overnight, observing the emergency department of the Ulster Hospital um, and, and wondering whether alcoholism was a big issue for them, they, they, they laughed at me. They said, we've been dealing with alcohol problems forever. The big issue is mental health because we only have one side ward that's secure for somebody with a mental health patient. So when the second one arrives, we have got a huge issue because we logistically don't have the facilities to deal with them. Uh, my final point, Mr. Speaker, was looking back to that last mandate and, and the fact that we were also committing ourselves uh, to, to doing something about the fact that we tend to treat the programme for government and the budget separately. Uh, and that there was a, a desire and a determination to see if we could better align the programme for government and the budget. And you know what? We've achieved that in the worst way possible. Because as we come towards the end of this mandate, we've got neither. I now hear Mr. Uh, here, no, I need to share you. I uh, now call uh, Stuart Dixon. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. And I rise uh, to address two specific areas of concern in my capacity as Alliance spokesperson for the economy, namely um, the financial arrangements around Invest Northern Ireland and its inability to carry out financial support to potential investors due to the budget uncertainty. And secondly, the shortfall in funding for community projects uh, in Northern Ireland uh, due to the, the Brexit chaos uh, largely uh, created uh, both uh, by uh, the party opposite uh, and also by um, the uh, withdrawal from uh, the European Union. With regards to Invest Northern Ireland, the Chamber will be well aware that the response to the current budget position Invest Northern Ireland recently told by the Department of the Economy to pause any activity that would incur new financial commitments beyond March 2022. What that means is that without budget clarification, Invest Northern Ireland is unable to issue any new financial offers with knock-on effects for trade and FDI targets, in-year budget spend and company engagement. This comes at a time when we're desperately trying to build back our economy after a two-year pandemic, when we're trying to grapple with the cost of living increases and when our executive is not functioning properly because of obstinacy and grandstanding by one particular party. 
What I find particularly jarring about this situation is that Invest Northern Ireland has been warning the Department uh, since 2022 that it faced colossal funding problems due to the loss of EU grants. A substantial part of our budget was from the European Regional Development Fund. Thanks to the DUP-backed Brexit, that funding will no longer be available, and despite any hollow promises to the contrary, will not be replaced by UK government funding. It is therefore important, uh, Deputy Speaker, that this budget, which regrettably is on hold at best and at worst is going to fall, about, fall down around our ears, uh, is able to ad address these core issues. Figures of, for example, uh, core funding of some £100 million, which would have come from the EU and no longer available to us, requires that double the approximately 45 million cash increase in the department uh, will be getting from Stormont funds. Those figures alone paint a pretty bleak picture, but this is worsened when we consider the same officials have warned us that, we, that, that, that our skills and innovation programme will bear the brunt of these cost-costing measures. Not just, leaving, uh, not just Invest NI, but by the extension of businesses that will suffer. Our economy minister has taken aim at uh, those groups that work to deliver at, at a basic level on the ground. Last week, he rejected proposals which would have allowed him to approve the funding of dozens of uh, groups uh, in the absence of draft budget for next year. And I wait to hear what the finance minister has to say about the potential workaround which he has offered to the economy minister, but there doesn't seem to be any evidence the economy minister has taken any interest or note in that. There are some 67 community groups working with approximately 17,000 of some of the most vulnerable people in Northern Ireland who have traditionally been reliant on EU structural funds. We know all too well that the funding will run out at the end of March, hamstring a service provision and resulting in job losses for providers, or at, or, and certainly a great deal of uncertainty. Due to the severity of the risk, the Finance Minister has managed to obtain a workaround, but it will be interesting to see how that can actually be achieved. It is news to no one that we are in the midst of a cost of living crisis, with too many vulnerable citizens having to choose between heating and eating. Uh, to remove such programmes aimed at assisting many individuals into work is unforgivable. I appreciate, uh, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, that the spiralling utility costs are a global issue uh, exacerbated by sad events unfolding in Ukraine today. However, I was surprised to see in the spring estimate a significant drop in the provision for our utility regulator, although I do understand that a lot of his income, or the income for the utility regulator comes from licensing arrangements. Mr Speaker, it's illuminating to scrutinise uh, the specifics for the spring supplementary estimates. But having a look at the detail, what becomes clear is just how desperately we need a three-year budget in order to properly forecast and plan for the future. Without the ability to look ahead, then the resource and departments and arm's length bodies for the long term, we are becoming stuck in a cycle of constant firefighting, approach, uh, sporadically uh, firefighting and plugging gaps. Unfortunately, the reality is that this endless game of whack-a-mole is destined to continue until at least one party, if not both major parties, uh, return to this chamber and deliver uh, for the people of Northern Ireland, rather than trying to deliver for themselves. I would encourage the party opposite to come back to the table, to work collaboratively with the four other executive parties, to deliver a better future for Northern Ireland, and to deliver that through an effective and efficient budget. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I call Jim Allister. Deputy Speaker, <clears throat> tonight I want to um, draw out a few points from the spring supplementary estimates relating to some bodies that maybe we don't talk enough about. And the first one I want to refer to is the utility regulator. Now, it's not that the utility regulator is a big spender in terms of our public funding, but the problem that I have with the utility regulator is its total lack of accountability. We give it money, but who is it accountable to? You go to the Minister for the Economy uh, about an issue and he will say, no, that is the utility regulator. I can't do anything about that. And The utility regulator, in my experience, is a body that is taking maximum advantage of that. Let me illustrate it. I have a small business constituent 
just outside Ballycastle, Glenview Foods. They operate a manufacturing, processing, potatoes, etc. They sought to get themselves, for the purposes of being more energy efficient, uh, to have approval in respect of an anaerobic digester. They got involved with Northern NIE Networks, who frankly messed up in terms of their delineation of what the project was about. They then, in consequence, got into difficulties by failing to get the authorization from Ofgem. So the utility regulator, which should be overseeing how Northern Ireland Electricity Networks dealt with the issue, is then approached. Paul Frew and I, two local MLAs, on the 1st of October, met the utility regulator about this case. Here we're almost at the 1st of March, and we haven't even had a reply to correspondence, which I have constantly sent them, asking, can we have a response to the points raised on the 1st of October? The utility regulator is a body, frankly, accountable to no one. And yet, I have a business in Ballycastle crying out for answers as to why they didn't oversee and what they have done about the issues with NIE. And we are just ignored. Public representatives ignored by the utility regulator. So I do think I look askance at the fact that we're sending them more money when they don't have any accountability to anyone, it seems, in this province. I then turn to the Strategic Investment Board, which is some sort of an arm of the Executive Office. And the Strategic Investment Board, I discover, in these accounts, is getting a 74% hike in its allocation. It's going up from just under five, uh, sorry, not a 74. Uh, it's going up from just under five million to eight million pounds. Now, what does the Strategic Investment Board do? It has fingers in many pies. It has fingers in many local government pies of quite a dubious variety. It appoints, it seems, the head of the civil service when we have an applicant who doesn't want to be a civil servant. It seems to be a largely unaccountable organisation which is deployed in all sorts of ways that are quite opaque. And yet, here we have them having a huge increase in their allocation. I'd like to know why. Why are we now going to give that huge increase to a strategic investment board? And what are they doing with it? And whose interests are they serving? You know, is it just a consortium for more and more consultants to be paid? Is that what the SIB has turned into? It certainly, it seems to be a distinct lack of accountability in respect of it. And then I want to make a mention of the other huge increase that I notice in respect of Tourism Ireland, up from 17 million to 22. An organisation which rarely serves the interests of Northern Ireland, which frankly is a body with very little interest or inclination towards serving the interests of Northern Ireland. But we're going to give another 22 million of our public funds to Tourism uh, uh, Ireland Limited. And, sure. Break that an interesting point, Adam. Might be as interest to the Finance Minister because one of the things we've had a difficulty with is seeing audited accounts from some of these bodies, and particularly sort of Tourism Ireland where it's coming to as well. So maybe the Minister may reflect on not only is this question of allocation of funding, but actually accounting for it as well. Mr Chairman is not disappointed 
in his expectation in that regard. Then I look at Intertrade Ireland, again going up from four and a half to almost seven. I would say to this House, what do we now need in Northern Ireland on foot of the iniquitous protocol is an Intertrade UK body, because that's where the problem is. It's Intertrade between GB and Northern Ireland, which is the source of most difficulties that businesses are having in that regard. So I do say to this House that an Intertrade UK would a far, be a far more deserving body than this one. And I do hope that the Economy Minister may take up a suggestion I made probably a year ago of exploring with the relevant department in Westminster the establishment of such a body which should be based in Northern Ireland to deal directly with the issues of intertrade between us and our biggest partner uh, and our biggest market, GB, and between them and us. And that would be a far wiser spend than much of what is in these estimates. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. And um, I guess nice to tag to Higgin Ira Aragadish, I guess to Ira to seriously share one with just Fee Hogget, the conclude, I guess, clear the correlation Gispera. Um, I now call the Minister of Finance, Conor Murphy, to conclude and wind on the debate, and you have up to 26 minutes. 27. That's kind of cool. I'd say what some others said, I'd be brief, and then took up their full seven minutes. <laughs> I wouldn't like to see them if they weren't. Uh, but the debate today has covered many aspects relating to public expenditure, but, and I will endeavour to address as many of the points raised during the debate as I can, possibly in the, in the time allotted. Uh, first of all, I want to again thank the Finance Committee for their agreement to take this important uh, leg legislation through accelerated passage. The agreement ensures timely transition of the legislation through this Assembly, thereby, uh, thereby avoiding any legal uncertainty over the funding of public services for the remainder of 2021-22 and the early months of 2022-23. I listen to interest to members' de debate, uh, points that were raised today in the debate, and I just return to some of them. Uh, the uh, chair of the Finance Committee raised the issue of the under year spends and the, the budget exchange. I think Matthew O'Teal also raised issues around budget exchange. Uh, the level of end year under spend, whether it can be carried forward to 22 23, and the, uh, the absence of an executive to pose any risk to that, but it, it doesn't. Uh, we currently have £95 million of resource still unallocated. It's my plan to carry forward £50 million of that and allocate, of course, as I've said today on a number of occasions, £45 million. Uh, and I contend to confirm these allocations, uh, these in-year allocations uh, shortly. The total resource still we can carry forward under the Budget Exchange Scheme is £104.3 million, uh, which leaves uh, scope for any departmental end-year uh, underspends. Uh, to be carried forward. So, w while we're sitting currently with 95 million, and we will allocate uh, 45 of that, undoubtedly between now and the end of March, there will be some addition to that. So, what we want to do is create sufficient room and uh, not to exceed uh, that limit uh, and, and carry that, that forward. Uh, to add to the other 150 and, two, and 100 million uh, uh, sums that we, we received in that. Uh, to give, a, give us a total of £300 million for next year, uh, which undoubtedly would, be, uh, would have been a, a significant advantage to a number of departments if we could get the money allocated to them. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, it, I think you also raised the issue of the in-year position, but I have dealt with some of that uh, in relation to the, uh, the, the position. The, the conclusion at January monitor was 70.5 million resource to L30. 35.9 capital and 1.6 million financial transaction capital. The uh, a further 5.5 million was agreed with the executive to extend the Omicron hospitality payment to hotels and sports clubs, and this reduced the available resource deal to 65 million. Uh, Treasury has notified us since that uh, of substantial changes to Barnet consequentials, which changes our in-year position. We will receive 37.4 million less capital deal and 10.1 million less financial transaction capital deal than previously anticipated. That means we end up rather than have a, an overspend of capital, we have a small, uh, or sorry, a, an underspend. We have a small overcommitment, which should resolve itself. Uh, and the advance repayment of future FTC loans will now be lower. Uh, I think you asked also about the council tax uh, Barnet position uh, as well. We will receive 99 points. Minister, the FTC business, because remember we use 
FTC, there was a paying down of FTC. Is that going to affect that with that change? Yes, uh, it, it slightly lowers it. Uh, that, that because we have slightly less to play with, uh, so it, it slightly lowers the amount, but not, not a huge amount. Uh, we will receive, in terms of the council tax rebate, 99.3 million. That is the figure I have been generally referring to as £100 million pounds to carry forward in 2022-23. Uh, and this would be added to any further amounts that we, we secure through the budget exchange scheme. So uh, there is a significant amount of carry forward there, and the capital position has rectified itself with a sort of small overspend. But we do anticipate, going on the average returns at this time of the year over previous years, we anticipate that that even in itself out. Uh, the, uh, yeah, and I dealt with the, the capital issue. Uh, the, uh, Keeve Archibald raised uh, 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 an issue in relation to the uh, AS fu ASF funding. I think Stuart Dixon also raised the same issue. Uh, we set out some options for how I had met the, some of the groups involved, and we did set out some options for how we could collectively address the needs of voluntary groups that are affected by the loss of the ASF funding. Of course, members will know that that ESF and ERDF uh, European funding that was due to be replaced to us in full, uh, as, as you know, we, it hasn't happened. Uh, and not that something that was written on the side of the bus, but we haven't got it, and that leaves the Department of the Economy down uh, a very significant amount of money annually uh, for money it would previously have tapped into. The replacement is by way of the Shared Prosperity Fund, which creates no level of certainty for any of the groups uh, going forward, and we have no input or oversight in relation to how that is delivered. So, in trying to address the issue, particularly of that match funding element for ESF groups, I did propose a solution to both the Economy and the Communities Minister. Uh, the Communities Minister took up the solution, the Economy Minister uh, declined, but I, I did hear him speaking earlier today in the Assembly saying that he would intend to give guarantees to future funding for those groups. So so I look forward uh, to his engagement with them, and I hope that that certainty is provided for them, because as of this morning, uh, when I met them again, they were still uh, deeply worried about the position for groups which provide an enormous degree of service uh, to us. Uh, Keeve Archibald also raised the issue of VAT on energy bills, and I wrote to the Chief Secretary of the Treasury on the 11th of November calling to waive the VAT and energy bills temporarily to support many households and businesses struggling with the cost of living and spiral energy prices, and I have received no response as yet. Uh, and further, on the 12th of January, I joined with my counterparts from Wales and Scotland to call on the Treasury urgent action to tackle the cost of living crisis to help households with rising bills. There is only so much that we can do in the devolved administrations and powers to help household meet the cost of living lie mainly with the British Government, who need uh, to act now. The Treasury has announced an energy, rebates, an energy, bill rebate, energy bills rebate on 3 February, which will provide £200 pound discount on energy bills this autumn for domestic energy uh, electricity customers in Britain. However, this is repayable over the next five years. We will receive £150 million in Barnet consequences from this in 2022-23, which is also repayable. Uh, and unfortunately, in the absence of an executive, as I said previously, that money uh, cannot be allocated. Uh, the, uh, Matthew O'Toole did raise issues around the budget exchange scheme, which, which I have uh, answered. He, he expressed his frustration, as, as many people have, with the prospect of no budget uh, in the time ahead. Uh, and he did make the point, which I have made frequently in this, uh, in this chamber, in relation to the health spending and uh, the need to see the health spending, the need to be able to. Uh, we have costed uh, proposals in relation to taking down waiting lists, to funding uh, cancer services, to funding mental health. Uh, and transformation, but we need to see how that has stepped out over the time ahead. And uh, I think a successful budget outcome, had we got an executive in place, would have involved uh, the health department giving us a uh, chapter and verse of the milestones associated with how that money would be spent. I'm happy to give way. Does he think, <clears throat> and would his department, would he be minded to ask his departmental officials to engage with officials at the Department of Health to work on? such a potential plan so it's ready for a new executive coming in so that they can, there can be a, what we've talked about, a, a plan for waiting list reduction with slightly more granular de, uh, interim targets? Well, indeed, we've had conversations about how that would achieve. Actually, the head of the civil service was going to undertake 
undertake that work, and, and I'd offer the support of my own officials who do engage on a regular basis with the Department of Health to make sure that we did have that level of detail, or that an incoming executive does have that level of detail, to ensure that if they stand by the commitment to uh, provide a priority to help, that we know exactly what we're getting for that, and uh, that was going to be a key part of the consultation and uh, discussion uh, exercise. He, he referred also in his uh, in his remarks to collapse in 2017. I hope he does take the time between today and tomorrow to go back and re-examine uh, some of the positions his own party took in relation to that. Well, you might remember uh, that we had asked for the uh, First Minister of the time temporarily to step aside to allow an inquiry to place. The SDLP demanded her resignation uh, in a much harder position than we had at the time. So I hope he does take the 24 hours to go back, to go back and examine his own position before he starts blaming other people uh, for events that happened before his time. I do recognise that, but I'm sure he can access the documentation if he, if he wants to do some research now, some light reading before bed, perhaps. Uh, Chris Little uh, raised issues in relation to education, much of which can be answered by the Education Department, but he did raise the issue uh, important subject of special educational needs uh, and something that we have prioritised and we did find in a previous budget find uh, at last minute some additional spending for it. The initial budget allocation in 21-22 included 42 million specifically for SEN related purposes and for the 27.7 million of funding for SEN related pressures was allocated at June monitoring, 4.6 million at October monitoring and 18.4 million I think as he identified uh, at January monitoring. So we have prioritised that uh, at each opportunity we've had the, uh, the, the or each time we've had the opportunity uh, to do that. Colin Gildernew raised issues in relation to health transformation, uh, and they, we were, of course were committed to a transformation of health service, and that's why I did recommend that the health would be prioritised in the draft budget. The budget provided funding over the three-year period to meet in full the Health Minister's bid for elective care, cancer and mental health rebuild strategies and to help transform the health service and reduce waiting lists. In addition, some £147 million of NDNA transformation funding was also provided over this period. In total, the Department of Health would have been provided with a 10 per cent real terms increase by 2024-25. And obviously, in the absence of that, if the executive of that fund sits idle, waiting to see uh, how we can allocate it, and of course the waiting lists grow longer and uh, the access to services continue uh, to suffer. I'm happy to give away. Just on the point of education, I know that I listened to Mr Little's contribution to the debate. In relation to the uh, young people and educational attainment, closing the gap report which the Public Accounts Committee produced, which he will know, would the Minister agree and will he give assurance to this House that whilst it's the responsibility primarily for the education department, that report clearly sets out, as does the Northern uh, Audit Office report, that the, the goals and, and the targets of the first start a piece of work that was produced with Dr Purdy and his team can only be met if there's a joined up approach from across government in terms of finance and resource. Yes, I, I agree in terms of the joined up approach. Uh, finance and resource, of course, uh, are issues for the executive as a whole to decide. Uh, and I think Mike Nesbitt and his contribution had made that point about the, the issue of mental health, uh, school attainment, health, uh, living standards, uh, the state of homes all contribute to, to the same outcome, which is to have healthier, happier and more productive uh, children growing up in society and, and meet, being able to meet their goals. So absolutely, that is the, uh, that's the responsibility of every department and the executive collectively. And that's why we do set priorities and try and match resources uh, to those priorities. I have to say, the education system in my view, doesn't, uh, does prevents us in achieving a lot of that, and his own party is wedded to the idea of academic selection, which I think is a negative contribution in terms of that, but that's something for him to examine uh, perhaps in the time ahead. Uh, the, uh, uh, Pam Cameron had, of course, come into bat for the party in fairness to her. Uh, she did a valiant job, but the, uh, the idea of further allocations uh, being made uh, this year are, are uh, particularly in new areas, I did have, as on the basis of the January monitoring discussions, an ability to further allocate some money uh, and to try and make sure that we didn't uh, underspend and uh, end up losing money, and that's what I've taken to do. But the idea of bringing forward now further uh, uh, allocations, I, I think, is lost to us because of the lack of an executive. Uh, she decried, and I noticed that the DUP party leader did say, that, why are we doing a budget this, this close to an election? Should we do legislation demands that we do the budget? Now, when we do it, the, the timing is out of our control. We get the, uh, the spending review outcome late in the, uh, in the autumn, and then we have a rushed 
uh, consultation, putting together a draft budget and legislating for it all within a time frame. And the time frame for legislating for this is at the end of March. Uh, so the idea that I'm not sure why that's news to people, because a lot of people who have expressed that view have been around here a long time. Uh, but legislation dictates uh, as to the, the process for agreeing the budget. Uh, and I have to say, I mean, she did make the point about waiting lists. Of course, uh, waiting lists haven't just arisen in the last three weeks. Uh, of course, they've been the issue of underfunding of the health service is a decade, if not decades long, issue primarily coming from Westminster. And the party obviously did have an opportunity some time back uh, to support an austerity government in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the shape of Theresa May's government or to uh, support a government which promised to invest funding in public services and they chose to support an austerity government. So while I don't take them back to the very start of this point, they did have a significant opportunity midstream uh, to, to transform the uh, public spending approach of a British government and they chose uh, to go with the Tories instead uh, and look where that has left us today. Uh, Mervyn's story is sure the, the uh, Justice Committee did raise issues in relation to police numbers and they, they, he, he's quite right, NDNA was not, the ink was not dry on it, so all of the financial commitments that the British Government had made they withdrew, uh, practically all of them. Uh, and they clearly had no intention of honouring any of them. Uh, and then they kind of lecture people on, on our own responsibilities in relation to these agreements. Uh, but they did set up priorities to the executive, including police numbers to 7,500. Uh, the funding package accompanying the NDNA document was never enough to deliver all of the NDNA priorities. Uh, and while we were encouraged, and he may well have been around the table as I was at that time, we were encouraged to bring forward spent priorities for the executive. We were told, uh, not in these words so much, but that the sky was the limit. Uh, and that we should be ambitious in terms of spending priorities, and then within two days they had resiled from the position uh, of what they were offering us. Uh, it wasn't just us as politicians, by the way, and he will, may remember this, or others who were about the table. Uh, it was also senior civil servants were brought in and asked to bring forward ambitious spending plans, and then told uh, when the document was signed, well, sorry, we, we didn't really mean that, we don't have the money for it. But the strategic outline case for increasing PSNI numbers has been approved by the Department of Justice to proceed to outline business case. And the draft 2022 to 25 budget includes 14.8 million per annum for police staffing over the period of 22 to 25. So the, the chief constable has on a precautionary basis, and I think it also uh, refers to the points uh, Stuart Dixon was making in relation to Invest NI, to defer the March 2022 PSNI recruitment intake, and therefore they'll not meet the target of 7,100 officers in post by the end of this financial year, which had been the objective of the executive in setting that. Uh, and some arms length bodies have taken that with the uncertainty around the budget, the debate around uh, how, where it would go, have taken decisions not to spend, invest in I have taken decisions not to commit uh, to certain co uh, companies that they were uh, encouraging to come here. Uh, but I have to say that uncertainty has been doubled down on now as a consequence uh, of the executive itself shutting down. Uh, and just some other points. Uh, uh, the Roy Beggs had made in relation to the Department for Infrastructure on DVA funding public transport in Northern Ireland water. And of course, now that the department is on a 45% allocation on a threading water basis, then all of the plans and, and those, all of those bodies that he listed do need a significant amount uh, of, of investment. Uh, and they, they, they basically can't plan for any of that until such time as the executive is back in place. They will basically get enough to keep the lights on and keep the doors open. Uh, he, he raised an issue about the vote of the count. It doesn't set a budget, and the member will be aware that in the absence of the executive, we were unable to set a budget for the next year to enable ministers to make allocations like DVA and others. But in terms of change to depreciation, in the, Depart the Department for Infrastructure, the member will have to raise that with the Infrastructure uh, Minister. Uh, and finally, just in terms of some of the points that were raised, uh, uh, Mr Moore raised the issue around HMS Caroline and the, the, the kind of uh, sole authority budget act spending. The, the, department's engaged, the Department for the Economy has engaged with the National Museum of the Royal Navy and the National Heritage Lottery Fund with a view to agreeing an approach that permits permit HMS Caroline to reopen as a visitor attraction to the public. Those negotiations are at an advanced stage and expected an agreement will be reached before the end of this financial year. My department has given approval for any expenditure in this financial year to be taken forward under the sole authority of the Budget Act, but the department has been advised that this will be the final year for expenditure to be taken forward under this mechanism. So from here on in, the, the deal will have to be done, 
uh, and uh, that, that will take it forward uh, in, in a more, uh, I suppose, acceptable in terms of the accountability that this institution uh, brings. I know we have done with the uh, Finance Committee some work in relation to the, the sole, accounting, uh, uh, sole, budget, sole Authority Budget Act, uh, but it, it does remain, it's fair to say, not a satisfactory way for allocation of money, even though it's sometimes necessary. So, uh, Mr Alistair raised a number of points about the utility regulator and the uh, SIB and Tourism Ireland, all of which I would think you'd have to take up with the relevant departments. Uh, there, was a, there was a fund uh, set aside for the uh, there was a fund set aside for to assist businesses from Britain uh, to ensure that they they understood the arrangements uh, of the protocol, which flowed from Brexit, which he supported. Uh, and so I'm not sure why he thinks we need to set up a similar fund here. I, I think part of it was a, a reluctance of some of the firms over there to engage with any additional headache in terms of, of uh, uh, doing trade across the Irish Sea. Uh, but nonetheless, the, uh, we can trace all this back to ill-advised decision in relation to Brexit, one which clearly the majority of people here didn't support. So, last Concorda, that has been, uh, I hope, answered as many of the questions as I can in the time available to me. And, of course, we will go through a lot of this uh, debate tomorrow again. Uh, and I thank people for their patience. Assembly approval of supply motions today and the associated departmental expenditure plans laid out in the 2021-22 spring supplementary estimates and the 22-23 voting account is a crucial stage of the existing public expenditure cycle. And failure, to failure to pass these supply resolutions at this juncture would put at risk the smooth continuation of public services and vital support that our citizens, hospitals, schools and businesses require for the remainder of this financial year and into the next financial year. I therefore commend the spring supplementary supplementary estimates for 21-22 and the voting account for 22-23 to the Assembly and I ask members to support the motions. Thank you. Minister, before we proceed to the question, I would remind members that it is established practice that the vote on this motion does require cross-community support. The question is that the motion relating to the supply resolution for the NI Spring Supplementary Estimates 2021-22 as detailed on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. And as there are ayes from all sides of the House, no dissenting voices, I am satisfied that cross community support has been demonstrated. The motion, motion is agreed. We have a point of order. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I was raising points earlier about accountability. I'd like to raise one a little closer to home. We still seem to have junior ministers in the executive office. And yesterday, one Mr. Kearney purported to represent the Executive Office at the Joint Committee with the EU. On whose authority did he do that, and to whom is he accountable? Because I, as an MLA, if I wanted to table a question about that, cannot do it, because there is no Executive Ministers in place in that department. So could, I'm sure it won't come today, but could the House be advised as to the position of accountability of those who still proclaim themselves to be junior ministers? Yes, there is some guidance around that, and um, Standing Order 45 provides for the First Minister and Deputy First Minister to make determinations under Section 19 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 to specify procedures to appoint junior ministers. And such a determination was made in December 1999 and approved on the floor of the Assembly. Subsequent appointments of those junior ministers and the Assembly mandates that followed up until present day have all complied with the requirements of that determination. And while I understand some members might want to clarify, as you have, whether junior ministers can remain in office when there is no first or deputy first minister, that 1999 determination apparently sets out the circumstances in which junior ministers cease to hold office, and it does not include the current situation. Uh, beyond that, questions in relation to the responsibilities that ministers do continue to conduct at the present time are issues essentially for the ministers themselves. That is the guidance that I have just been provided with, Mr Alistair. Yes. The 1999 uh, situation, but my question is a different one. If there are persons who are regarded as junior ministers, to whom are they accountable? How are they made accountable to this House? That is the point that I would like an answer to. Okay. In regard to that specific point, we will raise it with the Speaker's office, and if it is appropriate to do that, we will get clarification for you. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Okay, so um, the motion is agreed, and we'll now move on to the second motion. That's the supply resolutions or resolution for the Northern Ireland Estimates vote on account 2022 to 23, which has already been debated. I will ask the clerk to read the motion, please. That the motion relating to the supply resolution for the Northern Ireland Estimates vote on account 2022 2023, as detailed on the order paper, be agreed. Thank you. I now call the Minister of Finance to move the motion. Moved. Last Thank you. The Minister of Finance to move the motion. Again, before we proceed to the question, I remind members that it is established practice that the vote on this motion does require cross community support. The question is that the motion relating to the supply resolution for the Northern Ireland Estimates vote on account 22 to 23, as detailed on the order paper, be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. And as there are ayes from all sides of the House and no dissenting voices, I am satisfied that cross community support has been demonstrated and the motion is agreed. The next item on the business of the order paper is the first stage of the budget bill. I call the Minister of Finance. I beg to move the budget bill 2022. Thank you. I, I, now I call the clerk to please read the long title. A bill to authorise the issue out of the consolidated fund of certain sums for the service of the years ending 31 March 2022 and 2023 to appropriate those sums for the specified purposes, to authorise the use for the public service of certain resources for those years, to revise the limits on the use of certain accruing resources in the year ending 31 March 2022, and to authorise the Department of Finance to borrow on the credit of the sum appropriated for the year ending 31 March 2023. That constitutes the Bill's first stage, and it shall now be printed. I can also inform members that the Speaker has received a letter from the Committee for Finance advising that the Committee is satisfied the consultation with it on public expenditure proposals contained in the Bill has been appropriate as required under Standing Order 42.2. Thank you. Uh, we now move to the next item of business, which is the final item on the order paper, item number four, which is the adjournment. The question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned. Thank you. Slana uh, Walia, safe home. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed.